This audiobook was created using text-to-speech software and was not read by a real person. Please keep in mind the limitations of the technology when it comes to pacing and pronunciation. Also, if you enjoy the audiobooks we create, please consider supporting the expense of our projects through our Patreon page. Those who do so have access to exclusive book series, are able to download the MP3 files for all the books we create, and also have early access to our normal YouTube releases. For more details, please visit patreon.com slash hiddengemsbooks. The link is also available in the video description below. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the story. Star Wars Outbound Flight By Timothy Zahn 1. The light freighter bargain hunter moved through space, silver-gray against the blackness, the light of the distant stars reflecting from its hull. Its running lights were muted, its navigational beacons quiet, its viewports for the most part as dark as the space around it. Its drive gunning for all it was worth. Hang on! Dubrak Kento barked over the straining roar of the engines. Here he comes again! Clenching his teeth firmly together to keep them from chattering, George Cardas got a grip on his seat's armrest with one hand as he finished punching coordinates into the NAV computer with the other. Just in time, the bargain hunter jinked hard to the left as a pair of brilliant green blaster bolts burned past the bridge canopy. Cardas? Kento called. Snap it up, kid. I'm snapping, I'm snapping. Cardas called back, resisting the urge to point out that the outmoded NAV equipment was Kento's property, not his. As was the lack of diplomacy and common sense that had gotten them into this mess in the first place. Can't we just talk to them? Terrific idea, Kento bit out. Be sure to compliment Praga on his fairness and sound business sense. That always works on huts. The last word was punctuated by another cluster of blaster shots, this group closer than the last. Rack, the engines can't hold this speed forever. Maris Ferrisai warned from the co-pilot's seat, her dark hair flashing with green highlights every time a shot went past. Doesn't have to be forever, Kento said with a grunt. Just till we have some numbers. Cardas? On Cardas's board a light winked on. Ready, he called, punching the numbers over to the pilot's station. It's not a very long jump though, Dash. He was cut off by a screech from somewhere aft, and the flashing blaster bolts were replaced by flashing starlines as the bargain hunter shot into hyperspace. Cardas took a deep breath, let it out silently. This is not what I signed up for. He muttered to himself barely six standard months after signing on with Kento and Maris. This was already the second time they'd had to run for their lives from someone. And this time it was a hut they'd frizzled. Kento, he thought darkly, had a genuine talent for picking his fights. You okay, George? Cardas looked up, blinking away a drop of sweat that had somehow found its way into his eve. Maris was swiveled around in her chair, looking back at him with concern. I'm fine, he said, wincing at the quavering in his voice. Of course he is, Kento assured Maris as he also turned around to look at their junior crewer. Those shots never even got close. Cardas braced himself. You know, Kento, it may not be my place to say this dash. It isn't, and don't. Kento said gruffly, turning back to his board. Prava the Hutt is not the sort of person you want mad at you, Cardas said anyway. I mean, first there was that Radian Dash. A word about shipboard etiquette, kid, Kento cut in, turning just far enough to send a single eye's worth of glower at Cardas. You don't argue with your captain. Not ever. Not unless you want this to be your first and last tour with us. I'd settle for it not being the last tour of my life, Cardas muttered. What was that?
Nothing. Don't let Prada worry you, Maris soothed. He has a rotten temper, but he'll cool off. Before or after he racks the three of us and takes all the furs? Cardas countered, eyeing the hyperdrive readings uneasily. That Malvine nullifier instability was definitely getting worse. Oh, Prada wouldn't have racked us, Kento scoffed. He'd have left that to Drixo when we had to tell her he'd snatched her cargo. You do have that next jump ready, right? Working on it, Cardas said, checking the computer. But the hyperdrive dash. Heads up, Kento interrupted. We're coming out. The Starlings collapsed back into stars, and Cardas key for a full sensor scan and jerked as a salvo of blaster shots sizzled past the canopy. Kento barked a short expletive. What the frizz? He followed us, Maris said, sounding stunned. And he's got the range. Kento snarled as he threw the bargain hunter into another series of stomach-twisting evasive maneuvers. Cardas, get us out of here! Trying, Cardas called back fighting to read the computer displays as they bounced and wobbled in front of his eyes. There was no way it was going to calculate the next jump before even Kento's luck ran out, and the fuming hut back there finally connected. But if Cardas couldn't find a place for them to go, maybe he could find all the places for them not to go. The sky directly ahead was full of stars, but there was plenty of empty black between them. Picking the biggest of the gaps, he punched the vector into the computer. Try this one. He called, keying it to Kento. What do you mean, try? Maris asked. The freighter rocked as a pair of shots caught it squarely on the aft deflector. Never mind, Kento said before Cardas could answer. He punched the board, and once again the star lines lanced out and faded into the blotchy hyperspace sky. Maris exhaled in a huff. That was too close. Okay, so maybe he is mad at us, Kento conceded. Now. Like Maris said, kid, what do you mean, try this one? I didn't have time to calculate a proper jump, Cardas explained. So I just aimed us into an empty spot with no stars. Kento swiveled around. You mean an empty spot with no visible stars? He asked ominously. An empty spot with no collapsed stars, or pre-star dark masses, or something hidden behind dust clouds? That kind of empty spot? He waved a hand toward the canopy. And out toward the unknown regions on top of it? We don't have enough data in that direction for him to have done a proper calculation anyway. Maris said, coming unexpectedly to Cardas's defense. That's not the point, Kento insisted. No, the point is that he got us away from Praga, Maris said. I think that deserves at least a thank you. Kento rolled his eyes. Thank you, he said. Such thanks to be rescinded if and when we run through a star you didn't see, of course. I think it's more likely the hyperdrive will blow up first, Cardas warned. Remember that nullifier problem I told you about? I think it's getting dash. He was cut off by a wailing sound from beneath them, and with a lurch the bargain hunter leapt forward like a giffa on ascent. Running hot! Kento shouted, spinning back to his board. Maris, shut! Or down! Trying, Maris called back over the wailing as her fingers danced across her board. Control lines are looping can't get a signal through. With a curse, Kento popped his straps and heaved his bulk out of his seat. He sprinted down the narrow aisle, his elbow barely missing the back of Cardas's head as he passed. Poking uselessly at his own controls, Cardas popped his own strap release and started to follow. Cardas, get up here, Maris called, gesturing him forward. He might need me, 
Cardas said as he nevertheless reversed direction and headed forward. Sit, she ordered, nodding sideways at Kento's vacated pilot's seat. Help me watch the tracker if we veer off this vector before Rack figures out how to pull the plug. I need to know about it. But Kento dash. Word of advice, friend. She interrupted, her eyes still on her displays. This is Rack's ship. If there are any tricky repairs to be made, he's the one who'll make them. Even if I happen to know more about a particular system than he does? Especially if you happen to know more about it than he does, she said drilly. But in this case, you don't. Trust me. Fine, Cardas said with a sigh. Such trust to be rescinded if and when we blow up, of course. You're learning, she said approvingly. Now run a systems check on the scanners and see if the instabilities bled over into them. Then do the same for the NAV computer. Once we get through this, I want to make sure we can find our way home again. It took Kento over four hours to find a way to shut down the runaway hyperdrive without slagging it. During that time Cardas offered his help three times, and Neris offered hers twice. All the offers were summarily refused. Sometime during the first hour, as near as Cardas could figure from the readings tumbling across the displays, they left the relatively well-known territory of the Outer Rim, passing into a shallow section of the far less well-known territory known as Wild Space. Sometime early in the fourth hour, they left even that behind and crossed the hazy line into the unknown regions. At which point, where they were or what exactly they were flying into was anyone's guess. But at last the wailing faded away and a few minutes later the hyperspace sky collapsed into starlines and then into stars. Maris? Kento's voice called from the comm panel. We're out, she confirmed. Running a location check now. I'll be right there, Kento said. Wherever we are, we're a long way from home, Cardas murmured, gazing out at a small but brilliant globular star cluster in the distance. I've never seen anything like that from any of the Outer Rim worlds I've been to. Me either, Maris agreed soberly. Hopefully, the computer can sort it out. The computer was still sifting data when Kento reappeared on the bridge. Cardas had made sure to be back at his own station by then. Nice cluster, the big man commented as he dropped into his seat. Any systems nearby? Closest one's about a quarter light year directly ahead, Maris said, pointing. Kento grunted and punched at his board. Let's see if we can make it, he said. Backup hyperdrive should still have enough juice for a jump that short. Can't we work on the ship just as well out here? Cardas asked. I don't like interstellar space, Kento said distractedly as he set up the jump. It's dark and cold and lonely. Besides, that system up there might have a nice planet or two. Which means a possible source of supplies, in case we end up staying longer than we expect, Maris explained. Or a possible place to settle down away from the noise and fluster of the Republic for a while, Kento added. Cardas felt his throat tighten. You don't mean Dash? No, he doesn't, Maris assured him. Rack always talks about getting away from it all whenever he's in trouble with someone. He must talk that way a lot, Cardas muttered. What was that? Kento asked. Nothing. Didn't think so. Here we go. There was a screech, more genteel than the sound from the bargain hunter's main hyperdrive and the stars stretched out into starlines. Silently, Cardas counted off the seconds to himself, fully expecting the backup hyperdrive to crash at any time. But it didn't, and after a few tense minutes the starlines collapsed again to reveal a small yellow sun directly ahead. There we go, Kento said approvingly. All the comforts of home. 
You figure out yet where we are, Maris? Computer's still working on it, Maris said. But it looks like we're about 250 light years into unknown space. She lifted her eyebrows at him. I'm thinking we're going to have a stack of late delivery penalties when we finally get to Kamra. Oh, you worry too much, Kento chided. It won't take more than a day or two to fix the hyperdrive. If we push it a little, we shouldn't be more than a week overdue. Cardas suppressed a grimace. Pushing the hyperdrive, if he recalled correctly, was what had wrecked the thing to begin with. There was a Twitter from the calm. We're being hailed, he reported, frowning as he keyed it on. He threw a look at the visual displays, searching for their unknown caller, and felt his whole body go rigid. Kento! He snapped. It's Dash. He was cut off by a deep rumbling chuckle from the calm. So, Dubrak Kento, an all-too-familiar voice rumbled in Hatties. You think to escape me so easily? You call that easy? Kento muttered as he keyed his transmitter. Oh, hi, Praga, he said. Look, like I told you before, I can't let you have these furs. I've already contracted with Drixo Dash. Ignore the furs, Praga cut in. Show me your hidden treasure hoard. Kento frowned at Maris. My what? Do not play the fool, Praga warned his voice going an octave deeper. I know your sort. You do not simply run from something, but run rather to something else. This is the lone star system along this vector, and behold, you are here. What could you have run to but a secret base and treasure hoard? Kento muted the transmitter. Cardas, where is he? Eight hundred kilometers off the starboard bow. Cardas told him, his hands shaking as he ran a full scan on the distant hut ship. And he's coming up fast. Maris? Whatever you did to shut down the hyperdrive, you did a great job, she said tightly. It's completely locked. We've still got the backup, but if we try to run and he tracks us again, Dash. And he will, Kento growled. Taking a deep breath, he switched the transmitter back on. It wasn't like that, Praga, he said soothingly. We were just trying to dash. Enough! The hut bellowed. Lead me to this base. Now. There isn't any base, Kento insisted. This is the unknown regions. Why would I set up a base out here? A light flashed on Cardassa's proximity sensor. Incoming! He snapped, his eyes darting back and forth among the displays as he searched for the source of the attack. Where? Kento snapped back. Cardass headed now, coming from directly beneath the bargain hunter, a long, dark missile arrowing straight toward them. There, he said, pointing a finger straight down as he stared at the display. It was only then that his brain caught up with the fact that this wasn't the vector a missile would take from the approaching hut ship. He was opening his mouth to point that out when the missile burst open, its nose ejecting a wad of some kind of material. The wad began to expand as it cleared the shards of its container, opening like a fast-blooming flower into a filmy wall stretching over a kilometer across. Power off! Kento snapped lunging across his board to the row of master power switches. Hurry! What is it? Cardas asked, grabbing for his board's own set of cutoffs. A Connor net or something like it, Kento gritted out. What, that size? Cardas asked in disbelief. Just do it, Kento snarled. Status lights were winking red and going out now as the three of them raced against the incoming net. The net won. Cardas had made it through barely two-thirds of his switches when the rippling edges came into sight around the sides of the hull. 
They folded themselves inward, curling around toward the bridge. Close your eyes, Maris warned. Cardas squeezed his eyes shut. Even through the lids he saw a hint of the brilliant flash as the net dumped its high-voltage current into and through the ship, sending a brief coronal tingling across his skin. And when he carefully opened his eyes again, every light that had still been glowing across the bridge had gone dark. The bargain hunter was dead. Through the canopy came a flicker of light from the direction of the hut ship. Looks like they got Praga too, he said, his voice sounding unnaturally loud in the sudden silence. I doubt it, Kento rumbled. His ship's big enough to have cap drains and other stuff to protect him from tricks like this. Ten to one he'll fight too, Maris murmured, her voice tight. Oh, he'll fight, all right, Kento said heavily. He's way too stupid to realize that anyone who can make a counter net that big will have plenty of other tricks up his sleeve. A multiple blaze of green blaster fire erupted from the direction of the hut ship. It was answered by brilliant blue flashes vectoring in from three different directions, fired from ships too small or too dark to see at the bargain hunter's range. You think whoever this is might get so busy with Praga that they'll forget about us? Maris asked hopefully. I don't think so, Cardas said, gesturing out the canopy at the small gray spacecraft that had taken up position with its nose pointed at the freighter's port side flank. It was about the size of a shuttle or heavy fighter, built in a curved, flowing design of a sort he'd never seen before. They've left us a guard. Figures. Kento said, glancing once at the alien ship and then turning back to the green and blue flashes. Fifty says Praga lasts at least fifteen minutes and takes one of his attackers with him. Neither of the others took him up on the bet. Cardas watched the fight, wishing he had his sensors back. He'd read a little about space battle tactics in school, but the attacker's methodology didn't seem to fit with anything he could remember. He was still trying to figure it out when, with a final salvo of blue light, it was over. Six minutes, Kento said, his voice grim. Whoever these guys are, they're good. You don't recognize them either? Maris asked, looking out at their silent guard. I don't even recognize the design, he grunted, popping his restraints and standing up. Let's go check on the damage, see if we can at least get her ready for company. Cardas, you stay here and mind the store. Me? Cardas asked, feeling his stomach tighten. But what if they you know signal us? What do you think? Kento grunted as he and Maris headed aft. You answer them. Two. The victors took their time poking or prodding or gloating over whatever was left of the hut ship. From the number of maneuvering drives Cardas could see winking on and off, he guessed there were just the three ships that had been involved in the battle itself, plus the one still standing watchful guard off their flank. Connor nets, like ion cannons, were designed to disable and hold rather than destroy and Kento and Maris had most of the systems back online by the time their keeper finally made its move. Kento, he's shifting position, Cardas called into the calm, watching as the gray ship drifted leisurely past the canopy and settled into a new spot with his stern above and in front of the bargain hunter's bow. Looks like he's setting up for us to follow him. On our way, Kento called back. Run the drive up to quarter power. The gray ship was starting to pull away when he and Maris returned. Here we go, Kento muttered, dropping into his seat and easing them forward. Any idea where we're going? The rest of the group still over by the hut ship, Cardas said, squeezing carefully past Maris as he headed back to his own station. Maybe he's taking us there. Yeah, looks like it. Kento agreed as he fed more power to the drive. So far, they're not shooting. That's usually a good sign. 
There were indeed three alien vessels hovering around the remains of Praga's ship when they arrived. Two were duplicates of their fighter-sized escort, while the third was considerably larger. Not that much bigger than a Republic cruiser, though, Cardas pointed out. Pretty small, considering what it just did. Looks like they're opening a docking bay for us, Maris said. Cardas measured the opening port cover with his eyes. Not much room in there. Our bow will fit, Kento assured him. We can use the forward service tube to get out. We're going to go into their ship? Maris asked, her voice shaking slightly. Unless they want to use the tube to come in here instead, Kento told her. The guys with the guns get to make those decisions. He lifted a warning finger. The key is for us to keep control of the situation while they're doing it. He half turned toward Cardas. That means I do all the talking. Unless they ask you something directly, in which case you give them exactly as much answer as they have question. No more. Got it? Cardas swallowed. Got it. Their escort led them to the larger ship's side, and two minutes later Kento had the bargain hunter's bow snugged securely inside the docking collar. A boarding tunnel began extending itself toward the service hatch as Kento shifted the systems to standby, and by the time the three of them had made it down the ladder the exit sensors indicated the tunnel was in place and pressurized. Here we go, Kento muttered, drawing himself up to his full height and keying the release. Remember, let me do the talking. Two of the crew were waiting outside the hatch as it slid open, blue-skinned humanoids with glowing red eyes and blue-black hair, dressed in identical black uniforms sporting green shoulder patches. Each of them had a small but nasty-looking handgun belted at his waist. Hello? Kento greeted them as he took a step into the tunnel. I'm Dubrak Kento, captain of the Bargain Hunter. The aliens didn't answer, but merely moved to either side and gestured down the tunnel. This way? Kento asked, pointing with one hand as he took Maris's arm with the other. Sure. He and Maris headed down the tunnel, the ribbed material of the floor bouncing like a swinging bridge with each step. Cardas followed close behind them, studying the aliens out of the corner of his eye as he passed between them. Aside from the unusual skin color and those glowing eyes, they were remarkably human-looking. Some offshoot of humanity's ancient expansion into the galaxy? Or were they their own people, with the resemblance purely coincidental? Two more aliens were waiting just inside the ship proper, dressed and armed the same way as the first pair except that their shoulder patches were yellow and blue instead of green. They turned in military precision as the three humans arrived and led the way down a smoothly curved corridor made of a pearl-like material with a soft, muted sheen. Cardas ran his fingertips gently along the wall as they walked, trying to decide whether it was metal, ceramic, or some kind of composite. Five meters down the corridor their guides came to a halt outside an open doorway and planted themselves on either side. In there, huh? Kento asked. Sure. He squared his shoulders the way Cardas had often seen him do just before a negotiating session. Then, still holding Maris's arm, he headed inside. Taking one last look at the corridor walls, Cardas followed. The room was small and simple, its furnishings consisting of a table and half a dozen chairs. A conference room, Cardas tentatively identified it or possibly a duty crew meal room. Another of the blue-skinned aliens was seated on the far side of the table, his glowing eyes steady on his visitors. He wore the same black as their escorts, but with a larger burgundy patch on his shoulder and a pair of elaborately tooled silver bars on his collar. An officer? Hello? Kento said cheerfully, coming to a stop at the edge of the table. I'm Dubrak Kento. Captain of the Bargain Hunter, I don't suppose you happen to speak basic? 
The alien didn't reply, but Cardas thought he saw his eyebrow twitch slightly. Maybe we should try one of the Outer Rim trade languages, he offered. Thanks for that brilliant suggestion, Kento said with a touch of sarcasm. Greetings to you, noble sir, he continued, switching to Sai Bisti. We're travelers and traders from a far world, who mean no harm to you or your people. Again, there was no response. You could try Tarja, Maris said. I don't know Tarja very well, Kento said, still inside Bisti. How about you? He added, turning to look at the two guards who had followed them into the room. Do any of you understand Sai Bisti? How about Tarja? Mies cough? Sai Bisti will do, the alien behind the table said calmly in that language. Kento turned back, blinking in surprise. Did you just say Dash? I said Sai Bisti will do, the alien repeated. Please be seated. Ah. Thank you, Kento said, pulling out chairs for himself and Maris and nodding to Cardas to do likewise. The chair backs were contoured a bit oddly for humans, Cardas noticed as he sat down, but not uncomfortably so. I'm Commander Mithranirodo of the Chiss Ascendants, the alien continued. This is the Springhawk. Picket Force 2 Command Vessel of the Expansionary Defense Fleet. Expansionary Fleet. Cardas felt a shiver run up his back. Did the name imply this Chiss ascendancy was in the process of expanding outward? He hoped not. The last thing the Republic needed right now was a threat from outside its borders. Supreme Chancellor Palpatine was doing his best but there was a lot of resistance to change in the old business-as-usual attitudes and casual corruption of the Coruscant government. Even now, five years after its little misadventure on Naboo, the Trade Federation had vet to be punished for its blatant aggression, despite Palpatine's best efforts to bring it to judgment. Resentment and frustration simmered throughout the galaxy, with rumors of new reform or secession movements surfacing every other week. Kento loved it, of course. Government bureaucracies with their dozens of fees, service charges, and flat-out prohibitions were an ideal operating environment for small-scale smuggling operations like his. And Cardos had to admit that during his time aboard the Bargain Hunter, their activities had earned a very respectable profit. What Kento perhaps failed to understand was that while a little governmental instability could be useful, too much would be as bad for smugglers as it would be for anyone else. A full-scale war, needless to say, would be as bad as it got. For everyone. And you are. Mithra Nurodo asked, shifting his glowing red eyes to Cardas. Cardas opened his mouth dash. I'm Debrak Kento, Commander. Kento Pillin before he could speak. Captain of the Dash. And you are. Mithra Nuroto repeated, his eyes still on Cardas, a slight but noticeable emphasis on the pronoun. Cardas looked sideways at Kento, got a microscopic nod. I'm George Cardas, he said. Crew are on the freighter bargain hunter. And these? Mithra Nuroto asked, gesturing to the others. Again, Cardas looked at Kento. The other's expression had gone rather sour, but he nevertheless gave his junior crewer another small nod. This is my captain, Dubrak Kento, Cardas told the commander. And his dash. Girlfriend? Co-pilot? Partner? His second-in-command, Maris Farisai. Mithra Nurodo nodded to each in turn, then turned back to Cardas. Why are you here? We're Corellian traders from one of the systems in the Galactic Republic, Cardas said. Krellen, Mithra Nerodo said, as if trying out the word. Traders, you say? Not explorers or scouts? No, not at all, Cardas assured him. 
We hire out our ship to take cargo between star systems. And the other vessel? Mithranurodo asked. Pirates of some sort, Kento put in before Cardas could answer. We were running from them when we had some trouble with our hyperdrive, which is how we ended up here. Did you know these pirates? Mithranurodo asked. How could we possibly dash? Kento began. Yes, we've had trouble with them before, Cardas interrupted. There'd been something in Mithranurodo's voice as he asked that question. I think they were gunning specifically for us. You must be carrying a valuable cargo. It's nothing fancy, Kento said, shooting a warning look at Cardas. A shipment of furs and exotic luxury garments. We're most grateful to you for coming to our aid. Cardas felt his throat tighten. The bulk of their cargo was indeed luxury clothing, but sewn into the filigree collar of one of the furs was an assortment of smuggled fire gems. If Mithranurodo decided to search the shipment and found them, there was going to be a very unhappy Drixo the Hut in the bargain hunter's future. You're welcome, Mithranurodo said. I'd be curious to see what your people consider luxury garments. Perhaps you'll show me your cargo before you leave. I'd be delighted, Kento said. Does that mean you're releasing us? Soon, Mithranurodo assured him. First I need to examine your vessel and confirm that you're indeed the innocent travelers you claim. Of course, of course, Kento said easily. We'll give you a complete tour any time you want. Thank you, Mithranurodo said. But that can wait until we reach my base. Until then, resting quarters have been prepared for you. Perhaps later you'll permit me to show you Chis hospitality. We would be both grateful and honored, Commander, Kento said, inclining his head in a small bow. I'd just like to mention, though, that we're on a very tight schedule, which our unexpected detour has made that much tighter. We'd appreciate it if you could send us on our way as quickly as possible. Of course, Mithranurodo said. The base isn't far. Is it in this system? Kento asked. He lifted a hand before the Chiss could answer. Sorry, sorry, none of my business. True, Mithranurodo agreed. However, it will do no harm to tell you that it's in a different system entirely. Ah, uh, Kento said. May I ask when we'll be leaving to go there? We've already left, Mithranurodo said mildly. We made the jump to hyperspace approximately four standard minutes ago. Kento frowned. Really? I didn't hear or feel anything. Perhaps our hyperdrive systems are superior to yours, Mithranurodo said, standing up. Now, if you'll follow me, I'll escort you to the resting area. He led the way another five meters down the corridor to another door, where he touched a striped panel on the wall. I'll send word when I want you again, he said as the door slid open. We'll look forward to further conversation. Kento said, giving a truncated bow as he eased Maris behind him through the doorway. Thank you, Commander. The two of them disappeared inside. Inclining his head to the Commander, Cardas followed. The room was compactly furnished, containing a three-tier bunk bed against one wall and a fold-down table and bench seats on the other. Beside the bunk bed were three large drawers built into the wall while to the right was a door leading into what seemed to be a compact refresher station. What do you think he's going to do with us? Maris murmured, looking around. He'll let us go, Kento assured her, glancing into the refresher station and then sitting down on the lowest cot, hunching forward to keep from bumping his head on the one above it. The real question is whether we'll be taking the fire gems with us. Cardas cleared his throat. Should we be talking about this? He asked, looking significantly around the room. 
relax, Kento growled. They don't speak a word of basic. His eyes narrowed. And as long as we're on the subject of speaking, why the frizz did you tell him we knew Prada? There was something in his eaves and voice just then, Kardas said. Something that said he already knew all about it, and that we'd better not get caught lying to him. Kento snorted. That's ridiculous. Maybe there were survivors from Prada's crew, Maris suggested. Not a chance, Kento said firmly. You saw what the ship looked like. The thing been peeled open like a ration bar. I don't know how he knew, Cardas insisted. All I know is that he did know. And you shouldn't lie to an honorable man anyway, Maris murmured. Who him? Honorable? Kento scoffed. Don't you believe it? Military men are all alike, and the smooth one's the worst of the lot. I've known quite a few honorable soldiers, Maris said stiffly. Besides, I've always had a good feel for people. I think this Mithra, I think the commander can be trusted. She raised her eyebrows. I don't think trying to con him would be a good idea either. It's only a bad idea if you get caught, Kento said. You'd get what you bargained for in this universe, Maris. Nothing more. You don't have enough faith in people. I got all the faith I need, kiddo, Kento said calmly. I just happen to know a little more about human nature than you do. Human and non-human nature. I still think we need to play completely straight with him, Maris said. Playing straight is the last thing you want to do. Ever. It gives the other guy all the advantages. Kento nodded toward the closed door. And this guy in particular sounds like the sort who'll ask questions until we die of old age if we let him. Still, it wouldn't hurt if he kept us around for at least a little while, Kardas suggested. Praga's people are going to be pretty mad when he doesn't come back. Kento shook his head. They'll never pin it on us. Yes, but Dash... Look, kid, let me do the thinking, okay? Kento cut in. Swiveling his legs up onto the bunk, he lay back with his arms folded behind his back. Now everyone be quiet for a while. I've got to figure out how to play this. Maris caught Cardassa's eye, gave a little shrug, then turned and climbed up onto the bunk above Kento. Stretching out, she folded her arms across her chest and gazed meditatively at the underside of the bunk above her. Crossing to the other side of the room, Cardas folded down the table and one of the bench seats and sat down, wedging himself more or less comfortably between the table and wall. Putting his elbow on the table and propping his head up on his hand, he closed his eyes and tried to relax. He didn't realize he dozed off until a sudden buzz startled him awake. He jumped up as the door opened to reveal a single black-clad shiss. Commander Mithra Nuroto's respects, the alien said, the side bisty words coming out thickly accented. He requests your presence in forward visual one. Wonderful, Kento said, swinging his legs onto the floor and standing up. His tone and expression were the false cheerfulness Cardas had heard him use time and again in bargaining sessions. Not you, the Chiss said. He gestured to Cardas. This one only. Kento came to an abrupt halt. What? A refreshment is being prepared, the Chiss said. Until it is ready, this one only will come. Now wait a second. Kento growled. We stick together or dash. It's okay, Cardas interrupted hastily. The chiss standing in the doorway hadn't moved, but Cardas had caught a subtle shift of light and shadow that indicated there were others wandering around out there. I'll be fine. Cardas dash. It's okay, Cardas repeated, stepping to the doorway. The chiss moved back 
and he walked out into the corridor. There were indeed more chis waiting by the door, two of them on either side. Follow, the messenger said as the door closed. The group headed down the curved corridor, passing three cross corridors and several other doorways along the way. Two of the doors were open, and Cardas couldn't resist a furtive glance inside each as he passed. All he could see, though, was unrecognizable equipment and more black-clad chis. He had expected forward visual to be a crowded, high-tech room. To his surprise, the door opened into something that looked like a compact version of a Starliner's observation gallery. A long, curved couch sat in front of a convex floor-to-ceiling viewport currently showing a spectacular view of the glowing hyperspace sky as it flowed past the ship. The room's own lights were dimmed, making the display that much more impressive. Welcome, George Cardas. Cardas looked around. Mithronaroto was seated alone at the far end of the couch, silhouetted against the hyperspace sky. Commander, he greeted the other, glancing a question at his guide. The other nodded, stepping back and closing the door on himself and the rest of the escort. Feeling more than a little uneasy, Cardas stepped around the near end of the couch and made his way across the curve. Beautiful, isn't it? Mithron Urodo commented as Cardas arrived at his side. Please be seated. Thank you, Cardas said, easing himself onto the couch a cautious meter away from the other. May I ask why you sent for me? To share this view, of course, Mithron Urodo said drilly. And to answer a few questions. Cardas felt his stomach tighten. So it was to be an interrogation. Down deep he'd known it would be, but had hoped against hope that Maris's novelly idealistic assessment of their captor might actually be right. A very nice view it is, too, he commented, not knowing what else to say. I'm a little surprised to find such a room aboard a warship. Oh, it's quite functional, Mithron Urodo assured him. Its full name is Forward Visual Triangulation Site Number One. We place spotters here during combat to track enemy vessels and other possible threats, and to coordinate some of our line-of-sight weaponry. Don't you have sensors to handle that? Of course, Mithron Urodo said. And usually they're quite adequate. But I'm sure you know there are ways of misleading or blinding electronic eyes. Sometimes the eyes of a chiss are more reliable. I suppose... Cardas said, gazing at his host's own glowing eaves. In the dim light, they were even more intimidating. But isn't it hard to get the information to the gunners fast enough? There are ways, Mithron Urodo said. What exactly is your business, George Cardas? Captain Kento's already told you that, Cardas said, feeling sweat breaking out on his forehead. We're merchants and traders. Mithron Urodo shook his head. Unfortunately for your captain's assertions, I'm familiar with the economics of star travel. Your vessel is far too small for any standard cargo to cover even normal operating expenses, let alone emergency repair work. I therefore conclude that you have a sideline occupation. You haven't the weaponry to be pirates or privateers, so you must be smugglers. Cardas hesitated. What exactly was he supposed to say? I don't suppose it would do any good to point out that our economics and yours might not scale the same? He stalled. Is that what you claim? Cardas hesitated, but Mithran Urodo had that knowing look again. No, he conceded. We are mostly just traitors, as Captain Kento said but we sometimes do a little smuggling on the side. I see, Mithron Urodo said. I appreciate your honesty, George Cardas. You can just call me Cardas, Cardas said. In our culture, the first name is reserved for use by friends. You don't consider me a friend? Do you consider me one? 
Cardas countered. He regretted the words the instant they were out of his mouth. Sarcasm was hardly the option of choice in a confrontation like this. But Mithra Naruto merely lifted an eyebrow. No, not yet, he agreed calmly. Perhaps someday. You intrigue me, Cardas. Here you sit, captured by unfamiliar beings a long way from home. Yet instead of wrapping yourself within a blanket of fear or anger, you instead stretch outside yourself with curiosity. Cardas frowned. Curiosity? You studied my warriors as you were brought aboard, Mithra Naruto said. I could see it in your eyes and face as you observed and thought and evaluated. You did the same as you were taken to your quarters, and again as you were brought here just now. I was just looking around, Cardas assured him, his heart beating a little faster. Did spies rank above or below smugglers on Mithra Naruto's list of undesirables? I didn't mean anything by it. Calm yourself, Mithra Naruto said, some amusement creeping into his voice. I'm not accusing you of spying. I, too, have the gift of curiosity, and therefore prize it in others. Tell me, who is to receive the hidden gemstones? Cardas jerked. You found Dash? I mean. In that case, why did you ask me about it? As I said, I appreciate honesty, Mithra Naruto said. Who is the intended recipient? A group of huts operating out of the Kamra system, Cardas told him, giving up. Rivals to the ones you the ones who were attacking us. He hesitated. You didn't know they weren't just random pirates, didn't you? That they were hunting us specifically? We monitored your transmissions as we positioned ourselves to intervene, Mithra Naruto said. Though the conversation was of course unintelligible to us, I remembered hearing the phonemes de Brack Kento in the hut speech when Captain Kento later identified himself. The conclusion was obvious. A shiver ran up Cardas's back. A conversation in an alien language, and yet Mithra Naruto had been able to memorize enough of it to extract Kento's name from the gibberish. What kind of creatures were these chis anyway? Is the possession of these gems illegal, then? No, but the customs fees are ridiculously high, Cardas said, forcing his mind back to the interrogation. Smugglers are often used to avoid having to pay them, he hesitated. Actually, considering the people we got this batch from, they may also have been stolen. But don't tell Maris that. Oh? Cardas winced. There he was again, talking without thinking. If Mithra Naruto didn't kill him before this was over, Kento probably would. Maris is something of an idealist, he said reluctantly. She thinks this whole smuggling thing is just a way of making a statement against the greedy and stupid Republic bureaucracy. Captain Kento hasn't seen fit to enlighten her? Captain Kento likes her company, Cardas said. I doubt she'd stay with him if she knew the whole truth. He claims to care about her, yet lies to her? I don't know what he claims, Cardas said. Though I suppose you could say that idealists like Maris do a lot of lying to themselves. The truth is there in front of her if she wanted to see it. He took another look at those glowing red eyes. Though of course that doesn't excuse our part in it, he added. No, it doesn't, Mithra Naruto said. What would be the consequences if you didn't deliver the gemstones? Cardas felt his throat tighten. So much for the Honorable Commander Mithra Naruto. Fire gems must be valuable out here, too. They'd kill us, he said bluntly. Probably in some hugely entertaining way, like watching us get eaten by some combination of large animals. And if the delivery is merely late? Cardas frowned, trying to read the other's expression in the flickering hyperspace glow. What exactly do you want from me, 
Commander Mithran Urodo. Nothing too burdensome, Mithran Urodo said. I merely wish your company for a time. Why? Partly to learn about your people, Mithran Urodo said. But primarily so that you may teach me your language. Kardas blinked. Our language? You mean basic? That is the chief language of your republic, is it not? Yes, but... Kardas hesitated, wondering if there was a delicate way to ask a question like this. Mithranurodo might have been reading his mind. Or more likely, his eyes and face. I'm not planning an invasion, if that's what concerns you, he said, smiling faintly. Chis don't invade the territories of others. We don't make war against even potential enemies unless we're attacked first. Well, you certainly don't have to worry about any attacks from us, Kardas said quickly. We've got too many internal troubles of our own right now to go bother anyone else. Then we have nothing to fear from each other, Mithran Urodo said. It would be merely an indulgence of my curiosity. I see, Kardas said cautiously. Kento, he knew, would be into full bore bargaining mode at this point, pushing and prodding and squeezing to get everything he could out of the deal. Maybe that was why Mithra Nerodo was making this pitch to the clearly less experienced Kardas instead. Still, he could try. And what would we get out of it? He asked. For you, there would be an equal satisfaction of your own curiosity. Mithran Urodo lifted his eyebrows. You do wish to know more about my people, don't you? Very much, Kardas said. But I can't see that appealing to Captain Kento. Perhaps a few extra valuables added to his cargo, then. Mithran Urodo suggested. That might also help mollify your clients. Yes, they'll definitely need some mollifying, Kardas agreed grimly. A little extra loot would go a long way toward that. Then it's agreed, Mithran Urodo said, standing up. One more thing, Kardas said, scrambling to his feet. I'll be happy to teach you basic, but I'd also like some language lessons myself. Would you be willing in turn to teach me the Chis language, or to have one of your people do so? I can teach you to understand Chun, Mithran Urodo said his eyes narrowing thoughtfully. But I doubt you'll ever be able to properly speak it. I've noticed you don't even pronounce my name very well. Kardas felt his face warm. I'm sorry. No apology needed, Mithran Urodo assured him. Your vocal mechanism is close to ours, but there are clearly some differences. However, I believe I could teach you to speak Minisia. It's a trade language widely used in the regions around our territory. That would be wonderful, Kardas said. Thank you, Commander Mitha. Commander. As I said, Chun pronunciation is difficult for you, Mithra Nerodo noted drilly. Perhaps it would be easier if you called me by my core name, Thrawn. Kardas frowned. Is that permissible? Mithran Urodo Thrawn shrugged. It's questionable, he conceded. In general, full names are required for formal occasions, for strangers, and for those who are socially inferior. And I'm guessing we qualify on all three counts. Yes, Thrawn said. But I believe such rules may be broken when there are good and valid reasons for doing so. In this case, there are. It will certainly make things easier, Kardas agreed, bowing his head. Thank you, Commander Thrawn. You're welcome, Thrawn said. And now, a light refreshment has been prepared for you and the others. After that, the language lessons can begin. 3. The receptionist set down her calm link and smiled up at the man and woman standing over her. The Supreme Chancellor will see you now, Master Kbeath, 
she said. Thank you, Jedi Master Jorisk Bayoth said, his voice cool and brooding. Beside him, Lorana Jinsler winced to herself. Her master was angry, and under the circumstances she couldn't really blame him. But Kbeath's quarrel was with Palpatine, not a lowly receptionist who had no power or authority over the orders that issued from the Supreme Chancellor's office. There was no reason to vent his annoyance at her. That wasn't the way Kbeath did things, however. Without another word, he strode away from the woman's desk and headed for the doors to Palpatine's inner office. Lingering half a step behind him, Lorana made sure to catch the receptionist's eye and give her an encouraging smile before following. A pair of Bralfi came out the door as they approached, their yellow and green patterned hornskin quivering with emotion beneath their leather tunics. Pbeoth didn't break stride, but continued straight ahead toward the two aliens, forcing them to move hastily to either side to let him pass. Wincing again, Lana took a couple of quick steps to catch up with her master, reaching him just as he passed through the doors into the office. Supreme Chancellor Palpatine was seated at his desk, an expansive view of Coruscant's skyline visible through the wide window behind him. A young man wearing a tooled tunican and vest was standing beside him, leaning over the desk with a data pad and speaking in a low voice. Palpatine looked up as Kbeath and Lorana entered his face breaking into one of his famous smiles. Ah, uh, Master Kbeath, he said, gesturing them forward. And your young Padawan, of course Lorana Jinsler, isn't it? Welcome to you both. Let's dispense with the pleasantries, Chancellor, Kbeath said stiffly, pulling a data pad from his belt pouch as he strode forward. This isn't a social visit. The young man beside Palpatine straightened up his eyes flashing. You will not speak to the Supreme Chancellor in that tone, he said firmly. Mind your tongue, underling, Kbeoth growled. Take your bureaucratic trivia and get out. The young man didn't budge. You will not speak to the Supreme Chancellor in that tone, he repeated. It's all right, Kinman, Palpatine said soothingly holding out a restraining hand to the young man as he rose to his feet. I'm sure Master Kbeath doesn't mean any disrespect. For a moment Kbeath and Palpatine stared at each other across the wide expanse of the desk, an almost visible tension rippling the air between them. Then, to Lorana's relief, the Jedi Master's lip twitched. No, of course not, he said in a marginally more courteous voice. As I said, Palpatine said, smiling fondly at the young man. You haven't met my new assistant and advisor, have you, Master Kbeath? This is Kim and Doriana. Pleased and honored, Kbeath said in a tone that made it clear that he was either. As am I, Master Kbeath, Doriana replied. It's always a privilege to meet one of those who've dedicated their lives to safeguarding the Republic. As it is for me, as well. Palpatine agreed. What can I do for you, Master Kbeath? You know very well what you can do for me, Kbeath growled. Without waiting for an invitation, he seated himself in one of the chairs and set his data pad on the desk. In a word, outbound flight. Naturally, Palpatine said tiredly, gesturing Lorana to the chair beside Kbeath as he reseated himself in his own chair. What is it now? This. Waving a hand, Kbeath used the force to send the data pad sliding across the desk to stop in front of the Supreme Chancellor. The Senate Appropriations Committee has cut my funding again. Palpatine sighed. What do you want me to say, Master Kbeath? I can't dictate to the Senate what it should do. I certainly can't force a stiff-necked group like Appropriations to see things our way. Our way? Kbeath echoed. It's our way now, is it? I seem to remember a time not very long ago when you weren't at all enthusiastic about this whole project. Perhaps you should examine your memory more closely, Palpatine said, a slight edge creeping into his tone. It's the Jedi Council, not me, 
that's been backing away from outbound flight for the past few months. In fact, I was under the impression Master Yoda had even changed his mind about allowing more than one or two Jedi to join the expedition. I will deal with Master Yoda when the time comes, Kbeoth said firmly. Meanwhile, you're the one holding the project's fate in your hands. And I've done everything in my power to assist you, Palpatine reminded him. You have your ship's six brand new dreadnoughts, straight off the Rendili Star Drive assembly line. You have the central storage core you wanted, and the turbolift pylons ready to connect the whole thing together. You have the crews and passengers in training on Jaga Minor Dash. Ah. Uh, Kbeath interrupted, jabbing a finger at the data pad still sitting untouched in front of the Supreme Chancellor. In fact, I do not have my passengers, not at all. Some idiot bureaucrat has changed the population profile to consist of crews only with no families or other potential colonists. Reluctantly, Lorana thought Palpatine picked up the data pad. A cost-saving decision, most likely, he said, scrolling through the data. Having all those extra people aboard would mean more supplies and equipment. What it would mean is a cancellation of the entire project, Kbeath countered. What sense does it make to send an expedition to another galaxy if there's no chance of planting any colonies once we're there? Perhaps that's the committee's point, Palpatine suggested quietly. The political situation has changed considerably since you and the Council first proposed this project. Which is what makes outbound flight all the more important, Kbeoth said. We need to find out what dangers or threats might be lurking out in the unknown regions, or poised to invade us from another galaxy. Dangers? Palpatine echoed, lifting his eyebrows. I was under the impression that outbound flight's purpose was to search for new life and potential force users outside our borders. Certainly that was the rationale given in the original proposal. There's no reason it can't do both, Kbeoth said stubbornly. For that matter, I would think adding a security angle to the mission would make it more acceptable to the Senate, not less. Palpatine shook his head, his gray-white hair glinting in the light from the window behind him. Lorana could remember when that hair had been mostly brown, with only touches of gray at the temples. Now, after five years of carrying the Republic's weight on his shoulders, the brown had all but vanished. I'm sorry, Master Kbeath the Chancellor said. If you can persuade the Senate to override appropriations cuts, I'll be more than happy to support you. But at the moment, there's nothing more I can do. Unless, Doriana put in, Master Kbeoth is able to do something about the Barlock situation. There's nothing more I can do, Palpatine repeated, throwing a cautioning look at his assistant. At any rate, the Council's hardly going to send him out to Markal Sector when there are so many pressing matters to be attended to here. Not so fast, Kbeoth rumbled. What exactly is this problem? It's hardly even worth mentioning, Palpatine said reluctantly. A small dispute between the Corporate Alliance and one of Barlock's regional governments over some mining rights. Those Bralfi who left as you came in were just presenting their case and asking for assistance in negotiating a settlement. And you didn't immediately think of me? Kbeoth said drilly. I think I've been insulted. Please, Master Kbeoth, Palpatine said with a smile. I have far too many enemies on Coruscant already. I don't wish to add you to their number. Then make a bargain with me. Bayath offered. If I can resolve this dispute for you, will you instruct appropriations to restore outbound flights full funding? Lorana stirred uncomfortably in her seat. This was, it seemed to her, perilously close to the sort of under-the-desk speeder swapping that was steadily corroding the whole concept of justice in the Republic's government. But she didn't dare suggest that to Kbeath, certainly not in the presence of Palpatine and his aide. I can't make any promises, Palpatine cautioned. 
Certainly not where the Senate is concerned. But I believe in outbound flight, Master Kbeath, and I'll do everything in my power to make sure your dream is realized. For a long moment Kbeath didn't reply, and again Lorana felt the tension between the two men. Then, abruptly, the Jedi Master gave a short nod. Very well, Chancellor Palpatine, he said, rising to his feet. We'll be on our way to Barlock before the end of the day. He leveled a finger at Palpatine. Just make certain that when I come back I have my funding. And my colonists. I'll do my best, Palpatine said, giving the other a small smile. Good day, Master Kbeath, Padawan Jinsler. Lorana waited until they had passed through the outer office and were striding down the wide corridor before speaking. What did you mean we'd be off to Barlock tonight? She asked. Doesn't the council have to approve any such trips? Don't worry about the council, Kbeath said brusquely. Back there, on our way into Palpatine's office, you broke stride for those two Bralfi. Lorana felt her throat tighten. I didn't want to just run them down. You wouldn't have, he countered. I'd already measured the gap between them. Neither would have needed to move aside for us. Yet they did move, Lorana pointed out. Because they wished to do so, out of respect, he said. Understand this, my young Padawan. Someday you will be a Jedi with all the power and responsibility that it entails. Never forget that we are the ones who hold this republic together, not Palpatine, not the Senate, not the bureaucracy. Certainly not the small-minded people who can't make it through the day without running to Coruscant for help. They must learn to trust us and before there can be trust, there must be respect. Do you understand? I understand that we want them to respect us. Lorana said hesitantly. But must they fear us as well? Respect and fear are merely two sides of the same coin, Kbeath said. Lao Bang citizens hold the coin one way, those who wallow in lawlessness hold it the other. He lifted a finger. But with either group can you appear weak or indecisive? Ever. He lowered the raised finger tapping it against the lightsaber tucked into her belt. There are times when you'll wish your identity to remain unknown, and at those times you'll hide your lightsaber and all traces of who and what you are. But when you travel openly as a Jedi, you must behave as a Jedi. Always. Do you understand? Yes, Master Kbeath, Lorana said, only half-truthfully. Certainly she understood the words but some of the attitude was still incomprehensible to her. For a moment Kbeath continued to stare at her, as if sensing her partial duplicity. But to her relief, he turned away without demanding any more. Very well then, he said. I'll go to the temple and speak with the council. You call the spaceport and arrange transport for us to the Balak system. Once you've done that, go and pack. For how long? For a simple mineral rights dispute? Kbea scoffed. Travel time both ways plus three standard days. I'll have this sorted out in no time. Yes, master, Lorana murmured. And then, Kbeath continued, half to himself. We'll see to master Yoda and his short-sighted fears. Picking up his pace, he strode off down the corridor. Lorana slowed to a halt, watching as the messengers and bureaucrats walking along on their own business moved hastily out of the way for the tall, white-haired Jedi Master. Kbeath, for his part, never even slowed, as if he simply expected others to make room for him. When you travel as a Jedi, you must behave as a Jedi. She sighed. It didn't seem right to her this firm belief in the inherent superiority of Jedi over all others. Still, Kbeath had studied long and hard through many years, 
delving deeply into the mysteries and subtleties of the Force as he grew in power. Lorena, in contrast, was a young Padawan learner, barely started on her own path. She was hardly in a position to challenge him on any of these things. In any event, her master had given an order, and it was her task to obey him. Stepping to the side of the corridor, out of the way of the bustling pedestrians, she pulled out her comlink. She was about to key for the Jedi Temple's transportation service when, across the corridor, an all-too-familiar face caught her attention. She froze, her breath catching in her throat, her eyes and mind and Jedi senses stretching out through the crowd of people between them. She'd seen this man many times before in the past few years, generally in the public areas of the Senate chamber but occasionally other places as well. He was young, probably a year or two younger than her, of medium height and build with short cropped dark hair and a strangely bitter set to his mouth. She'd never gotten close enough to see what color his eyes were, but she assumed they were dark as well. And every time she'd seen him, she'd had the distinct sense that he was watching her. He was doing so now, studying her out of the corner of his eye as he pretended to work with a wiring panel he'd opened. She'd often seen him at wiring panels or fiddling with droid modules, but whether he actually knew his way around circuit boxes or whether he just used them as a pretext to hang around, she'd never figured out. At the beginning, she'd assumed it was all coincidence. Even now, she had no actual proof it was anything else. All she had was the fact that, as her Jedi skills had grown, she'd been able to stretch out even through crowded corridors like this one to sense his mind. And as she did so now, she found the same simmering resentment that she'd always felt before. Resentment and frustration and anger. Directed at her. Someone she'd harmed or slighted in a past so distant she couldn't even recall the incident? But she'd been in the Jedi Temple since she was an infant. One of the non-Jedi employees at the temple then? But surely her instructors would have taken action if they'd sensed any threat from him. The man looked in her direction. Then, deliberately, he turned his back on her and gave his full attention to his wiring panel. Lorana watched him work, fighting against her own flurry of discomforting emotions. Should she go over and try to find out what he had against her? Or should she go first to the Senate records and see if she could track down his identity, holding off on any confrontations until she had more information? Or should she let it go entirely, and assume that the meetings were a coincidence, and that his anger was merely directed at Jedi in general? She was still trying to make a decision when he closed the panel, collected his tool kit, and stalked away. He glanced back once as he reached the corner then disappeared around it. There is no emotion, there is peace. Lorana had been taught that dictum from her earliest days in the temple, and she tried her best to incorporate it into her life. But as long as the question of that man remained unresolved, she knew somehow that she could never have complete peace. She also knew that now was not the time. Taking a deep breath, lifting her calm link again, she keyed for the spaceport. The door closed behind the two Jedi, and for a moment Kim and Doriana gazed at the spot where they'd exited, a sour taste in his mouth. As a general rule, nearly all Jedi struck him as pompous and arrogant, and obscenely sure of themselves. But even with that head start Jorisk Bayath was in a class by himself. You really don't like him, do you? Palpatine asked mildly, Setting his expression carefully back to neutral, Doriana shifted his attention back to the Chancellor. I'm sorry, sir, he said. And he meant it. Whatever his personal feelings, it was bad policy to let emotions of any sort rise to the surface. Especially where Jedi were concerned. I just think that with all the other problems facing the Republic... A massive exploration and colonization project should be relegated to the bottom third of the priority list. 
and for Master Kbayath to insist that you personally do something about it. Dash. Patience, Kinman, Palpatine interrupted soothingly. You must learn to permit people their passions. Outbound flight is Master Kbayath's. He looked across the office toward the door. Besides, even if they find nothing of real value out there, it may be that just the news of their expedition will spark the imaginations of people across the Republic. If they ever do actually announce it, Doriana said. The last I heard, the Jedi Council still had the whole project wrapped in secrecy. Palpatine shrugged. I'm sure they have their reasons. Perhaps, Doriana hesitated. But I'd like to apologize to you, sir, for speaking out of turn during the meeting. Don't concern yourself about it, Palpatine assured him. Actually, it was an inspired suggestion. Master Kbayath is quite good at the sort of mediation the Barlock situation so sorely needs. I should have thought of it myself. He snorted under his breath. And to be perfectly honest, I'll be just as happy to have him off Coruscant for a couple of weeks. It'll give me a chance to consider how I'm going to persuade the Appropriations Committee to restore outbound flights funding. As well as find a way to persuade the Council to give Master Kbayath all the Jedi he wants. That one I can do nothing about, Palpatine said. If Kbayath wants more Jedi, he's the one who'll have to persuade Yoda and Windu. Yes, sir, Doriana murmured. Well, maybe he'll succeed so well at Balak that they'll have no choice but to give in. Or else they'll give in simply to get him off their backs, Palpatine said drilly. He's as persistent with them as he is with me. At any rate, that part is in Kbeath's hands now. Speaking of matters in hand, when are you leaving for your own trip? Tonight, Doriana said. I have a ship reserved, and all the necessary files and documents are prepared and packed. I just need to stop by my apartment after work to pack my personal items, and I'll be ready to go. Excellent, Palpatine said. Then you might as well go now. There's nothing more I need from you for the rest of the day. Thank you, sir, Doriana said. I'll keep you informed on what happens at the various meetings. Yes, do that. Palpatine raised his eyebrows. And be sure you deliver those data cards to Governor Kalfmar personally. Yes, I read the reports, Doriana said, nodding. Actually, if the timing works out, I may take an extra day to poke around and see if I can identify the traitor in his inner circle. With your permission, of course. Granted, Palpatine said. But be careful. There are rumors of growing dissatisfaction in that sector. There are rumors of that sort everywhere, Doriana said. I'll be all right. I trust so, Palpatine said. But still be careful. And hurry back. It was a 20-minute air taxi ride to Doriana's home in the Third Ring apartment towers northeast of the Senate complex. He split the time between Datapad and Comlink, checking on his travel plans and smoothing out the inevitable last-minute details. The taxi let him out on the 248th floor landing pad, and he rode the turbo lift 10 stories down to his apartment. Unlocking the door, he went in locking and privacy sealing it behind him. He had told Palpatine that he still had to pack his bags. In actual fact, they were already packed and sitting in a neat row just inside the conversation room. Passing them by, he went to the desk in the corner and sat down. From behind the false back in the bottom right-hand drawer, he took a hollow projector and plugged it into the computer. The access slash security code was a simple matter of 12 letters and 18 digits. Punching them in, he picked up his data pad again and settled back to wait. As usual, the wait wasn't very long. Barely three minutes after he sent the call, 
The hooded face of Darth Sidious shimmered into view above the hollow projector. Report, the other ordered in a gravelly voice. Jedi Master Kbeath is on his way to Barlock, my lord, Doriana said. Depending on what kind of transport he was able to get, he should be there in three to six days. Excellent, Sidious said. You'll have no trouble arriving ahead of him? None, my lord, Doriana assured him. My courier is faster than anything the Jedi can provide. He'll also have to stop off at the temple and persuade the council to give him official permission, while I'm ready to go right now. And all the groundwork has been laid. Then he should arrive to a warm reception indeed, Sidious said, his lips curving in a satisfied smile. What about Chancellor Palpatine? You're certain he won't notice this little side trip? I've built the necessary slack into my schedule, Doriana assured him. I can spend up to three days on Balak without filling behind. If it ends up taking longer, there are a couple of items on my agenda I should be able to resolve via Holonet conference. I can do that from Balak or anywhere else along the way, without having to actually travel to those systems. Again, excellent, Sidious said. I have many servants, Doriana, but few as clever and as subtle as you. Thank you, my lord, Doriana said, a warm glow flowing through him. Darth Sidious, Dark Lord of the Sith, was not a man who was generous with his compliments. It will be a distinct pleasure to get Jorisk Bayath out of our way. Sidious went on. All indeed goes according to my plan. Yes, my lord. Doriana said. I'll report as soon as we've achieved our victory. Just make certain we have that victory, Sidious said, the note of warning in his tone sending a chill through the lingering warmth of his earlier compliment. Proceed with your work, my friend. Yes, my lord. The image vanished. Shutting off the hollow projector, Doriana disconnected it from the computer and returned it to its hiding place. Then, pocketing his data pad, he retraced his steps to where his packed bags waited. Yes, the punishment for failing the Sith Lord would undoubtedly be severe. Nearly as severe, he had no doubt, as that which would descend upon him if Chancellor Palpatine ever learned that he had a traitor in his inner office. But if the price of failure was great, so were the rewards of success. Doriana's apartment, his position and his quiet but far-ranging authority were proof of that. It was, in his estimation, a gamble well worth taking. Besides which, he did so enjoy the game. Pulling out his comm link, he keyed for a taxi to take him to the spaceport. Then, gathering his bags together, he headed for the turbo lift. The door to the Jedi Council chamber slid open. Come! Jedi Master Mace Winda called. Squaring his shoulders, wondering what this was all about, Obi-Wan Kenobi stepped inside. And stopped, feeling his forehead wrinkling in surprise. A person summoned to the Jedi Council Chamber naturally expected to find the entire Council waiting for him. But aside from Windu, standing over by the windows gazing out at the city, the room was deserted. No, you haven't misunderstood where you were supposed to go, Winda said, half turning to give Obi-Wan a faint smile. I need to talk to you. Certainly, Master Windu, Obi-Wan said, still frowning as he crossed to where Winda stood. Is this about Anakin again? No, Winda said, raising his eyebrows questioningly. Why, what's young Skywalker done now? Nothing. Obi-Wan assured him hastily. At least, nothing in particular. But you know what 14-year-old Padawan learners are like. Strong, cocky, and amazing Navi, Winda said, smiling again. I wish you luck with him. Obi-Wan shrugged. If there is such a thing as luck. You know what I mean. Winda turned back to look out the window. Tell me. Have you ever heard of a project called Outbound Flight? 
Obi-Wan searched his memory. I don't think so. It was proposed as a grand exploration and colonization mission, Winda said. Six dreadnought warships were to be linked to each other around the central equipment and supply storage core, the whole thing to be sent out into the unknown regions and from there to another galaxy. Obi-Wan blinked. To another galaxy? No, I haven't heard anything at all about this. What's the proposed time frame? Actually, it's mostly ready now, Winda said. Just the final assembly and some disagreements about the passenger list. Who's in charge of it? The Senate? Nominally, it was the Council's plan, Winda said. In practice, it's been Master Kbeath who's been the chief driving force behind it. Joris Kbeath, master of the designated interview? Obi-Wan asked really. And yet the project hasn't made Holonet newscasts? Incredible. You shouldn't talk about a Jedi Master that way. Windu reproved him mildly. Am I wrong? Windu shrugged, a slight lift of his shoulders. The fact is, everyone connected with outbound flight has had their reasons for keeping the project out of the public eye, he said. Chancellor Palpatine has been concerned that spending time and money this way in the face of the Republic's other problems might not go over very well. Ditto for the Senate, which provided the dreadnoughts they'll be using. He pursed his lips. As for the Council, we had reasons of our own. Let me guess, Obi-Wan said. Kbeath is hoping outbound flight can find out what happened to Vergir. Winda looked at him in mild surprise. You are growing in Jedi insight, aren't you? I'd like to think so, Obi-Wan said. But this doesn't really qualify. Anakin and I never did get the whole story on her disappearance. More to the point, we weren't able to find her on our last trip out that direction. Never mind what Kbeath wants. I want to know what happened to her. Careful, Obi-Wan, Winda warned. You mustn't allow your emotions to intrude on this. Obi-Wan bowed his head. My apologies. Emotion is the enemy, Winda went on. Emotion of all sorts. Yours and Master Kbeath's. Obi-Wan frowned. You think Master Kbeath is getting too close to this project? To be honest, I don't know what's happening with him, Windu admitted reluctantly. He insists that we need to send a strong force out into the unknown regions to find Vergir and bring her back, which is all well and good. But at the same time he talks about how the Republic is teetering on the brink and how it might be good to transfer some of the best Jedi out of the Republic entirely, settling them in new colonies in the unknown regions where Coruscant politics can't touch them. You're not really considering doing that, are you? Obi-Wan asked. We're spread thin enough as it is. Most of the council would agree with you, Winda said. Unfortunately, the majority also think that by now Vergera's trail is so cold it will probably be impossible to follow. Most of those who still hold out hope think a smaller probe would still be worthwhile, something larger than your attempt but far below the scale Kbeath wants. He grimaced. The bottom line is that Kbeath is about the only one still pushing for the full outbound flight. Are you suggesting he might defy the council if you tried to cancel it? Why not? Winda countered. Obi-Wan turned back to face the window, and for a moment the room was silent. So what exactly does the council want me to do? Obi-Wan asked at last. At this moment, Master Kbeath and his Padawan, Lorana Jinsler, are on their way to the spaceport, Winda said. Apparently, Chancellor Palpatine mentioned some bogged-down negotiations on Barlock, and Kbeath persuaded the Council to send him there to mediate. Is this something major? Major enough, Winda said. The Corporate Alliance versus the Local Government and you know how anything involving any of the big corporate players makes headlines these days. 
Yes, Obi-Wan murmured. Center stage negotiations, so of course Kbeath would be headed in that direction. Again, what do you want me to do? A muscle in Winda's cheek tightened. We want you to go to Barlock and keep an eye on him. Obi-Wan felt his mouth drop open. Me? I know, Windu agreed soberly. But you're here, and you're available. Besides, Skywalker seemed to get along well enough with him the one time they met. Maybe you can frame the whole thing as a desire to show your Padawan how Jedi negotiations are done. Obi-Wan snorted. You really think Bayath will buy that? Probably not, Windu conceded. But if you don't go, it'll have to be either Yoda or me. You think he'll be less explosive if one of us shows up? You have a point, Obi-Wan said with a sigh. Fine. We're between assignments anyway. And you're right. Anakin was rather impressed by that take-charge single-mindedness of his. Maybe a little youthful hero worship will keep him calm. Maybe, Winda said. At any rate, there'll be a ship waiting by the time you and Skywalker get to the spaceport. Any instructions other than to just watch him? Not really, Winda said. He pursed his lips, and his gaze seemed to stretch out toward infinity. There's something else going on, though. Something deep inside the man that I haven't been able to get a grip on. Some private thoughts, or agenda, or... I don't know. Something. Right, Obi-Wan said. I'll be sure to watch for that. Windy gave him the sort of wryly patient look Jedi Master seemed to do so well. And keep in touch, he said. Four. Thrawn had told Cardos that his base wasn't far from the spot where his task force had run into the bargain hunter. What he hadn't mentioned was that the trip would take nearly three standard days. About time, Kento muttered under his breath as the three humans stood together at the back of the Springhawks Bridge and watched as the handful of ships flew in formation across a small asteroid field. I'm about to go stir-crazy. You could always join Maris and me for the language lessons, Cardas offered. Commander Thrawn really is decent company. No thanks, Kento grunted. You two want to aid and abet a potential enemy, be my guests. Not me. These people are not potential enemies, Maris said firmly. As you'd realize if you'd made any effort to get to know them. They're very polite and extremely civilized. Yeah, well, the Huns have a civilization too, or so they say. Kento retorted. Sorry, but it'll take more than good manners to convince me the Chiss are harmless. Mentally, Cardas shook his head. Ever since that first night aboard when he'd been frozen out of the negotiations, Kento had been nursing a grudge against the Chiss in general and Thrawn in particular. Cardas and Maris had both tried to talk some sense back into him, but Kento was more interested in brooding than in reason and after a few attempts Cardas had given up. Maybe Maris had, too. Thrawn had been across the bridge, standing beside the crewer at what Cardas had tentatively identified as the navigation station. Now the commander stepped back and circled to where the humans waited. There, he said, pointing ahead out the wide viewport. The large asteroid with the slow rotation. That's our base. Cardas frowned at it. The asteroid wasn't rotating so much as it was doing a slow wobble, nearly but not quite end over end. Not for pseudo-gravitational purposes, obviously. The Springhawks showed that the Chiss had artificial gravity. So why pick a rotating asteroid? Maris was obviously wondering the same thing. That wobble must make it hard to dock with she commented. It does require a certain degree of skill, Thrawn agreed, lifting his eyebrows slightly like a teacher trying to draw an answer from a group of students. Cardas looked back at the asteroid. 
Could Thrawn have set up a deliberately tricky docking procedure as a training exercise for new recruits? But he could do that more easily and safely with a separate practice station. Unless this asteroid was merely a training facility and not his main base at all. There were certainly no lights or indications of construction showing anywhere that he could see. Was that the conclusion Thrawn expected them to come to? And then, suddenly, he had it. You've got a passive sensor array at one end, he said. The wobble lets it sweep the whole sky instead of just one spot. But why spin the whole asteroid? Maris asked, sounding puzzled. Couldn't you just rotate the array? Sure he could, Kento growled. But then there'd be something moving on the surface an enemy might spot. This way everything's all nice and quiet and peaceful, right up to the minute when he blows their ships out from under them. Essentially correct, Thrawn said. Though we're not expecting enemies to actually come calling. Still, it's wise to take precautions. And they didn't blow our ship out from under us, Maris said, tapping a finger on Kento's chest for emphasis. Kento turned a glower toward her. Kardas spoke up quickly. So we're in Chiss space now? Yes and no, Thrawn said. Currently, there are only some survey and observation teams here, so it's hardly representative of a proper Chiss system. However, the second planet is quite habitable and within a few years will probably be opened up to full colonization. At that point, it will come officially under the protection and control of the nine ruling families. I hope you're not expecting us to stay for opening ceremonies, Kento muttered. Of course not, Thrawn assured him. I tell you this simply because you might wish to return someday and see what we've made of the Krusty system. You've named it already? Maris asked. The initial survey team always has that honor, Thrawn said. In this case, the name Krusty is an acronym for Dash. Crossister Mithran Erodo, a chis called from across the bridge. Ris Fikar Tli Claristi Su Feramos Roka. Sa Krasmi Suchisfla, Thrawn replied sharply, striding back to his command chair in the center of the bridge and sitting down. Hose Michigan Fallier. What did he say? Kento demanded, grabbing at a nearby chair back for balance as the Springhawk veered sharply portside and began to pick up speed. What's going on? The Chiss grammar was logical and relatively easy to learn, but after only three days of lessons he didn't have much vocabulary to work with. The only word roots I caught were the ones for stranger and run. Stranger. Run. Kento hissed between his teeth as the stars in the viewport stretched into starlines. They're after someone. Someone not too far away either, Maris murmured. Isn't stay a word root for near? Yes, I think you're right, Cardas agreed. I wonder if we ought to go back to our quarters. We stay right here, Kento said firmly. We already saw how they treated one ship that wandered in too close. I want to see what they do with another. They only took up Praga because he fired first, Maris pointed out. Yeah, Kento said. Maybe. For the next few minutes the bridge crew worked busily at their stations, the silence punctuated only by an occasional command or comment. Cardas found himself staring at the back of Thrawn's head as the commander sat motionlessly in his chair, wondering if he dared sidle up behind the other and ask for an explanation as to what was going on. A few seconds later he was glad he hadn't. Less than a minute after entering hyperspace, they suddenly dropped back out again. Already? Kento muttered, sounding stunned. He did a micro-jump. Cardas said, hardly believing it himself. Ridiculous, 
Kento insisted. You can't hit the side of the Senate building with a dash. Abruptly, the deck jerked beneath them, nearly knocking them off their feet. Reflexively, Cardos grabbed Maris's upper arm with one hand and a nearby conduit with the other, keeping both of them on their feet. Just as a pair of small ships roared past the viewport, spitting laser fire and missiles at the Springhawk. I'd say he did a little better than hit the side of the Senate building. Cardos managed as the deck again shook beneath them. Looks like he's right where he wants to be. Terrific, Kento bit out. I'm glad he wants to be here. The shaking subsided as the attackers flew out of optimum firing range, and Cardas focused on the visual displays. There were just three ships indicated, the two fighters now coming around for another pass, plus one larger ship considerably farther away. Unlike the fighters, the larger vessel seemed to be trying to move away from the battle zone instead of into it. Here they come, Kento said. Cardos looked back at the viewport. The Springhawk had swiveled to face its attackers, and in the distance he could see the glow as the fighters kicked their drives to full power. Grab onto something, he warned, resettling his fingers around the conduit as Maris got a grip beside his. The fighters split formation as they approached, veering toward opposite sides of their target, their lasers opening up again. The Springhawk's weapons returned fire and both attackers exploded. Whoa! Kento said. What in the dash? They blew up, Maris breathed. A single shot, and they just blew up. Don't start cheering just yet, Cardas warned. The Springhawk was swinging away from the expanding clouds of debris and picking up speed. There's still the big one left. The dizzying sweep of stars settled down as they finished their turn, and in the distance he could see the drive glow of the larger ship. I don't suppose we could be lucky enough for it to be unarmed, Kento said. Thrawn wouldn't attack an unarmed ship, Maris told him firmly. Why not? Kento growled back. I would. Those fighters attacked first. That makes the whole bunch of them fair game. And probably dead meat, Cardas muttered. Maris shivered but said nothing. The other ships saw them coming, of course. Even as the Springhawk closed to firing range, it swung partway around, and a handful of missiles streaked out. The Chiss lasers flashed in reply, and the missiles vaporized in mid-flight. The enemy responded by rolling ninety degrees over and launching a second salvo. This group, too, was dealt with at a safe distance. A third missile group followed, then a fourth, all destroyed en route. Why don't they jump to light speed? Maris murmured. I don't think they can, Cardas told her, pointing to one of the tactical displays. Looks to me like someone took out their hyperdrive. When? Kento asked, frowning. I don't remember hearing any firing before the fighters attacked. Someone had to be here to call in the news, Cardas reminded him. Maybe he got in a lucky shot. Whatever the reason, the other ship was definitely not getting away. The Springhawk continued to close the gap, and as they neared it, Cardas noticed for the first time that its hull was covered in what looked like ovoid bubbles, each roughly two meters across and three long. What are those things? He asked. Kento? No idea, the other said, craning his neck. They look kind of like tiny observation blisters. Part of the navigation system, maybe? Or cabin viewports, Maris said, her voice suddenly tight. Could it be a passenger liner? What, with four clusters of missile launchers? Kento countered. Not a chance. The Chiss helmsman moved the Springhawk alongside the alien vessel, compensating almost casually for its sluggish attempts to veer away, and nestled up against the other's hull. 
There was a quick stutter of dull thuds as maglocks were engaged, and Thrawn tapped a key on his command board. C.H. Tra, he called. Go, Cardas translated. Looks like we're boarding. The commander rose from his chair and turned around. My apologies, he said, switching to side Bisti as he crossed to the three humans. I hadn't intended to take you into danger this way. But the opportunity presented itself, and I needed to take it. That's all right, Commander, Cardas assured him. And it didn't look like we were in that much danger. As it turned out, Thrawn said. Stepping to a bank of lockers along one wall, he opened one and pulled out an armored vac suit. Your quarters are too close to the boarding area for safety, so I'll ask you to remain here until we return. You're going in personally? Maris asked, frowning. I command these warriors, Thrawn said, climbing into the vac suit with sure, practiced movements. Part of my duty is to share in their danger. Maris glanced at Kento. Be careful, she said, sounding almost embarrassed. Thrawn gave her a small smile. Don't worry, he said. Slapping the final seal closed, he pulled a helmet and large handgun from the locker. The vessel is most likely severely undercrewed, and Chiss warriors are the best there are. I'll return soon. Cardas had wondered at first why none of the rest of the bridge crew had joined with Thrawn in the boarding party, the sounds of which they could occasionally hear wafting along the corridors and through the open door. It was soon clear, though, that they weren't just sitting around waiting, but were actively engaged in some project of their own. It was only as the melee was winding down that he was able to piece together a few recognizable snatches of conversation and figure out what that project had been. Using the Springhawk sensors, they'd been assisting the boarders in tracking down enemy combatants, whether hiding or gathering together for an ambush. Even charging pirate-style onto an enemy vessel, Commander Thrawn made use of all available resources. It took less than an hour for the Chiss to secure the enemy vessel. Another two hours went by, though, before one of the warriors came to the bridge with instructions to bring the humans aboard. Cardas hadn't traveled very much before hooking up with Kento and Maris. But most of his recent travel had been to the seedier parts of the Republic, and as he stepped into the boarding tunnel he was confident he could handle anything they found at the other end. He was wrong. The vessel itself was bad enough. Dank and dirty, its entire interior showed signs of multiple repairs done in a hasty and careless manner and the mixture of odors swirling through its corridors made his nose itch. Worse than that were the dozens of blast points and scorch marks on the walls and ceilings, mute reminders of the short but vicious battle that had just taken place. Worst of all were the bodies. Cardos had seen bodies before, but only the serene and neatly laid out ones he'd encountered at funerals. Never before had he seen bodies haphazardly stretched out wherever the Chiss weapons had thrown them, twisted into whatever grotesque contortions their own death throes had sculpted for them. He winced as the Chiss warrior led them through various clumps of the dead, not wanting to look at them but forced to do so if he didn't want to step on them, hoping desperately that he didn't completely shame himself by getting sick. Relax, Kit. Kento's voice muttered at his side as they reached yet another scattering of corpses. They're just bodies. They can't hurt you. I know that, Cardas growled, throwing a surreptitious look at Maris. Even she, with all her genteel upbringing and idealistic sensitivity, was doing better with this than he was. Ahead, a door opened, and Thrawn stepped into the corridor. He was still wearing his vac suit, but the helmet now hung on a fastener on his left hip. Come, he called, beckoning. I want to show you something. Nearly there. Taking a deep breath, focusing his attention on Thrawn's glowing eyes, Cardas managed to make it the rest of the way. What are your thoughts? Thrawn asked as they reached him, gesturing to the corridor around them. 
I think they were probably very poor, Maris said, her tone mostly calm but with an edge of disapproval. You can see where they've had to patch and repatch just to keep everything operating. This isn't a military ship, certainly not one that could have been a threat to the Chiss. I agree, Thrawn agreed, turning his glowing eyes on her. So, per people you think? Nomads? Or refugees, she said, the disapproving edge growing a little sharper. And the missiles? They didn't do the passengers much good, did they? No, but it wasn't from lack of trying. Thrawn turned to Kento. And you, Captain? What's your reading of this? I don't know, Kento said calmly. And I don't especially care. They fired first, right? Thrawn shrugged microscopically. Not entirely true, he said. One of the sentries I had stationed here happened to be close enough as they came through to disable their hyperdrive. Cardos? Your opinion? Cardos looked around at the faded and motley walls. He might not have had a lot of schooling before running off to space, but he'd had enough to know when a teacher was still looking for an answer he hadn't yet gotten from anyone else. But what was the answer? Maris was right. The ship did indeed look like it was falling apart. But Thrawn was right about the missiles, too. Would refugees have weapons like that? And then, suddenly, it struck him. He looked behind him, locating the nearest alien body and doing a quick estimate of its height and reach. Another look at the wall, and he turned back to Thrawn. These aren't the ones who did the repairs, are they? Very good. Thrawn said, smiling faintly. No, they aren't. What do you mean? Kento asked, frowning. These aliens are too tall, Cardas explained, pointing to the wall. See here, where the sealant pattern changes texture? That's where whoever was slopping it on had to go get a ladder or float pad to finish the job. And whoever that worker was... He was considerably shorter than the masters of this vessel. Thrawn turned back to Maris. As you deduced, the vessel has indeed been repaired many times. But not by its owners. Maris's lips compressed into a hard, thin line, her eyes suddenly cold as she looked back at the dead bodies. They were slavers. Indeed, Thrawn said. Are you still angry at me for killing them? Maris's face turned pink. I'm sorry. I understand. Thrawn's eyebrows lifted slightly. You of the Republic don't condone slavery yourselves, do you? No, of course not, Maris assured him hastily. We have droids to handle most menial chores, Cardas added. What are droids? Mechanical workers that can think and act on their own, Cardas explained. You must have something of the sort yourselves. Actually, we don't, Thrawn said, eyeing Cardas thoughtfully. Nor do any of the alien cultures we've met. Can you show me one? Beside Maris, Kento rumbled warningly in his throat. We didn't bring any on this trip, Cardas said, ignoring his captain's thunderous expression. Kento had warned him repeatedly not to discuss the Republic's technology level with the Chiss. But in Cardassa's opinion this hardly qualified. Besides, Thrawn had surely already examined the bargain hunter's records, which must show a dozen different types of droids in action. A pity, Thrawn said. Still, if the Republic has no slavery, how is it you understand the concept? Cardas grimaced. We do know a few cultures where it exists, he admitted reluctantly. And your people permit this? Kento put in impatiently. Look, are we done here yet? Not quite, Thrawn said, gesturing toward the door he'd just come through. Come and look. 
More bodies? Stealing himself, determined not to go all woozy again even if the whole place was piled high with them, Cardas stepped past the commander and through the doorway. And stopped short, his mouth dropping open in amazement. The room was unexpectedly large, with a high ceiling that must have stretched up at least two of the ship's decks. But it wasn't piled high with bodies. It was piled high with treasure. Treasure of all kinds, too. There were piles of metal ingots of various colors and sheens, neatly stacked inside acceleration webbing. There were rows of bins, some filled with coins or multicolored gems, others stocked with rectangular packages that might have been food or spices or electronics. Several heavy-looking cabinets against one wall probably held items that would have been too tempting to leave within easy reach of the slaves or perhaps even the crew itself. There was also a good deal of artwork, flats, sculpts, trestles, and other forms and styles Cardas couldn't even categorize. Most of it was stacked together, but he could see a few pieces scattered around throughout the room, as if some of the loaders either hadn't recognized them as art, or else hadn't much cared where they put them. There was a sharp intake of air and a slightly strangled gasp as Kento and Maris came in behind him. What in the worlds? Maris breathed. A treasure vessel, carrying the plunder of many worlds, Thrawn said, slipping into the room behind them. They were not only slavers, but pirates and raiders as well. With an effort, Cardas pulled his eyes away from the treasure trove and focused on Thrawn. You sound like you already know these people. Only by reputation, Thrawn said, his almost gentle tone in sharp contrast to the tightness in his face as he gazed across the room. At least up until now. You've been hunting them? A slight frown creased Thrawn's forehead. Of course not, he said. The Vigari have made no move against the Chiss ascendancy. We therefore have no reason to hunt them. But you know their name, Kento murmured. As I said, I know their reputation, Thrawn said. They've been moving through this region of space for at least the past ten years, preying mostly on the weak and the technologically primitive. What about their slaves? Maris asked. Do you know anything about them? Thrawn shook his head. We haven't found any aboard this vessel. From that and from this room, I presume they were en route to their main base. And they offloaded the slaves to keep them from finding out where that base is? Cardas suggested. Exactly, Thrawn said. The crew complement is smaller than one would expect for a vessel of this size, as well. That indicates they weren't expecting trouble, but instead intended to go straight home. Yes, you mentioned back on the bridge that they were undercrewed. Cardas said. How did you know that? I deduced it from the fact that their defense was sluggish and mostly ineffectual, Thrawn said. They did little but launch missiles, all running the same countermeasures we'd already seen. A fully crewed vessel would have had laser gunners in place and would have shifted the defense patterns of their missiles. Clearly, they were expecting their escort to do any fighting that became necessary. And boy were they wrong, Kento muttered. You had them outclassed from the start. Hardly outclassed, Thrawn told him. I merely noticed that in both of their attacks a laser salvo preceded their missiles in a distinct and predictable pattern. When they launched their third attack, I was able to fire back just as the tube's protective doors opened, detonating the missiles before they could be launched. Fighters that size never have sufficient armor to withstand that sort of internal blast. You see? Cardas said drilly. Nothing to it. Kento's lip twisted. Yeah, he said. Right. So what happens now? Maris asked. I'll have the vessel towed back to Krusty for further study, Thrawn said, giving the room one last look before turning back to the door. 
Question, Kento put in. You told Cardas you'd be giving us some extra stuff as payment for teaching you basic, right? That wasn't precisely the way I stated it, Thrawn said. But that's essentially correct. And the longer we stay, the more extras we get? Thrawn smiled faintly. That may be possible. I thought you were in a rush to return home. No, no, there's no hurry, Kento assured him, giving the treasure room a leisurely sweep of his eaves. His earlier impatience, Cardas noted, seemed to have vanished without a trace. No hurry at all. 5. Come, Padawan, Kbea said tartly, half turning to throw a glare behind him. Stop lagging. Yes, Master Kbeath, Lorana said, picking up her pace and hoping fervently that at her increased speed she'd be able to get through the early morning marketplace crowds without running down any of the shoppers. Up to now the browsing Bralfi had been able to get out of Kbeath's way as he strode through their midst, but she suspected part of that was the fact that he was as hard to miss as an approaching thunderstorm. She, unfortunately, didn't have nearly the same commanding presence, and there had been some near misses already. The frustrating part was that there was no need for them to walk this fast in the first place they still had plenty of time before the day's negotiations began. No, Kbeoth was simply angry, angry at the stubborn Bralf negotiators, angry at the equally stubborn corporate alliance representatives. Angrier still at the careless drafters of the original mineral rights contract who had left matters open to multiple interpretations in the first place. And the angrier Kbeoth got, the faster he walked. Fortunately, the force was with Lorana, and she made it to the end of their particular market segment without bowling anyone over and crossed onto one of the wide promenades that divided up the marketplace. Hello there. One more segment to go and they would climb the steps to the wide western door of the city administration center where the negotiations would soon resume. Unfortunately, Kbeoth responded to the open area by picking up his pace all the more. Grimacing, Lorana sped up as much as she could without breaking into a trot, which she knew would bring an instant rebuke as being undignified and unbecoming of a Jedi. And then, without warning, Kbeoth broke to an abrupt halt. What is it? Lorana asked, stretching out with the force as she came to a stop beside him. She could detect no danger or threat nearby, only Kbeath's own suddenly heightened annoyance. Master Kbeath? Typical, he growled, his hair and beard rustling against his robe as he turned his head. Nervous and distrusting, the whole lot of them. Come, Padawan. He strode off toward the market square to their right. Lorana craned her neck to look as she followed, trying to figure out what he was talking about. And then she saw two men coming toward them through the crowd, a Jedi and his Padawan, both of them familiar-looking, striding confidently through the ordinary people like lights amid a swirl of dead leaves. She frowned, the mental image suddenly catching her conscious attention. A swirl of dead leaves. When in the worlds had she started to think of non-Jedi that way? Surely that wasn't how she'd been brought up to think of the people she had dedicated her life to serve. Could it be an attitude she'd picked up from some of the people she traveled among since becoming Kbeath's Padawan? Certainly many of them had seemed to consider themselves inferior to those who carried the lightsaber. Or had she picked it up from Kbeath himself? Was that how he thought about people? Kbea stopped a few meters from the edge of the square and waited, and as the two figures threaded their way around the final group of shoppers and continued toward them Lorana finally matched their faces with their names. Master Kbeath, Obi-Wan Kenobi said, nodding and greeting as he and his Padawan, Anakin Skywalker, walked up. Master Kenobi, Kbeath greeted them in turn his voice and manner polite but with an edge of intimidation beneath the words. This is a surprise. Have you come all the way from Coruscant just to shop for prished fruits? It is said that Barlock horticultural techniques produce the best specimens, Obi-Wan replied calmly. 
And you? You know perfectly well why we're here, Kbeoth said. Tell me, how is Master Windu? Kenobi's lip twitched slightly. He's well. That's good to hear. Kbeoth shifted his attention to the young teen standing at Kenobi's side, and a slight smile finally touched the corners of his lips. Master Skywalker, isn't it? He said in a friendlier tone. Yes, Master Kbeath, Anakin said, and Lorana couldn't help but smile herself at the earnest gravity in the boy's voice. It's an honor to see you again. As it is likewise an honor for me to meet once more with such a promising Padawan, Kbeath replied. Tell me, how goes your training? Anakin glanced at Kenobi. There's always more to learn, of course, he said. I can only hope my progress is satisfactory. His progress is more than satisfactory, Kenobi put in. At this rate, he'll be a full Jedi before he's twenty. Lorana winced. She herself was already twenty-two, and Kbeoth had made no mention of recommending her for Jedi knighthood any time soon. Was Anakin that much stronger in the Force than she was? And yet he began his training so much later than usual, Kbeoth pointed out, smiling almost fondly at the boy. That makes his development even more impressive. Indeed, Kenobi said. In hindsight, I think it's clear that the Council made the right decision in permitting me to train him. There was just the slightest emphasis on the word me, and for half a second a dark cloud seemed to hover at the edge of Kbeath's face. Then the darkness faded, and he smiled again. This has been a pleasant meeting, he said. But the negotiators are assembling, and I have work to do. I trust you'll excuse me if I go and deal with legitimate council business. Certainly, Kenobi said, his cheek tightening slightly at the implication that he and his Padawan were not, in fact, on legitimate council business themselves. But I forget my manners. Kbeoth continued. This is a full and rich city, and you and Master Skywalker will undoubtedly wish to sample its amusements while you're here. He gestured to Lorana. My Padawan, Lorana Jinsler, would be honored to escort you on your explorations. Thank you, but that won't be necessary, Kenobi said, throwing Lorana a measuring look. We'll be fine. I insist, Kbeoth said and there was no mistaking the command in his tone. I wouldn't want you getting in the way of the talks, or accidentally running afoul of any of the negotiators. He looked at Anakin. Besides, I imagine Master Skywalker would enjoy the company of another Padawan for a while. Again, Anakin looked at his teacher. Well, and I take it as a personal favor as well, Kbeoth added looking back at Kenobi. There's really nothing for Lorana to do in the negotiations, and thus no real reason for me to keep her there. I'm sure she'd prefer to be out and about, and I'd feel better knowing she was touring the city with someone reliable. Kenobi's lip twitched. He wasn't at all happy about this Lorana could see that even without the Force. But he'd been outmaneuvered, and he knew it. As you wish, Master Kbeath, he said. We'd be honored to have your Padawan's company for the present. For as long as you wish, Kbeath said. Now I must go. Farewell. Turning, he strode away. Lorana watched him go, her throat tightening. She'd been perfectly content to sit behind Kbeath during the negotiations and up to now he'd seemed equally content to have her there. Had she done something to displease him? Still, whatever the reason, she had her orders, even if they'd been largely unspoken. Bracing herself, she turned back around. To find Kenobi and Anakin gazing expectantly back at her. Well, she said, wincing at the inanity of the word. A Padawan of Joris Kbeathes should be more urbane and eloquent than that. I've only been in the city for a day, 
but I did pick up a guide card for visitors at the spaceport. So did we, Kenobi said, lifting his eyebrows slightly. Clearly, he wasn't going to make this easy on her. Master Kenobi Dash You know any place to get good Tarsh Maxes? Anakin spoke up hopefully. I'm hungry. Kenobi smiled at his Padawan, and when he looked back at Lorana she could feel the tension between them fading away. Actually, that sounds good to me, too, he agreed. Let's hunt down a diner. Seated on the balcony of his hotel room, Doriana watched as the three of them headed off toward one of the city's more mid-scale restaurant districts, scowling as he followed their leisurely progress through his macro binoculars. So the Jedi Council had pulled a fast one on him, sending Obi-Wan Kenobi and his upstart Padawan to keep an eye on Kbeath. That hadn't been part of Sidious's plan. But then, these two seemed to be making a career of that sort of thing. He remembered vividly Sidious's anger after the Naboo incident and the unexpected defeat of his Trade Federation allies. Their army should have been able to occupy the planet for months or years, creating a turmoil and paralysis in the Senate that Sidious and Doriana could have used to devastating effect. But all that had been lost, thanks to Skywalker and his dumb luck in taking out the Trade Federation's droid control ship. Darth Maul's death at the hands of Kenobi and Kagan Jin had been equally devastating, short-circuiting a quiet reign of terror that would have distracted the Jedi even as it pruned the edges of their close-knit group. And now here they were on Balak, threatening to interfere with Sidious's plan to eliminate Joris Bayath. He set his lips firmly together. No, not this time. Not if Kin and Doriana had anything to say about it. Inside his pocket, his special calm link beeped. Still watching Kenobi and his companions, he fished out the device and flicked it on. Yes? Defender? A hoarse brawl voice asked. Yes, it is I, Patriot, Doriana said. I have returned as I promised to help you in your time of need. You are late, the other growled. The negotiations have already begun. But nothing is yet decided, Doriana said. There's still time to send a message that the Brolf people will not be cheated. Has everything been prepared according to my instructions? Almost, Patriot said. The final components should be on the way. The question is whether you've brought the contribution you promised. I have it right here, Doriana assured him. Then bring it, Patriot said. Third north from Chessel and Scrive Streets. Two hours. I'll be there. There was a ping as the connection was broken. Putting away his calm link, Doriana glanced at his chrono. Excellent. The address wasn't more than half an hour's walk away, which would give him time for a leisurely stroll and a careful survey of the neighborhood before he arrived. But first, he would see what he could do to keep Kenobi on the sidelines where he belonged. Fortunately, that shouldn't be a problem. Whatever his purpose here, Chances were he wouldn't make any serious moves without first consulting the Jedi Council. A little tweaking of the city's Holonet computer access system, and there would be nothing coming into or going out of Barlock for the next day or two. Plenty of time for him and his Brolf allies to finish the job. Stepping over to the desk, he opened his computer and set to work. The cantina they found didn't have the most promising decor Obi-Wan had ever seen. But like Dex's diner on Coruscant, appearances could be deceiving, particularly where food was involved. The hearty aroma of roast tarsh was definitely in the air, Max's were the headliners on the menu, and Lorana's guide card gave the place a triple pork and rating. All in all, it looked like a pretty good bet. A WE-2 droid scuttled up as they chose a booth overlooking the street and sat down.
Welcome to Panky's, it said, its electronic voice somehow managing to convey both courtesy and the fact that it was being severely and unfairly overworked. What may I provide for you? I want a Tarsh Maxer and Brib Juice, Anakin said eagerly. Obi-Wan suppressed a smile. Anakin had discovered Brib Juice on his first trip as a Padawan, and ever since then he'd ordered it every chance he got, whether it really went with the rest of the meal or not. Same Maxa for me, but make my drink a Corellian Noali, he told the droid. I'll take the Brib Juice, but with a Prish fruit salad, Lorana said. She gave Obi-Wan a hesitant smile. After all, Balak does produce the best specimens. So I've heard, Obi-Wan said, studying her. She was about medium height, with dark hair and striking gray eyes. She had an intelligent face, a nice smile, and that sense of global awareness that came from knowledge of the Force. To all appearances, she seemed well on her way to becoming a typical Jedi. And yet there was something about her that felt odd to him, something that didn't quite ring true. Her air of dignity and confidence felt strained, like an accessory she put on every morning instead of something that was truly a part of her innermost being. Her smile had a similarly tentative edge to it, as if she was afraid it would get her into trouble. On the surface, she had everything down just right. Beneath it all, she was still a Padawan learner with a lot of work yet to do. I don't think I've ever met anyone before who was trained by Master Kbeath, he commented as the droid bustled away. What's he like to study with? The corners of Lorana's mouth compressed, just noticeably. It's been a valuable learning experience, she said diplomatically. Master Kbeoth has a depth and strength in the Force that I can only hope I'll someday be able to approach. Ah. Obi-Wan nodded, his mind flicking back to his last conversation with Master Windu. She might be right, or it might also be that Kbeoth wasn't nearly as deep into the Force as she thought. Possibly even not as deep as Kbeoth himself thought. But discussing a Jedi with his Padawan was considered poor form particularly in front of another, younger Padawan like Anakin. I'm sure you'll make it, he told her. In my experience, a Jedi can gain as much depth in the Force as he or she wants. Within his or her limitations, of course, Lorana said ruefully. I don't know yet where that line lies for me. No one does until the line is reached and tested, Obi-Wan pointed out. Personally, I don't believe there are any such limits. Another droid bustled up with the drinks balanced precariously on a tray. Obi-Wan leaned back, ready to reach out with the force to rescue the glasses if it became necessary, but the droid set them down without spilling a drop and bustled away. Picking up his drink, Obi-Wan sent a slow look around the room. Small, unassuming places like this, he knew were usually passed over by casual visitors looking for flash and sparkle. Sure enough, most of the patrons were locals, hornskin brawlfi in varying shades of yellow and green, plus a counterpoint sprinkling of the more delicate arboreal carfs from the vast Tisfolk forests that edged the city on two sides. But there were also a few other species represented, including three more humans. Perhaps the guide card recommendation was actually having some influence on the visitor trade. His leisurely gaze drifted to the genuine Duskwood bar at the far end, where a skinny, mostly yellow-skinned broth was serving drinks. He frowned. Lorana, that human over their black vest, gray shirt, talking to the bartender. Have you ever seen him before? She turned to look. Yes, he was in the group waiting outside the negotiating chamber when the talks ended yesterday. I don't know his name. You know him, Master? Anakin asked. Unless I'm mistaken, that's Jerry Risk, Obi-Wan said. Former bounty hunter, currently top enforcer for the Magistrate's Office of the Corporate Alliance. What does an enforcer do? Anakin asked. 
Pretty much anything Pastor Arjan tells him to, Obi-Wan said. Bodyguard, investigator, and probably extra muscle if there are bad debts to be collected. I wonder which of those roles he's performing here. Probably the bodyguard one, Lorana said. Magistrate Arjan's leading the Alliance's negotiating team. An unpleasant sensation crept up Obi-Wan's back. The head of a powerful, galaxy-spanning organization such as the Corporate Alliance hardly had the time to deal personally with a minor contract dispute like this. Unless the Barlock dispute wasn't as minor as everyone seemed to think. He looked back at risk. The man was still talking with the bartender, both of them leaning slightly over their respective sides of the bar, their heads close together. Anakin, you see that dish of quarter nuts on the bar near Enforcer Risk? He asked, setting down his drink. Go and grab a few of them. Sure, Anakin said. Sliding out of his seat, he started threading his way between the rows of tables. What are you doing? Lorana asked. Giving myself an excuse to go over there, Obi-Wan said, watching Anakin's progress across the room and judging his timing. One more table. Now. Wait here, he added, standing up and heading off after his Padawan. Focusing his attention on the conversation at the bar, he ran through his Jedi sensory enhancement techniques. He got within eavesdropping distance just as Anakin reached the bar, squeezed himself in between an Aqualish and a Radian, and started helping himself to the nuts. Centered in Padamini District, the bartender was saying in a low voice, But that's just a rumor, mind. Thanks, Risk said. His hand brushed over the bartender's, and Obi-Wan caught a glint of metal as the bartender straightened up, his closed fist dropping casually behind the bar. The brawl's eyes shifted to Obi-Wan, the hornskin puckering a little as he frowned. Risk caught the change in expression and turned, his right hand dropping casually to his belt, the fingertips dipping inside the edge of his vest. That's enough, Anakin. Obi-Wan said, keeping his voice light but firm as he came up behind Anakin and took casual hold of the boy's shoulder, carefully keeping his eyes away from Risk and the bartender. Just one more? Anakin asked, turning and holding up a large tasher. All right, but for after your lunch, Obi-Wan said firmly. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Risk's hand drop the rest of the way to his side and sensed both his and the bartender's suspicions fading. You don't want to spoil your appetite. The boy sighed theatrically. Okay, he said. Closing his fist around the nut, he started to turn around. And as he did so, his shoulder bumped the Aqualish's back just as the burly alien was lifting his drink to his mouth, sending a small wave of bright red liquid sloshing over the rim and down the alien's massive hand. Obi-Wan winced. It was a minor accident, as such things went, with equally minor damages. But such subtleties were lost on the typical Aqualish mind and temper. And this one was very definitely typical. You child human troublemaker dash! He grunted in his native tongue, spinning around fast enough to slosh a little more of his drink over the edge. What do you do to bother me? It was an accident. Obi-Wan said quickly, pulling Anakin back to just in front of him. I apologize for his carelessness. He is no babe in leaf wrap that you must clean up his messes, the Aqualish retorted, glaring at Obi-Wan with his huge eyes. He looked back at Anakin, his hand dropping to the blaster belted at his waist. He must learn manners and self-discipline. Obi-Wan tightened his grip on Anakin's shoulder as he sensed the boy's flash of anger. Self-discipline was one of Anakin's biggest problem areas, something Obi-Wan had to call him on probably twice a week. The last thing the boy wanted to hear was the same lecture coming from a grumpy alien. Easy, Anakin, Obi-Wan warned, aware that every eye in the cantina was on the confrontation. 
His little play acting had alleviated Rist's first suspicions about the would-be eavesdropper. But those suspicions would be back with a vengeance if Obi-Wan was forced to reveal himself as a Jedi. Come, friend, he said soothingly to the Aqualish. Surely you have more worthwhile ways to spend your energy. Let me get you another drink, and we'll be on our way. For a long moment the Aqualish glared at him, his hand now openly gripping the butt of his blaster. Obi-Wan stood motionless, his mind slipping into combat mode, his hand ready to dart beneath his tunic and snatch his lightsaber if and when it became necessary. And then something seemed to flicker in the Aqualish's anger. Elixtro, he said, lifting his hand off his blaster and pointing at his half-filled glass. A large one. Certainly, Obi-Wan said. The other's glass was nowhere near large size, but this wasn't the time or place to quibble over details. Senses still alert for a last-minute sneak attack, he turned and caught the bartender's eye. A large lickstro, he said, gesturing to the Aqualish. The bartender nodded and busied himself with his tap. A minute later the drink was in the alien's hand, the payment was in the bartender's, and Obi-Wan and Anakin were heading back toward their booth. That wasn't a large drink he had, Anakin muttered as they maneuvered between the tables. Obi-Wan nodded. I know. That means he stiffed you, Anakin said, an accusing edge creeping into his voice. Probably what he had in mind all along. Possibly, Obi-Wan acknowledged. What if he did? But we're Jedi, Anakin growled. We shouldn't have to put up with that kind of shakedown. You have to learn to see the bigger view, my young Padawan. Obi-Wan reminded him, glancing around. All we really wanted to accomplish here, Dash. He broke off. Risk was gone. So was Lorana. 6. It was apparently her lot in life, Lorana thought as she wove her way through the crowds on the walkway, to be forever trying to keep up with someone. Earlier it had been Kbeath. Now, she was struggling just as hard to keep Risk in sight. She had to admit, though, that it was an interesting study in contrasts. Kbeath's technique was the straightforward one of intimidating others out of his way. Risk gained the same result by taking advantage of every opening or opportunity for advancement, seldom disturbing any of the other pedestrians, slipping through the crowd like a night animal through the trees of a forest. Master Kenobi had said that the man used to be a bounty hunter. He'd probably been a very good one. Unfortunately, she hadn't thought to get Obi-Wan's calm link frequency before they split up. Kbeoth might have it, but she knew better than to interrupt him during the negotiations for anything short of an imminent catastrophe. But the Jedi Temple on Coruscant surely had the listing. Dodging around a strolling Ithorian, she pulled out her comm link and keyed for the city communications center and a holonet relay. Vast apologies, citizen a mechanical voice said from the comm link. All connections off-world are unavailable. Please try again at a future time. So much for that approach. Lorana shut off the comm link and returned it to her belt, sidestepping as a pair of large balfi suddenly loomed in her path. They passed her by and she started forward again, craning her neck to SEC over the crowd. To find that risk had vanished. She hurried forward, scanning the street and stretching out to the force. But there was no sign of him. Calm yourself, Padawan, Kbeoth's oft-repeated admonition whispered through her mind. Risk couldn't have gotten very far in the brief time he'd been out of her sight. He must have either gone into one of the dozens of little shops that lined the street or else ducked down one of the pair of narrow alleyways branching off to the left and right just ahead. Briefly, she weighed the options. The shops would be constricting, drastically limiting his freedom of movement. A man like Risk, she decided, would more likely go for one of the alleys. She reached them and looked both directions. No one was visible. 
When she'd last seen Risk, he'd been closer to the left alleyway, which made that one the more obvious choice. But he didn't strike her as an obvious sort of person. Weaving around another pair of pedestrians, she stepped into the alley to the right. The passageway was fairly narrow, about one and a half land speeders wide, with one side stacked with tall but neat piles of garbage containers awaiting pickup. Halfway along its length, another alley cut across it at right angles, dividing this particular block into quarters. If Risk had gone this way, he would have had two additional directions to choose from once he reached the center. Slipping her hand inside her tunic, she got a grip on her lightsaber and headed in. She reached the central intersection without incident and looked in all directions. Risk, unfortunately, wasn't visible in any of them. For a moment she stood there, looking back and forth down the cross alley, the sour taste of defeat in her mouth. Nothing to do now but retrace her steps and hope Kenobi wouldn't be angry enough at her failure to report her to Kbeath. A flicker from the Force was her only warning, but she reacted to it instantly. Taking a leaping step to the side, she spun around, drawing her lightsaber from her sash and igniting it. The spinning disc gliding in through the alleyway behind her caught the sunlight as it tilted slightly, altering its direction toward her new position. Getting a two-handed grip on her lightsaber, she watched it come, wondering why anyone would bother with such a relatively slow weapon. Half a second later she got her answer as the disc split into thirds, the top and bottom sections becoming duplicates of the original and swinging wide to approach her from different angles. So it had become three against one. Still not a problem. She took a step backward, mentally mapping out the sequence she would use against them. They hummed their way into range, and with a quick one-two-three she slashed the glowing blade outward, slicing all three discs in half. And as the sections of the last one clattered to the alley floor, an arm snaked around her shoulder from behind to wrap firmly around her neck. She inhaled sharply in chagrin. So that was the reason for the simplicity of the attack. It had been nothing but a diversion, driving her into the tunnel vision of combat while Risk slipped out of concealment from one of the garbage stacks and sneaked up behind her. She shifted her grip on her lightsaber, wondering if she would have time to stab backward with it before he got another weapon into position. Easy, girl a mild voice said as something hard pressed against her neck beneath her right ear. Close it down and put it away. I just want to talk. About what? She demanded. Put it away and I'll tell you, he said. Come on, girl this isn't worth getting your head blown off over. I'm a Jedi, she warned. We don't respond well to threats. Maybe Jedi don't, Risk agreed, an almost amused edge to his voice. But you're no Jedi you got suckered way too easily for that. The arm around her throat tightened slightly. Come on. Cool down and let's talk. Lorana glared at the alley wall. Still, derision aside, if he'd wanted to kill her he probably could have done so long before now. Fine. She said, closing down her lightsaber and sliding it back into her sash. There, now, that wasn't so hard, was it? He said soothingly as he let go of her neck. I'm glad you're happy, Lorana said, taking a step forward and turning around to face him. What do you want to talk about? Let's start with you, Risk suggested, tucking a small hold-up blaster back into concealment in his tunic. Why is Kbeoth having you follow me? Master Kbeoth has nothing to do with this, she told him, stretching out to the force and trying to get a feel for the man. He was cool and unemotional, with the alert detachment she'd often seen in professional bodyguards. But beneath the calm she could sense a certain honor, or at least a willingness to stand by his word and the fact that he put his blaster away implied he expected a certain degree of honor from her in return. That alone dictated that she at least hear him out. 
Was it the other Jedi then? Risk asked. The one with you in the cantina? There are times when you'll wish your identity to remain unknown, Kbeoth had reminded her back on Coruscant. Clearly, it hadn't worked with Risk. He was interested in you, yes, but following you was my idea, she told him. He was mostly surprised that a person of Magistrate Arjan's stature would be handling these negotiations personally. I could say the same about Jedi Master Kbeath, Risk said. Magistrate Arjan was rather surprised himself when he showed up. He gestured in the direction of the cantina. And now we have another Jedi in the game, this one trying to eavesdrop on private conversations. What exactly is the council playing at? As far as I know, the council isn't playing at anything, Lorana said. We're not supposed to take sides in these things. Risk snorted. Like you didn't take sides on Naboo? He said pointedly. I noticed your high-minded neutrality was surprisingly helpful to Queen Amidala and her government. I don't know anything about that, Lorana said. As you've already guessed, I'm only a Padawan. But I can tell you that the council didn't send us here. It was Master Kbeath's idea, and the council only reluctantly gave him permission. Risk frowned. So he came up with this all on his own? Well, actually, he was responding to something Supreme Chancellor Palpatine said, Lorana amended. But it still wasn't the council's idea. Palpatine, Risk muttered, rubbing his cheek thoughtfully. Interesting. My turn now. Lorana said. What are you doing wandering around the city? Trying to keep Magistrate Arjand alive, of course, Risk said, his tone suddenly dark. Nice talking with you, Padawan. Try and stay out of my way, all right? With that he turned and strode away down the alley. Lorana watched him until he disappeared out the other end into the city's pedestrian traffic. Then, with a sigh, she turned and headed back the way she'd come. Master Kenobi, she knew, was not going to be happy about this. With no easy way to locate Lorana, and with every reason to expect they would most likely chase each other in circles if he tried, Obi-Wan had opted to wait for her on a bench in a small park across the street from the cantina. Anakin was just finishing his Tarsh Maxer when she finally returned. Interesting. Obi-Wan said when she'd finished her story. So Magistrate Arjan's in danger, is he? Or at least Risk thinks he is, Lorana said, her eaves holding the wary look of someone bracing herself for a reprimand. In fact, as Obi-Wan gazed into those eyes, it occurred to him that they seemed to fall into that mode far too naturally. Apparently, Kbeath's teaching style was as domineering as the rest of the man's personality. But he didn't seem to think the danger was coming from you or Master Kbeath? No, though he did ask what the council was up to, Lorana said. But it seemed almost a perfunctory comment, as if it was just natural to assume that the council was playing politics. I don't think he would have been so open with me if he'd really thought we were plotting against Arjant. You call that being open? Anakin demanded scornfully. Hints and threats? Telling her to stay out of his way wasn't necessarily a threat, Obi-Wan told him. Professional bodyguards like Risk always worry about bystanders or well-meaning but amateurish helpers getting in the way. He thinks we're amateurs? In certain aspects of that job, we are, Obi-Wan told him bluntly, turning back to Lorana. So what do you think? Is our jaunt in danger? A flicker of surprise crossed her face. Kbeoth, he reflected, probably didn't ask her opinion very often. I don't know, she said. But feelings are running high about the corporate alliance's efforts to take full possession of the mines. I can imagine, Obi-Wan said. Do you know which hotel Arjand is staying at? The Starbright, Lorana said. It's about a kilometer east of the city center. 
which isn't the direction Risk was going, Obi-Wan pointed out. But it is the direction to Padamini District. Padamini District? Anakin asked. I heard the bartender mention it to him, Obi-Wan said. It's one of the city's biggest subdivisions, straddling both some very rich and very poor areas. If we're going to nose around, that would probably be a good place to start. We're going to help him? Anakin objected. I thought the corporate alliance was trying to steal the mineral rights from the Bralfi. That's what the negotiations are supposed to determine, Obi-Wan reminded him. At any rate, that's not our concern. Our job as Jedi is to protect and preserve life across the Republic. I don't know, Lorana said hesitantly. Master Kbayoth wasn't very happy to find you two here. He might not like us interfering in matters this way. Risk and his people seem to be on top of things shouldn't we let them handle it? Who's interfering with anything? Obi-Wan asked blandly as he stood up. We're going on a tour of the city, just as Master Kbayoth suggested. If we happen to run into some trouble, that's hardly our fault. It was a ten-minute walk to the nearest edge of Padamini District. Obi-Wan kept his eyes moving as they walked, hoping to spot risk in the crowd. But having been caught once, the bodyguard was apparently too cagey to let it happen again. This should be the edge of the district, he said as they reached a low decorative stone wall and passed through a pedestrian archway. Anakin, remember that we're just here to look around. Sure. Anakin said, his eyes already sweeping the area, his sense that of a hunting Derekil straining at its leash. Okay if I go ahead a little? All right, but not too far, Obi-Wan said. I don't want you getting lost. I won't. Slipping between a pair of carfs, the boy ducked into the crowd. You sure he'll be all right? Lorana asked. He'll be fine. Obi-Wan assured her. He's a little reckless, but he's strong in the force and generally behaves himself. You must have great confidence in him, Lorana murmured. Obi-Wan gave her a sideways look. There'd been an odd wistfulness in her tone just then. Kbeath doesn't have as much confidence in you, I take it? Master Kbeath has had several Padawans in his lifetime of service to the Jedi Order she said, her voice going carefully neutral. He knows what he's doing. Yes, of course, Obi-Wan said. He does have a rather overpowering personality, though, doesn't he? His reputation is well earned, she said, again clearly picking her words carefully. He's skilled and knowledgeable and intelligent. I've learned a great deal from him. Though he's also perhaps a little too demanding, I wouldn't characterize him that way, she said, her voice going a little cooler. Of course you would, Obi-Wan said, giving her a reassuring smile. I thought that about my master at times. And I know Anakin thinks that about me. For a moment she hesitated. Then, almost reluctantly, she smiled back. Sometimes I wonder if I'll ever be able to please him, she admitted. I know the feeling, Obi-Wan said. Just remember that this, too, will pass. And once you're a Jedi Knight, your job will no longer be a matter of pleasing a single master or even a group of them. Your job will be to do what is right. That's the part that seems so hard, she confessed. How do you ever know what is truly right? Obi-Wan shrugged. When you're at peace, he said. When you're truly attuned to the Force. If I ever am. Obi-Wan grimaced. On one hand was Anakin, pushing ahead so eagerly that he was forever overstepping his limits, though he had to admit the boy succeeded more often than he failed. On the other hand was Lorana, so awed by Kbeath's presence and reputation that she was afraid to even stretch herself beyond anything she already knew. Somewhere, there had to be a middle ground. 
For another few minutes they walked together in silence, weaving their way through the other pedestrians and shoppers. Obi-Wan kept his eyes moving, watching for signs of risk or of the trouble he apparently expected to find here and making sure to keep Anakin's bobbing head within sight. Ahead, off to the left, was a land speeder repair shop, with a display of shiny parts in the open-air front room and half-seen figures working in the darker repair area in back. Several Brawlfi were browsing around the front room displays, most of them adults, but one a teenager about Anakin's age. Obi-Wan eyed him, noting his reddish-brown craftsman's vest with its multiple pockets. Most Brawlfi seemed to make do without nearly that much carrying capacity. Apparently, this boy was the sort who liked carrying all his little treasures with him. He smiled to himself. Jedi, forever wandering the galaxy with most of their possessions on their backs or belts, were hardly in a position to point fingers on that one. Throwing one final look at the boy, he started to turn away. But to his surprise, something drew his ease back again. Something about the youngster's posture, perhaps, or the way he was looking around him. Or perhaps it was the subtle prompting of the Force. Frowning, he kept his attention on the boy as he and Lorana continued to weave their way through the milling crowds. And as he watched, the young Brawl stepped close to a rack of burst thrusters, a set of cutters appearing magically in his hand. With a glance at the workers in the back room, he deftly snipped the anchor lines of two of the thrusters, catching each in turn and slipping them out of sight inside his vest. The cutters followed the thrusters, and a second later the boy wandered casually out of the shop. Turning his back to the approaching Jedi, he melted into the crowd. Obi-Wan grabbed Lorena's upper arm. Brawl teenager in a red-brown vest. He said in a low voice, pointing at the spot where the youth had disappeared. Get Anakin, find him, and follow him. What? Lorana asked, staring at him in bewilderment. Find him and follow him. Obi-Wan repeated, glancing around. To their right was a narrow alleyway cutting a path between a pair of ten-story buildings. Go. Still clearly puzzled, Lorana nevertheless nodded and hurried ahead. Obi-Wan caught a glimpse of her grabbing Anakin's arm, and then he was in the alley, dodging the garbage containers as he headed to the center. It was probably thirty meters to the tops of the buildings flanking him, and even with Jedi strength enhancement a leap like that was well beyond his capabilities. But there were other ways. Glancing both directions down the alley to make sure no one was watching, he stretched out to the force and leapt. His boots hit the right-hand wall about four meters above the ground. Bending his knees to absorb the impact, he shoved off again before he could start falling back down, pushing himself upward and toward the wall on the left-hand side. That jump gained him another two meters, and he pushed off again toward the right, frog-hopping his way upward. He reached the top with only minor twinges in his knees and leg muscles to mark the strain. Running to the edge of the roof, he dropped flat onto his stomach and looked down. The streets looked just as crowded from up here as they did from down below. Pulling out his calm link, he keyed for Anakin. Skywalker! Anakin's voice came promptly. What's this about a kid in a brown vest? He stole a pair of burst thrusters from that shop back there. Obi-Wan explained, shading his eyes from the sun with one hand as he searched the crowd below for the young thief. You mean like you use in pod racers and swoops? Right, Obi-Wan said. They're also the drive system of choice for homemade missiles. There was a gentle hiss from the comm link. Got it, Anakin said, his voice suddenly grim. Did you see which way he went? He left the shop going west, Obi-Wan said. But he could easily have changed weight a minute. He leaned a little farther over the edge of the roof as a flicker of red-brown caught his eye before it passed out of sight beneath an awning. He watched the other side, and moment later it emerged. There he is, he told Anakin. 
He's headed north now. What street? Not a clue, Obi-Wan admitted. Where are you two? Just passing a building with a big blue and gold sign talking about medicines, Anakin said. Across the street is a green hanging banner dash. Right Ivy got you. Obi-Wan cut in as he spotted them. Take the next street to your right, and you'll see him about a block ahead. He watched Anakin and Loran long enough to see them pick up their pace, then shifted his attention back to the thief, wishing he thought to bring along some macro binoculars. Anakin had a set, but that wasn't going to do Obi-Wan any good. Obi-Wan? Obi-Wan lifted his calm link again. Go. We've turned north, Anakin reported. I think I see him ahead. Stay where you are, Obi-Wan ordered. A somewhat chunky Brav had stepped from one of the storefronts and was moving to intercept the thief. I think he's about to pass off his ill-gotten gain. Put Lorana on. There was a moment of silence. Yes? Lorana's clear voice came. Move forward a little from where you are, Obi-Wan told her. The thief's rendezvousing was someone slightly overweight Ralph with a dark blue sash over a lighter blue tunic. I see him, Lorana confirmed. He's moving in close. Looks like they're talking. Is the boy giving him the thrusters? Obi-Wan asked. The adult's blocking my line of sight. He's in mine, too, Lorana said tightly. I can't there they go. Blast, Obi-Wan muttered under his breath as the two Bralfi separated, the teen continuing north while the adult turned west. Did he give him the thrusters? I couldn't tell, Lorana said. I'm sorry. Obi-Wan scowled as he watched the two Bralfi heading their separate ways. The adult had certainly had the time and the opportunity to take the thrusters. Problem was, he'd also had the time to merely confirm that the grab had been made, to check for followers, or to give the boy new instructions. And no matter which way the rendezvous had gone, the whole thing might simply be a bit of Barlock's normal criminal activity. It might have nothing to do with Pascal Argent and Risk's paranoia. But Risk had been looking for trouble out this way. Obi-Wan had found some. It was definitely worth checking out. And here he was, stuck on a rooftop a block away. Then I guess we'll have to follow both of them, he decided, looking around the nearby rooftops. If he could leap to the next one over, then the one next to that, then find a stairway or turbo lift to get back to street level. But no. In broad daylight, in the middle of a crowded city, there was an even chance someone would spot his acrobatics and recognize him for what he was. The minute any potential attackers realized there was a Jedi on their trail, they would go to ground so fast and so deep that even a professional like Risk would have trouble rooting them out. I agree, Lorana said. I'll take the adult. Obi-Wan hesitated. Lorana was the older of the two Padawans, and thus theoretically the more capable. But he knew Anakin's capabilities and experience, and knew the boy could deal with any trouble he might run into. Still, if there was one thing Lorana lacked in abundance, it was confidence. It wouldn't help to send her after a teenager, especially not with Anakin listening. And after all, she would only be following the Brolf, not confronting or fighting him. That should be safe enough. Fine, he told her. Take Anakin's common kit's link directly to mine and give him yours. What's your frequency? She gave him the number. We're splitting up, she added. I'll contact you when the adult comes to roost. Right, Obi-Wan said. Tell Anakin I'll catch up with him as soon as I can. Switching off the comm link, Obi-Wan pushed himself back to his feet. He took one final look over the edge of the roof, then turned and hurried toward the stairs. 
Yes, his Padawan could deal with any trouble he might run into. Probably. 7. For a wonder, Anakin didn't get himself into any mischief in the time it took Obi-Wan to reach the street and catch up with him. The young Brolf, for his part, continued on his way, apparently oblivious to the fact he was being followed. Obi-Wan had noted earlier that Padamini district included rich neighborhoods as well as poorer, working-class ones. The teen led them into one of the latter, finally entering one of the units in a slightly dilapidated house ring. The house ring was a standard Bralfi urban structure, consisting of a circle of houses or apartment buildings built around a central courtyard. The courtyard was designed to be a common recreation area for the ring, but through a gap where one of the houses had collapsed Obi-Wan saw that this particular courtyard had been turned into something that more closely resembled a junkyard. Looks like Watto's back area, Anakin murmured, ducking his head to peer inside. They've got at least three projects going on in there. Any of them look like something that would use burn thrusters? Obi-Wan asked. Hard to tell, Anakin said. The one on the left dash. Hold that thought, Obi-Wan cut him off quietly. There had been a flicker in the force. Can we help you? A suspicious voice asked from behind them. Keeping his hands visible, Obi-Wan turned around. There were three adult Bralfi coming toward them, their simple tunics worn but neat and clean. No thank you, he said politely. We were just noticing all the construction work in there and wondering what they were building. Why would you care? The spokesman asked. My young friend here used to build pod racers, Obi-Wan explained. He's always been fascinated with that sort of thing. Really, one of the other Bralfi said, looking Anakin up and down. You know anything about split X air intakes? Never used them myself, Anakin said. But I can install them or fix them if there's a problem. Really, the Bralf filled his lungs. Death grin. There was a slight pause. Then the team they'd been following appeared at the gap in the ring. Yes, uncle? He called. Couple of humans here who say they know split X systems, the Brolf said. You still having trouble with yours? I don't know, the teen said, eyeing Obi-Wan and Anakin doubtfully. I just picked up a new compression controller. Maybe that'll help. Obi-Wan suppressed a grimace. So that was what he and the adult had been doing back in the marketplace. The boy had handed over the stolen burst thrusters and gotten the controller in exchange. Either that, or he'd stolen the controller earlier in the day. In that case, he might still have the thrusters. Only if the split X doesn't have a back stability problem, Anakin said. What kind of coupling you have on it? Binary or tertiary? Binary, Defgren said. I couldn't afford a tertiary. Let me take a look, Anakin offered, starting toward him. If that's okay? He added, looking at Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan looked questioningly at the three Brolf adults. Sure, go ahead. Defgren's uncle said waving a hand. The sooner he gets that junk heap working and out of the yard, the sooner the neighbors will quit complaining about it. Thanks, Obi-Wan said, mentally crossing the three adults off his suspects list. If they were willing to let strangers wander freely through the area, they probably weren't hiding any plots. Okay, Anakin, but make it quick. Sure, Anakin called back over his shoulder. Already, Obi-Wan noted, he and Duefgren were deep into technical talk. I'll be ready to leave when you are. I've heard that before, Obi-Wan said under his breath as he followed them into the courtyard. Still, Duefgren himself could be involved with a group of plotters without his uncle's knowledge. It wouldn't hurt for Obi-Wan to take a leisurely turn or two around the house ring while the teenagers worked, 
stretching out with the force for any signs of violent intent. And after that, he would pry Anakin away from whatever it was Defgren was building and they would see what kind of luck Lorana was having. The young brawl thief, Lorana had noticed, had left the rendezvous at a casual walk, without any indication that he suspected he might be followed or, indeed, any indication that he even cared whether he was or not. The adult Brolf was another kettle of Giju entirely. He was about as blatantly nervous and suspicious as it was possible to be without actually carrying a sign to that effect. Every dozen steps he threw a quick look over his shoulder, and he crossed and recrossed the street at least once a block. Every block or two he changed directions, sometimes pausing at one of the open-air shops lining the street and pretending to examine the merchandise while actually studying the pedestrians behind him. It was so ludicrous that it was almost funny. But Lorana felt no urge to laugh. Risk was a professional, with a professional's bearing and subtlety. This Brolf was just the opposite, an amateur conspirator, with an amateur's lack of finesse or ability. And it was the amateur uncalculating, unthinking, unpredictable who was often the more dangerous opponent. Fortunately, it was also the amateur who was the easier to deceive. Lorana had picked up a few tricks about tailing people during her years of Jedi training, and over the next hour she ended up using every one of them. She varied her distance from the brawl, ducked through alleys and side streets to get ahead of him, and periodically altered her appearance by putting her robes hood up or down, or using a cord to tie her hair back instead of letting it hang free. Eventually, the Brolf's paranoia seemed to ease, and his convoluted path straightened out as he turned northwest. Lorana stayed as far back as she could, watching the ornamentation and value of the homes and shops around her steadily diminishing as they moved farther and farther into one of the poorer areas of the district. Whereas the richer neighborhoods had waist-high walls or fences to delineate the property lines, here the boundaries were marked off by low tightly woven hedges or simple rows of distinctive flowering plants. A fair sprinkling of the pedestrians she passed wore tunics with mining guild markings, she noted, and many of them paused in their activities to scrutinize her as she passed through their midst. More than once she thought about calling Obi-Wan and asking for advice or assistance. More often than that she considered simply turning around and heading back to the safe familiarity of the city center, leaving whatever plots and counterplots to be dealt with by those with more wisdom and experience in such matters. But each time she took a calming breath, stretched out to the force, and continued on. A Jedi should never turn away from a path merely because it seems hard or dangerous. She was just passing one of the low hedges when she felt a warning flicker from the force. She kept walking, resisting the impulse to break step. The vague sense of threat was still too diffuse, and coming to a sudden halt would only tip off her unknown foes that she was aware of them. A few more steps, a little carelessness on their part, and she should be able to switch the tables when they made their move. Her patience was rewarded. A few meters along the sense came into sudden focus, two Brawlfi, coming up quickly but silently behind her, both of them simmering with suspicion. She caught the whisper of metal rubbing against cloth. She stopped abruptly, the sleeve of her robe catching briefly on the hedge beside her as she spun around to face them. Yes? She asked mildly. The Brawlfi twitched with surprise coming to a slightly shambling halt a couple of meters away from her. The shorter of the two, Lorana saw, had an antique blaster tucked tightly against his side, as if pressing it against his leg would actually hide it from her. The larger had a less sophisticated but equally nasty weapon, a miner's quarter pickaxe. What are you doing here? The shorter demanded. Is this not a public street? Lorana asked. You don't belong here, the larger growled, taking a step toward her and fingering his axe restlessly. What are you looking for? What could be here that anyone would look for? 
she countered, feeling her heartbeat starting to pick up. This was it. Somehow, though she wasn't sure exactly how, she knew beyond a doubt that she'd found the threat that Risk had been trying to locate. The question now was what she should do about it. Because these two Braufi or even these two plus the one she'd been following were merely the edge of the grove. Whipping out her lightsaber would put her no closer to learning the details of the plot, or who ultimately was behind it. What she really needed was for them to take her to the actual leaders. And for them to do that, they would have to think she was harmless. Never mind, she said taking as a step backward, staying close to the hedge beside her. If you want me to go, I'll go. Not so fast, the smaller Brawl said, apparently emboldened by her sudden apparent nervousness. What's your hurry? No hurry, Lorana said. She took another step backward, hoping she wasn't getting too close to the end of this particular section of hedge. I'm just ready to leave, that's all. She threw a glance to the side wishing she knew which of the dilapidated house rings around them the two Braulfi had come out of. Apparently, her glance was close enough. Get her, Visfil, the shorter Braulf snapped, swinging up his blaster and pointing it nervously. She knows. I don't know anything, Lorana protested, taking a final step back as Visfil strode toward her, his axe held high. Please don't hurt me. She lifted her hands toward the axe as if to ward off an expected blow. And with Visfil's full attention on her uplifted hands, and his body blocking his companion's view, she stretched out with the force, sliding her lightsaber from inside her tunic and shoving it into concealment inside the hedge beside her. Get her calm link. The smaller Brauf ordered as Visfil shifted his axe to one hand and pulled her robe partially open with the other. Yeah, yeah, I know, Visfil growled. For all his size and gruffness, he was clearly uncomfortable as he ran his hand gingerly over her body. He found her calm link and stuffed it inside his own tunic. Then, almost as an afterthought, he relieved her of her belt with its attached food and equipment pouches. No weapons, he announced, taking a step back from her. What do we do with her? Take her to Defender, I guess, the other said. He gestured her toward the ring house she'd glanced toward earlier. He'll know what to do. This way, human. They were crossing the street when Lorana heard a soft tone from behind her and glanced back to see the smaller Brolf draw a calm link from his tunic. What? He muttered. She couldn't hear the voice coming from the calm link but it was impossible to miss the sudden spike in the Brolf's tension level. Right, he muttered, then put the instrument away. Change of plans, he announced, stepping close to Lorana and pressing the muzzle of his blaster against her back. We're going to that house over there. He pointed to a blue house to their left. Lorana felt her throat tighten. The indicated house had the look of a place that had been abandoned for years. The only reason to take her there would be for a serious interrogation, or to shut her up permanently. On the other hand, they didn't know who they had here. She could play along and wait for her opportunity, watching for the warning signs that the game was nearly over. With the Brolf's intent masked by his overall anxiety, the stun blast that rippled across her back came as a complete surprise. Before she could even begin to run through the countermeasures she'd been trained in, the nerve-deadening wave swept over her, plunging her into darkness. Well? The Brolf who called himself Patriot growled. Doriana didn't bother to answer. Standing at the window, he watched as Visfil and his brother worked their way up the uneven walkway toward the dilapidated blue house carrying the unconscious form of Padawan Lorana Ginsler between them. And the two idiots had nearly brought her here. If Doriana hadn't been watching out the window and seen them coming. He waited until the group had disappeared inside. 
Then, slowly and deliberately, he turned to face Patriot. If this is an example of your security, he said, measuring out each word, it's a wonder you're not all pinioned to shame posts by now. There is no problem, Patriot insisted. It's only a single human who had no time to alert any friends she might have. Any weapons? None, Patriot said. Doriana frowned. None? We are not children, Defender, Patriot growled. We know how to search someone for weapons. Of course you do, Doriana said, feeling his skin prickling. Jinsler must have left her lightsaber with Kenobi and Skywalker, knowing it would be a dead giveaway as to who she really was. Did that mean the other two were already nearby, waiting an opportune moment to move in? Regardless, it was well past time to wrap this up. Do you have the final two burst thrusters? He asked. Jomfai just arrived with them, Patriot said. He's passed them to Migris, who's already on his way to where the missile is being prepared. They'll be installed within the hour. Jomfai being the one the human female was following, I presume? Patriot's eyes narrowed. I've already said she can do us no damage. We'll be leaving this house ring as soon as you fulfill your part of the bargain. All is well. Of course, Doriana said. All was well, except that Jinsler could identify Jomfai by face and had obviously seen him with the thrusters. He took another calming breath, keeping his tirade to himself. Yes, Patriot and his fellow conspirators were idiots. But then, he'd known that going in. I still don't understand why so many thrusters are needed, Patriot said, a hint of suspicion creeping into his voice. A normal missile would require only two. A normal missile would arc high over the marketplace, where Arjant's security forces could destroy it at their leisure. Doriana pointed out, the weapon I've designed for you is known as a slinker, a projectile that will fly at waist height directly through the archway of the administration building, find its way along the corridors to the conference room, and there explode, destroying the traitors and would-be traitors alike. So you claim, Patriot said, his tone still suspicious. I've never heard of a weapon that was able to find its way through a building without a full droid control system. That's because no weapon you've heard of has had my special guidance system, Doriana said, pulling a data card from his pocket. It will locate the outer archway and seek out its targets, wherever they hide. Without its sensory missions being detected? Patriot asked, taking the card carefully. Neither detected nor jammed, Doriana assured him. It doesn't rely on sensor frequencies the security forces will be monitoring. In actual fact, of course, the card didn't rely on sensors at all. It was nothing more than a geographically programmed course director that would take the missile on the precise path Doriana himself had systematically paced out on his last trip to Barlock. And far from seeking out the negotiators, if Kbeath suddenly decided to hold the meeting in a different room tomorrow morning, the missile would find itself going to the wrong place entirely. That would be embarrassing, not to mention disastrous. But that was as unlikely as Patriot and his simple-minded conspirators realizing how thoroughly the flop brim was being pulled over their eyes. Nothing impressed people more than the perception that they were being entrusted with exotic technology. Then our victory is assured, Patriot said, fingering the data card almost reverently. It is indeed, Doriana said. One final matter, then. Were you planning to return to your homes when you leave here this evening? Of course, Patriot said, frowning. We'll need a good meal and sleep dash. And you'll get them as far from your homes as you can travel, Doriana interrupted. From this time onward, you must stay strictly away from your families and your other friends. Patriot's whole body jerked in stages 
from his feet up to a little whiplash jerk of his head. What are you saying? I'm saying that by noon tomorrow, with Magistrate Arjant and Guildmaster Gilfram lying dead, the authorities will descend upon the homes of every member of your guild, Doriana said coldly. You and your friends must not be there, nor can anyone know where you've gone. But for how long? As long as necessary, Doriana said. Make no mistake, patriot. From now on you and the others will be fugitives, running and hiding from the very people whose lives and prosperity you will have risked your lives to protect. He lifted his eyebrows. If you aren't strong enough to pay that price, now is the time to renounce your oath. Patriot straightened up, the resolve in his face visibly hardening. We do what is necessary for our guild and our people, he said firmly. We will pay the price for all. Then you are a brolf of high honor indeed, Doriana said gravely. For some people the prospect of life on the run would be grounds to take a second, harder look at what they were doing. But for Patriot and his friends, such a potentially bleak future merely added to the perceived nobility and glamour of their insane plot. Which was why Doriana had recruited them for this mission in the first place. Stupid, angry, and malleable, they'd been the perfect pawns for his plan. The deed would be done, and Doriana himself long gone, before any of them realized what had actually happened. If indeed they ever did. Then here and now we stand together on the path to glory and destiny. He continued. By tomorrow noon these traitorous negotiations will lie crumbled in the dust of history and the precious minerals of Barlock will be forever held in Brolf hands. And those who would betray us will know the cost of such betrayal. Patriot intoned solemnly. The Brolf people are deeply in your debt, Defender. Someday, I swear, this debt will be repaid. And I swear in turn that I will return to collect that payment, Doriana said, though offhand he couldn't imagine anything he was less likely to do. I have one more small adjustment to make to the missile after the burst thrusters are in place, and then will leave to prepare my own part in this redemption of the Balf people. Be certain you place the missile at precisely the spot we agreed on. Only there will it be inside the sensor shadow that guarantees it will not be spotted. And only from there, he added to himself, would the pre-programmed path take it where it had to go. I will, Patriot promised. Then to our victory, Defender. Doriana smiled. Yes, he said softly. To our victory. Cardos had noted on their first approach to Thrawn's asteroid that the base itself seemed remarkably well hidden. It was only as they approached now for the second time that he found out how the commander had pulled off that particular trick. Instead of being built on the surface, the base was inside. Inside, in fact, down a long, twisting tunnel, a path the Springhawk's helmsman took at a far better clip than was actually necessary. Impressive place, Cardas said aloud, trying to cover his nervousness as he watched the rocky walls shooting past. Is this typical Chiss construction? Not at all, Thrawn said, his voice sounding odd as he gazed out the bridge viewport. Most bases are on the surface. I wanted this one to be more difficult for potential enemies to penetrate. Hardly an original idea, Kento put in. His voice was casual, but Cardos could see a little tightness around his eyes as he paid close attention to the helmsman's maneuvering. You make the approach tricky so an attacker has to come at you slowly. Of course, that makes it just as hard to get your own ships out, but that's the price you pay. There are ways of minimizing that particular problem, Thrawn told him. At the moment, the Chiss defense fleet is working with this same concept with another base, on a much larger and more sophisticated scale than this. Interesting. What? Cardas asked. That pattern of colored lights woven between the approach markers, Thrawn said, pointing to the wall just ahead. 
It indicates the presence of visitors. Is that good or bad? Maris asked. Thrawn shrugged. That depends on who the visitors are. Three minutes later they came around a final curve and the tunnel opened up into a large cavern. At the far side, the rock face was alive with the glinting lights of ranging markers and viewports, with eight ships nestled up against various docking stations. Five were the Chiss fighters Cardas had already seen in action, two were small transport-style shuttles, and the eighth was a cruiser about the size of the Springhawk. Unlike the smoothly contoured military ships, though, this one was all planes and corners and sharply defined angles. Ah, Thrawn said. Our guests are from the fifth ruling family. How can you tell? Maris asked. By the design and markings of the spacecraft, Thrawn said. I can also tell that the visitor is of direct but peripheral family lineage. So is that good or bad? Cardas asked. Mostly neutral, Thrawn said. The fifth family has interest in this region, so this is most likely a routine survey. Certainly someone of higher rank, and from the first or eighth families, would have come to deliver a reprimand. Cardas frowned sideways at Maris. A reprimand? You'll all be my guests at the welcoming ceremony, of course. Thrawn continued as the Springhawk made its way toward an empty docking station. You may find it interesting. Interesting, in Cardassa's opinion, was far too mild a word. To begin with, there was the welcoming chamber itself. At first it appeared to be nothing more than an empty, unadorned gray room just off the docking station. But at a touch of a hidden button all that changed. Colorful panels folded out from the walls, reversing and settling themselves flat again. A handful of draperies descended from hidden panels in the ceiling, along with wavy stalactite-like formations that reminded Cardas of frozen pieces of Aurora Borealis skyfire. The floor tiles didn't flip or reconfigure, but intricate patterns of colored lights appeared through a transparent outer surface some of them remaining stationary or slowly pulsing while others ran sequences that gave the illusion of flowing rivers. Every color of the spectrum was represented, but yellow was definitely favored. It was an impressive display, and the Chiss who stepped through the portal a minute later was no less impressive. He strode and flanked by a pair of young Chiss wearing dark yellow uniforms and belted handguns, his own outfit consisting of an elaborately layered gray robe with a yellow collar and generous yellow highlights. Though not much older than Thrawn, there was an air about him of nobility and pride, the bearing of someone born to rule. The movements of his escort were crisp and polished, and Cardas had the impression that they and the four black-clad warriors Thrawn had brought along were having a subtle contest as to which group could look the most professional. Thrawn's greeting and the visitor's response were in tune, of course, and once again Cardas was only able to catch occasional words. But the tone and flow of the speeches, along with the equally formalized gestures and movements, had a sense of ancient ritual that he found fascinating. It was an attitude, unfortunately, that his fellow travelers didn't seem to share. Maris with her philosophical disdain for the Republic's structured corruption, clearly had little patience with official ritual of any sort, and watched the proceedings with a sort of polite detachment. Kento, for his part, merely looked bored. The ceremony ended, the two yellow-clad chis moved back to flank the doorway to the ship, and with a gesture Thrawn led his visitor to where the three humans waited. May I present Aristocra Chafor Rembentrano of the fifth ruling family? He said, switching from Chun to Sibisti. These are Krellen traders, visitors from a far world. Chafor Rembentrano said something, his tone rather sharp. In Sibisti, Aristocra, if you please, Thrawn said. They do not understand Chun. Chafor Rembentrano snorted, again in Chun and the corners of Thrawn's mouth tightened briefly. 
Aristaka Chafora Mintrano is not interested in communicating with you at present. He translated. One of my warriors will show you to your quarters. His eyes flicked to Kardas. My apologies. No apologies needed, Commander. Kardas assured him, feeling a tightness in his throat as he gave Chafor M. Bintrano an abbreviated bow. None at all. The rooms Thrawn had ordered for them were built along the same lines as their quarters aboard the Springhawk, though somewhat larger. There were also two sleeping rooms this time instead of one, with a common refresher station set between them. Kento and Maris were shown to one of the rooms, while Cardas was taken to the other. Exploring his new quarters, Cardas discovered to his mild surprise that his clothing and personal effects had already been brought from his cabin on the Bargain Hunter and arranged neatly in the various storage drawers. Apparently, Thrawn was planning an extended stay for them. He paced the floor for a while, trying not to think about Chafor and Bintrano and his unconcealed disapproval of their presence in Chis territory. An hour later a silent warrior arrived at his door with a meal on a tray. Cardas briefly considered checking on Kento and Maris, decided they could come find him if they wanted his company, and ate his meal alone. Afterward, he sat down at the computer station and tried the procedure Thrawn had taught them aboard the Springhawk for accessing the Chun vocabulary lists. The procedure worked on this computer, too, and he settled down to study. It was five hours later, and he was dozing at the computer station, when another Chiss finally came to fetch him. He was taken to a darkened room that was a close double of the Springhawk's forward visual triangulation site. In this case the wide viewport looked out into the docking cavern outside, and Cardas could see the distant glow of drive engines as a vessel made its way toward the exit tunnel. Good evening, Cardas, Thrawn said from one of the seats to the side of the room. I trust you had a productive day. Reasonably productive, yes, Cardas said, going over and sitting down beside him. I worked ahead a little on my language lessons. Yes, I know, Thrawn said. I wanted to apologize to you for Aristocra Chafor and Bintrano's lack of courtesy. I'm sorry he took a dislike to us, Cardas said, trying to be diplomatic. I enjoyed the welcoming ceremony, and was looking forward to seeing more of how the Chis do things. It was nothing personal, Thrawn assured him. Aristocra Chafor Mbintrano considers your presence here a threat to the Ascendancy. May I ask why? Thrawn shrugged fractionally. To some people, the unknown always represents a threat. Sometimes they're right, Cardas conceded. On the other hand, you just seem quite capable of taking care of yourselves in a fight. Perhaps, Thrawn said. There are times when I wonder. Tell me, do you understand the concept of neutralizing a potential enemy before that enemy can launch an attack against you? You mean like a preemptive strike? Cardas asked. Certainly. It's widespread among your people, then. I'm not sure widespread is the right word, Cardas hedged. I know there are people who consider it immoral. Do you? Cardas grimaced. He was twenty-three years old, and he worked for a smuggler who liked to tweak huts. What did he know about the universe? I think that if you're going to do something like that, you need to make very sure they're a genuine threat, he said slowly. I mean, you need to have evidence that they were actually planning to attack you. What about someone who may not plan to attack you personally, but is constantly attacking others? It was pretty obvious where this was going. You mean like the Vigari? Cardas asked. Exactly, Thrawn confirmed. As I told you, they have not yet attacked Chis territory, and military doctrine dictates they must therefore be ignored. Do the beings they prey on have any claim on our military strength, or must we simply stand aside and watch as they are slaughtered or enslaved? Cardas shook his head. 
You're asking questions that have been argued since civilization began. He stole a look at the commander's profile. I take it you and Aristocra Chaffo Arambentrano disagree on this point. I and the entire Chis species disagree on this point, Thrawn said, a note of sadness in his voice. Or so it often seems. I'm relieved to hear that the question isn't as clear-cut for others as it is for our ruling families. Did you tell the Aristocra about the Vigari ship? Cardas asked. There seemed to be plunder in there from a lot of different species. I did, and he wasn't particularly impressed, Thrawn said. For him, the defensive only doctrine admits to no exceptions. What if some of those victims were species you know? Cardas suggested. Friends, or even just trading partners. Would that make a difference? I doubt it, Thrawn said thoughtfully. We do little trading outside our borders. Still, it might be useful to examine the treasure in detail. He cocked his head. Would you be interested in assisting? Of course, Cardas said. Though I don't know what help I would be. You might recognize some of the artifacts, Thrawn said, standing up. If they also prey on worlds of your republic, you may have additional data that would be useful. In that case, you should also invite Maris and Kento along, Cardas said, standing up as well. They've traveled a lot more than I have. A good suggestion, Thrawn said as he led the way toward the exit. That will also give Captain Kento a chance to choose which of the items he'll wish to keep for himself. He smiled slightly. Which will in turn help establish the relative values of the items. You're not cynical at all, are you, Commander? Cardas said. I merely understand how others think and react, Thrawn said, his smile fading. Perhaps that's why I have so much difficulty with a philosophy of waiting instead of acting. Perhaps, Cardas said. For whatever it's worth, I doubt the people you'd be taking action to help would see any moral problems with it. True, Thrawn agreed though their gratitude might be short-lived. Sometimes, Cardas conceded. Not always. 8. With a sigh, Obi-Wan shut off his comm link and slipped it back into his belt. Still nothing? Anakin asked. No, Obi-Wan said, throwing a look at the darkening sky. The stars were starting to appear and all around them house lights were coming on as families settled in for the evening. Anakin muttered something under his breath. We should have tried calling her earlier. We did try calling her earlier, Obi-Wan told him. You were just too busy playing with Defgren's swoop to notice. Excuse me, master, but I was working, not playing, Anakin said stiffly. The Brolf we're looking for is named Jomphi. He lives in the covered brush house ring, and he's supposedly using the burst thrusters on a speeder bike he uses to smuggle wristle sticks out to the carts. Obi-Wan stared at his Padawan. When did you get all that? When you were wandering around the neighborhood looking for clues, Anakin said. It was hard to sound hurt and smug at the same time, but the boy managed to pull it off. Those were the only times he talked to me. He wrinkled his rose. I don't think he trusts grown-ups very much. You should have said something the minute you had that information. Obi-Wan said tartly, slipping the guide card into his data pad and keying for a house ring search. Or hadn't it occurred to you that Lorana might be in trouble? No, but it occurred to me that if we left too suddenly, Duefgren might have called Jamfai and warned him, Anakin retorted. Mind your place, Padawan, Obi-Wan warned the boy. It was a warning he seemed to be delivering more and more often these days. Anakin gave a theatrical sigh. My apologies, Master. A map appeared on the data pad's display, showing the way to the covered brush house ring. There it is, Obi-Wan said, 
angling the data pad so that Anakin could see. That's not the direction he was going when he left Duefgrin, Anakin pointed out uneasily. I know, Obi-Wan said grimly. But right now, it's all we've got. Let's go take a look. The neighborhood where the covered brush house ring was located was similar to many Obi-Wan had seen in his journeys around the Republic. It was poor but clean, a place where the people worked hard for what little they had but nevertheless worked equally hard to maintain their pride and dignity. Some Jedi, he knew, treated such places and people with disdain or condescension. For his own part, he far preferred them to Coruscant supper level inhabitants with their immensely greater wealth but shifting sand ethics. Most of the people in these places were friendlier and more forthright without hidden political agendas or the lust for position and power. At the very least, if someone here wanted to stab someone, he used a knife and not a deceitful smile. Where do we start? Anakin murmured as they stopped beside one of the hedges across the street from the building. You could start by staying out of my way, a voice murmured from somewhere behind them. Obi-Wan spun around his hand darting beneath his tunic to his lightsaber as a face rose from concealment behind a section of hedge they just passed. One look was all he needed. Hello, Risk, he said, releasing his grip on his lightsaber. Imagine meeting you here. I could say the same thing, Risk said sourly, jerking his head toward his side of the hedge. You want to step into my office a minute? Obi-Wan glanced around. There were only a few Brawlfys still out in the gathering dusk, and none of them was looking in their direction. Tapping Anakin on the arm, he did a quick backward leap over the hedge. He landed in a crouch, Anakin right beside him. You're persistent, I'll give you that, Risk said as he waddled over to join them, keeping his head down. What are you doing here? We're looking for a brawlf named Jomphi, Obi-Wan told him. He had someone steal a pair of burst thrusters for him this afternoon. We were hoping to ask him why. While you're at it, you could also ask about the explosives that disappeared from a mining site one of his close friends was working at, Risk said darkly. Or about the stabilization system another friend apparently borrowed from his boss's hobby swoop or the alloy packing cylinders that were lifted from another work site. You seeing a pattern here? Obi-Wan grimaced. Someone's building a homemade missile. Or two or three of them, Risk said. And it doesn't look like either of us will be able to ask Jomphi about it, since he and all his friends seem to have disappeared. Wonderful, Obi-Wan said, peering over the hedge. Yeah, that's the word I was thinking, Risk said. So what's your interest in him? Our friend the Padawan you ran into earlier was following him, Obi-Wan said. She's disappeared, and I can't raise her on the comm link. Too bad, Risk said. Nice kid, but not much combat savvy. We're not ready to give up on her quite yet, Obi-Wan growled. You have any idea where Jomphi might have gone to ground? If I did, I wouldn't be hanging around here, Risk countered. I've got people checking out the mining guild centers, but if Jomphi's not coming home I doubt he'd be stupid enough to go to any of them. So what do we do? Anakin asked. What I'm going to do is head back to the hotel and make sure we've got our security set up, Risk said. I'm figuring it'll come tonight the Duracrete slugs always disappear just before they drop the house on you. Or they might try for the city administration center tomorrow, Obi-Wan suggested. Unlikely, Risk said. Jomphi's hardly going to attack a place where his own guild master is busy negotiating for him. No, it's got to be the hotel, or maybe the route to the admin center in the morning. Unfortunately. Risk's analysis made sense. Okay, Obi-Wan said. You tie down that end, and we'll keep looking for Lorana. Good luck, Risk shook his head. 
You know, I almost planted a tracker on her earlier, just so I could make sure she was staying out of my way. I wish now I had. I wish you had too, Obi-Wan said. We'll just have to manage on our own. Jedi are supposed to be good at such things, Risk said, pulling out a data card and handing it over. This'll give you a direct connection to my comm link, running it through one of our encryptions. Call me if you hear anything, okay? I will, Obi-Wan promised, sliding the card into his comm link pouch. Risk nodded and moved away. He reached the far end of the hedge, glanced over it, then slipped back around and headed off at a brisk walk. Now what? Anakin asked. We'd better let Master Kbeoth know what happened, Obi-Wan said reluctantly. He and the Rana may be close enough for him to be able to detect her forced signature. Maybe, Anakin said doubtfully as they returned to the end of the hedge and back onto the walkway. You know, maybe we all should carry trackers. Obi-Wan looked sideways at him. I can think of at least one person who ought to have one, he muttered under his breath. What was that? Obi-Wan shook his head. Never mind. Kbeath, when they finally raised him on the comm link, wasn't at all happy about being disturbed. He was even less happy when he heard their story. For the moment we'll pass over the fact that you involved yourself with the Balak situation against my direct order. The Jedi Master rumbled, and Obi-Wan could imagine his eyes flashing from beneath his bushy eyebrows. The important point right now is that you've put my Padawan at risk. I understand your anger, Master Kbeoth Dash, Obi-Wan began. Anger? Kbeoth cut him off. There is no anger, Master Kenobi. Not for a Jedi. My apologies, Obi-Wan said, trying hard to suppress some annoyance of his own. A situation like this, and all the man could do was recite Jedi canon. It was an improper choice of words. Better, Kbeoth rumbled. What about you, Padawan Skywalker? Have you any thoughts? Obi-Wan angled the calm link toward the boy. Not really, Master Kbeoth, Anakin said. Mostly, I'm concerned about Lorana's safety. I'm worried that she may have been killed. For a moment, Kbeoth didn't answer. No, she's not dead he said at last. I would have felt such a disturbance in the Force. Then you can locate her? Anakin asked hopefully. The one does not necessarily follow from the other, Kbeoth told him. Unfortunately, I can't pick up her Force signature at the moment. Master Kenobi, you said you'd spoken to the boy who obtained the boosters. He might know where Jomfai's favorite hiding spots are. I don't think so, Anakin said. He doesn't seem to be a part of the actual conspiracy. Yet he knows Jomfai, and may have seen something in the past that will point the way. I doubt he'd be willing to discuss it, Obi-Wan said. At least not with strangers. Did I ask if he would be willing? Obi-Wan felt his throat tighten. Are you suggesting I force his mind? No, of course not, Kbeoth assured him. But the words Obi-Wan knew were for Anakin's benefit. That was, in fact, exactly what Kbeoth had been suggesting. We're the protectors of the weak, not their oppressors. At the same time, a crime has been perpetrated against the Jedi. Such a thing cannot be allowed to go unchallenged. Even if Padawan Jinsler chose not to fight in her own defense, he added darkly. Obi-Wan frowned. What do you mean? There have been no reports of lightsabers being seen in the city, Master Kenobi, Kbeoth said patiently. Nor has news of multiple severed limbs reached my ears. Lorena Jinsler is only a Padawan, but I have certainly instructed her in combat better than that. Of course, Obi-Wan said, a sudden idea striking him. 
if Kbeath was right about Lorana going quietly with her kidnappers. Thank you for your time, Master Kbeath. I will expect my Padawan to be at my side when I meet Ivigistrate Arjant and Guildmaster Gilfrom in the morning, Kbeath warned. Understood, Obi-Wan said. Breaking the connection, he slid the comm link back into his belt. So how are we going to find her? Anakin asked. Master Kbeath gave us the hint himself, Obi-Wan told him. He's right. If Lorana had fought against her attackers, we certainly would have heard of it. Therefore, she didn't. Okay, Anakin said. And that means what? It means that she must have decided that surrendering quietly would gain her more than fighting, Obi-Wan said. She probably hoped she'd be taken into the center of the conspiracy where she could meet the people in charge. But... He let the word hang expectantly in the air, hoping Anakin would pick up the train of logic. But they'd be crazy to bring a Jedi to their leaders, the boy said slowly. Even a Padawan. Exactly, Obi-Wan said. And what's the fastest way to tell if someone like Lorana is a Jedi? If you catch her carrying a lightsaber, Anakin said, his voice suddenly picking up on Obi-Wan's own cautious hope. So she had to get rid of it. Right, Obi-Wan confirmed. And she probably got rid of it on the spur of the moment, someplace near where she was kidnapped. Someplace close enough for us to be able to sense its Ilum crystal. Anakin finished excitedly. But we'll still have to get pretty close, won't we? True, but at least out in the street we'll be able to get that close. Obi-Wan pointed out. If she and her lightsaber were both inside a house, we probably wouldn't be able to spot the crystal, at least not from outside. He gestured down the street, darkened now except for the faint glow of streetlights. We'll start here in the covered brush area. John Fai was smart enough to stay away from his own house, but he may have been stupid enough to go to a nearby friend's. If we don't find anything, we'll start going through the poorer neighborhoods of Padamini District. Because that's the sort of neighborhood Jamfai is used to? No, because that's where they use hedges instead of walls to mark the land boundaries, Obi-Wan said. You're not going to bury a lightsaber inside a stone wall without somebody noticing. If we don't find her there, we'll move on to the wealthier areas, then move on to other districts. Anakin took a deep breath. All right. I'm game if you are. Good, Obi-Wan said. Then clear your mind, my young Padawan. It's likely to be a long night. They'd been tramping the streets for hours when Obi-Wan finally felt the tingle he'd been waiting for. The Ilum crystal and Lorana's lightsaber was close at hand. He looked sideways at Anakin, waiting for the boy to sense it as well. Even in the middle of a serious situation, training exercises were part of a Padawan's life. They got three more steps before Anakin's steady footsteps suddenly faltered. There, the boy said. Just ahead, on the left. Very good, Obi-Wan said approvingly, letting his eyes drift around the neighborhood. It was still a good two hours till dawn, and the houses around them were dark and silent their inhabitants fast asleep. Or at least most of them were. The particular inhabitants they were interested in would be very much awake. No, don't go to it, he told Anakin, catching the boy's arm as he started toward the hedge where Lorana's lightsaber lay hidden. Here, around on the other side quickly, now. Together they moved around the end of the hedge and ducked down out of sight. Is someone watching us? Anakin murmured as Obi-Wan led them in a crouch to within a few meters of the lightsaber. We'll find out in a moment, Obi-Wan said. Tell me, what would you do if you were guarding a prisoner in the middle of the night and suddenly something strange happened outside your window? I don't know, Anakin said, frowning in thought. 
I suppose it would depend on how strange it was. Let's find out. Stretching out to the force, Obi-Wan reached his mind across the distance and triggered Lorana's lightsaber. With a muted snap hiss the green blade lanced out, startlingly bright in the nighttime darkness. A few small leaves showered down where they'd been cut loose from their branches, but the handle was wedged solidly in place and stayed where it was. Now let's see who in the neighborhood is still awake, he commented. They didn't have long to wait. Less than a minute later a door in one of the houses across the street opened, and a lone brolf peered anxiously out, his eyes darting around. Seeing no one, he lumbered across the street to the blazing lightsaber. For a moment he stared at it uncertainly. Then, gingerly, he reached into the mesh of branches and pulled the weapon free. Holding it at arm's length, he turned it carefully in his hand, clearly trying to figure out how to shut it off. Allow me, Obi-Wan spoke up, rising to his full height behind the hedge. Reaching out with the force, he closed down the lightsaber. The brolf was fast, all right. Almost before the blade had vanished he leapt into action, jumping sideways and hurling the lightsaber straight at Obi-Wan's face as he hauled a blaster out of his tunic. Fast but stupid. Obi-Wan was a Jedi, with Jedi reflexes, and he had his own lightsaber ready in his hand before the Brolf even started his leap. Reaching up with his free hand, he caught Lorana's weapon and then ignited his own, casually catching the Brolf's shot on his blade and sending it ricocheting off into the night sky. Stubbornly, the Brolf kept at it, firing again and again with the single-minded foolhardiness of a battle droid. Obi-Wan settled into battle mode, his attention focused inward as he let the force guide his hands, deflecting the shots as he strode toward his attacker. And then, through his tunnel vision, he dimly sensed something happening across the street. The Brolf heard or saw it, too, and for a split second his attention wavered as his eyes darted that direction. It was all the opening Obi-Wan needed. Taking an extra long step forward, he gave a short, controlled slash that sliced the Brolf's blaster neatly in half. The Brolf had been quick to attack. Now, with equal speed, he dropped the remaining half of his blaster and took off down the street as fast as his stubby legs could carry him. Obi-Wan considered chasing him down, decided against it, and turned toward the house the other had emerged from. It was only then that he realized Anakin was no longer with him. Blast! He bit out under his breath, breaking into a run. There was a diffuse blue light flickering from somewhere inside the house, and as he headed up the walkway to the open door he heard the familiar hum of his Padawan's lightsaber. Picking up his pace, he charged inside. He found Anakin in one of the inner rooms, standing over Lorana's limp form, his lightsaber held in guard position toward a pair of Brawlfi cowering in the corner. A third Brawlf lay motionlessly on the floor, the remains of a blaster beside him. Master, Anakin said, clearly trying to sound casual but not entirely succeeding. I found her. So I see, Obi-Wan said, closing down his lightsaber and kneeling down beside the young woman. Her breathing and pulse were slow but steady. What did you use on her? He demanded, turning toward the Brawlfi in the corner. Mather answered. I didn't see anything when I came in. Anakin offered. Then they must have it on them, Obi-Wan said. Stepping past Anakin, he ignited his lightsaber and started deliberately toward them. As with the Brolf he dealt with outside, either of these two was interested in being a hero. He's got it, one of them spoke up hastily, digging a thumb into his partner's side. Yeah, here it is, the other agreed digging a hypo from inside his tunic and lobbing it at Obi-Wan's feet. Thank you, Obi-Wan said politely. Let's add your comlinks to the pile, shall we? And any weapons, of course. A moment later two comlinks and a pair of long knives had joined the hypo. 
What do we do with them? Anakin asked. That depends on what they've been dosing her with, Obi-Wan said ominously, closing down his lightsaber again and picking up the hypo. It was unlabeled, of course. Running through his Jedi sensory enhancement techniques, he squirted a small drop of the liquid onto his sleeve and held it up to his nose. One sniff was all it took. It's okay, he assured Anakin as he let the enhancement fade away. It's a strong sedative, not a poison. She'll be all right once it wears off. He gestured toward the two Bralfi. Which means they won't be facing any murder charges. He cocked his head. At least, not until their homemade missile goes off. Both of the prisoners jerked noticeably at the word missile. We had nothing to do with that, one of them insisted. It was all Filvian's idea. His and the humans. Obi-Wan frowned. There was a human mixed up in this? What human? He demanded. What's his name? He calls himself Defender, the Brawl said. That's all I know. What does he look like? The Brawl looked helplessly at his companion. Like a human, the second Brawl said, waving a hand vaguely. Do they need more persuasion, Master? Anakin asked, letting his voice harden. Obi-Wan suppressed a smile. In his experience, threats from 14-year-olds were seldom very convincing. His eyes dropped to the dead Brawl on the floor. On second thought, in this case maybe they were. Don't bother, he told Anakin. They probably really don't know how to describe him. I'll bet Risk could get something out of them, Anakin suggested. For a long moment Obi-Wan was tempted. After all, the assassination plot was directed against Magistrate Arjant. It would be only fitting for them to be turned over to Arjant's people for interrogation. But that wasn't the way Jedi were supposed to do things. We'll turn them over to the city police, he told Anakin, pulling out his comm link. Then I guess we'll just have to wait for Lorana to wake up. Maybe she can tell us more. We going to wait here? Anakin asked, frowning. Of course, Obi-Wan said, smiling tightly. After all, Jomphi or Filvian or Defender might drop by. Right, Anakin murmured understandingly. If we're lucky. The Vigari ship had been anchored to the outside of the Krusty asteroid base a quarter of the circumference around from the entrance tunnel. With a Chiss warrior at the controls, Thrawn and the three humans took one of the transports out from the base and docked with it. To Cardassus' private dismay, the alien bodies were still there, lying crumpled right where they'd fallen. Kento was apparently not thrilled by that fact either. You are planning to clean up this place eventually, aren't you? He asked distastefully as they picked their way through the corridor toward the treasure room. Eventually. Thrawn assured him. First we need to learn what we can of the enemy's strategy and tactics, and for that we need to know where each combatant was and how he was positioned when he died. Shouldn't you have put the ship somewhere out of sight? Maris asked. She was clinging tightly to Kento's arm as they walked, Cardas noted, apparently not doing nearly as well this time around as she had on their last visit. It made him feel better somehow. Eventually, we'll move it inside the base, Thrawn said. But we need to first establish that there are no dangerous instabilities in its engines or weaponry. The treasure room, like the corridors, looked exactly the same as it had just after the ship's capture, except that now there were a pair of chis moving along the stacks, apparently making sensor records of the various items. Spread out. Thrawn ordered the humans. See if you can find anything of a familiar style. You mean like different kinds of money? Kento asked as he looked around the room. Or are you talking about the gemstones? 
Maris added. I was speaking mainly of the artwork, Thrawn said. We can learn more from that than we can from currency or gems. Kento snorted. You expecting there to be sales receipts? I was thinking more of the art's origins. Thrawn gestured toward a set of nested trestles. Those, for instance, were probably created by beings with an extra joint between wrist and elbow, who see largely in the blue ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Kento and Maris exchanged looks. The Frenchies, you think? Maris suggested. Yeah, right, Kento said with a grunt. He eyed Thrawn suspiciously, then unhooked Maris's arm from his and strode over to the trestles. What are Frenchies? Cardas asked. The Frenchette and Sai, Maris explained. They have a couple of colony worlds in the outer rim. Rack calls them Frenchies because dash. I'll be broggled, Kento said, cutting her off as he leaned over the trestles with his head cocked to the side. What? Maris said. He's right, Kento said, sounding stunned. It's signed with formal French script. He turned back to Thrawn, a strange expression on his face. I thought you said you hadn't made it to Republic space. To the best of my knowledge, we haven't, Thrawn said. But the artist's physical characteristics are obvious simply from looking at his work. Maybe to you it's obvious, Kento growled, looking back at the trestles. It sure isn't to me. Or me, Maris seconded. Thrawn raised his eyebrows at Cardas. Cardas? Cardas peered at the artwork, trying to spot whatever these subtle cues were that Thrawn had seen. But he couldn't. Sorry. Maybe it was just luck, Kento said, abandoning the trestles and kneeling down beside an elaborate blue and white sculpt. Let me see here. Yeah, I thought so. He looked over his shoulder at Thrawn. How about this one? For a moment Thrawn studied the sculpt in silence, his eyes occasionally flicking around the rest of the room as if seeking inspiration. The artist is humanoid, he said at last. Proportioned differently from humans and chis, with either a wider torso or longer arms. His eyes narrowed slightly. There's something of a distance to his emotional state, too. I would say his people are both drawn to and yet repulsed by or fearful of the physical objects they live among. Kento's breath went out in a huff. I don't believe this, he said. That's the Pashvi, all right. I don't think I know them, Maris said. They've got a system on the edge of wild space, Kento said. I've been there a few times there's a small but stable market for their art, mostly in the corporate sector. What did Commander Thrawn mean about fear of physical objects? Cardas asked. Their world is sprinkled with thousands of rock pillars, Kento said. Most of the best food plants grow on the tops. Unfortunately, so does a nasty predator avian. It makes for well for pretty much just what he said. And you got all that from a single sculpt? Maris asked, gazing at Thrawn with a strange look on her face. Actually, no, the Chiss assured her. There are let me see twelve more examples of their artwork. He pointed to two other areas of the room. You sure? Cardas asked, frowning at the indicated sculpts and flats. They don't look at all alike to me. They were created by different artists, Thrawn said. But the species is the same. This is really weird, Kento said, shaking his head. Like some crazy Jedi thing. Jedi? Thrawn asked. They're the guardians of the peace in the Republic, Maris told him. Probably the only reason we've held together as long as we have. They're very powerful, very noble people. Kento caught Cardas's eye, his nose wrinkling slightly. His opinion of Jedi 
Cardas knew, was considerably lower than his girlfriend's. They sound intriguing. Thrawn nodded toward the sculpt. I presume these Pashvi won't have put up much resistance to Vigari raids. Hardly, Kento confirmed grimly. They're a pretty agreeable people. Lousy at fighting. And your Republic and these Jedi don't protect them? The Jedi are spread way too thin, Kardas said. Anyway, wild space isn't actually part of the Republic. Even if it were, the government is too busy with its own intrigues to bother with little things like life and death situations, Marl said, a bitter edge to her voice. I see, Thrawn said. Well, let us continue our survey, and please inform me if you find anything else from your region of space. He looked at Marl's. And as we search, perhaps you'll tell me more about these Jedi. Nine. Guildmaster Gilfrom's here. Anakin's voice said softly from Obi-Wan's comlink. Just coming up the steps to the east door. Magistrate Arjan's here, too, Obi-Wan told him, gazing down from the administration building's west door as Arjan climbed up the stairs on that side, his people pressed protectively around him. And I see Master Kbeath and Lorana approaching through the marketplace. So that's it. Anakin asked. Obi-Wan scratched his check thoughtfully. The expected attack on Magistrate Arjan hadn't come during the night, nor had it been launched on the trip here to the conference room. Now, with the miner's representative on the scene, the conspirator's last chance was gone, at least until the negotiators broke for lunch. It is for now anyway, he told Anakin. But stay alert. Arjant and his people reached the top of the stairs, and Obi-Wan bowed in greeting. The group brushed past without a single acknowledging glance and disappeared inside. Suppressing a flicker of annoyance, Obi-Wan turned his attention to Kbeath and Lorana as they started up the stairs. Lorana, he noted, was a bit pale, her steps a little tentative. But her expression was determined and as they reached the top of the steps she smiled a bit awkwardly at him. Master Kenobi, she said, nodding. I never had a chance to properly thank you for what you and Anakin did for me yesterday. And this is also not the time, Kbeath put in. Nevertheless, there was a flicker of approval in his eyes as the two Jedi exchanged nods. There is still danger, both to the negotiators and the negotiations themselves. Stay here with Master Kenobi and watch the crowd for familiar faces. Yes, Master Kbeath, Lorana said. With another nod at Obi-Wan, Kbeath strode past through the doorway, leaving the two of them alone. How do you feel? Obi-Wan asked. Much better, thank you, Lorana said. I really don't know how much good I can do here, though, she added turning toward the marketplace spread out before them at the bottom of the steps. I only saw three of the conspirators. That's three more than the rest of us have, Obi-Wan pointed out. Not counting the ones already in custody, of course. Maybe their arrests scared off the others. It may have scared them away from a missile attack, but they're not going to just give up and go away, Obi-Wan said. They seem obsessed with what they see as the corporate alliance's attempt to steal their planet's wealth, and once a person's obsessed he or she doesn't listen to logic anymore. Sheer momentum will carry them the rest of the way through this. Lorana shook her head. I'm afraid I don't understand that kind of thinking. You need to learn to understand it, Obi-Wan told her. Obsession is something that can happen to even the strongest person and for the best of motives, he gestured. Still, with you and me at this door, Anakin and Risk at the other, and the police and the corporate alliance's security watching the sky, we should be able to stop whatever they throw at us. I hope you're right, Lorana murmured. If not, Master Kbeoth will never let us hear the end of it. Seated on his hotel room balcony, 
Doriana smiled down at the scene below him. The players had assembled, and it was time for the performance to begin. Picking up his comm link, he keyed it on and punched in the proper activation code. Then, setting the comm link aside, he settled down to watch. Even stretched out to the force, Lorana's only warning was a burst of commotion at the leftmost edge of the marketplace, a sudden movement of shoppers as they scattered away from one of the booths. Something's happening, she warned, pointing. The words were barely out of her mouth when the booth erupted in a flash of light and a burst of smoke. Watch out! Obi-Wan barked, the snap hiss of his lightsaber sounding behind her. Lorana yanked out her own lightsaber, igniting it as she tried to pierce the expanding smoke cloud. As far as she could tell, nothing else seemed to be happening. To the right! Obi-Wan warned. Lorana turned, and to her horror she saw a silvery cylinder streak out of another of the booths, flying a bare meter above the ground. Coming straight toward them. I've got it! she said, jumping into its path and lifting her lightsaber into attack three position. Defense against incoming remotes was an exercise Kbeoth had drilled her in for hour after wearying hour. Behind her, she sensed Obi-Wan moving back and to her right into backstop position. She settled her breathing, watching the missile approach, trying not to think about what would happen if her attack detonated the warhead. It was nearly to her when, Without warning, the front of the nose cone erupted into a cloud of sparkling smoke, and a cone of roiling black liquid sprayed out at her. She squeezed her eyes tightly shut, instinctively flinching to the side as she did so. She sensed the missile start to pass, and swung her lightsaber as hard as she could in that direction. But her sidestep had put her off balance, and even as her blade sliced through the air she knew she was too late. Behind her, she heard the pitch of Obi-Wan's lightsaber change as he took his own shot at it. But the missile's roar changed as fresh thrusters kicked in, and as the heat of the missile's exhaust swept across her she could tell that he, too, had missed. Come on! He shouted. A hand grabbed her arm, and suddenly they were running through the heat and dissipating smoke in the missile's wake. She blinked her eaves open ignoring the sting as the black liquid dribbled into them, to see the missile jinking back and forth down the wide central corridor like a droid seeking a target. Across the building at the far door she saw Anakin and Risk charging in from the other door, Anakin's lightsaber blazing in his hand, Risk's blaster firing uselessly. Letting go of Lorana's arm, Obi-Wan locked his lightsaber on and hurled it at the missile. But even as the spinning green blade closed on it, the missile's nose dipped, and it made a hard turn to the left. She could sense Obi-Wan stretching to the force, trying to bring his lightsaber back on target. But she could also sense that he wouldn't be in time. Which left only one thing they could do. Closing her eyes, she stretched out to the force, turning her thoughts to her master. Master Kbeoth, she sent urgently toward the room beyond the archway. Danger. 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 The missile disappeared through the archway, and she joined with the others in racing down the corridor after it. She caught up with Obi-Wan just as he reached the opening, and turned the corner with him, and found herself confronted by an extraordinary sight. Seated at opposite ends of the table, the mining and corporate alliance representatives had turned in their chairs to stare with a mixture of surprise, fascination, and terror at the missile that had intruded into their solemn proceedings. Between them, half risen from his own chair, Kbeoth was holding a hand palm outward toward the missile, his eyes blazing. But the missile was no longer moving. It was frozen in midair, halfway between the archway and the table, its thrusters spitting fire uselessly as they tried to drive it forward against Kbeoth's force grip. Don't be concerned. The Jedi Master intoned, his voice resonating with power and authority. So certain parties believe that they know best what is right and just for Barlock, do they? That killing us will bring them their desire? 
that the influence of violence supersedes the authority of justice? Thank you, Master Kbayoth Dash, Obi-Wan said, starting toward the missile. Stand fast, Master Kenobi, Kbayoth ordered sharply. That is what our attackers believe, Magistrate Arjant, Guild Master Gilfrom, he said, sending a hard look at each end of the table. Do you believe it as well? Arjant found his voice first. No, of course not, he said his voice quavering, his eyes locked on the missile that had nearly brought a sudden and violent death to them all. Then why do you persist in eroding the legitimate rights of the people of Barlock? Kbeoth demanded. And you, he added, turning back to Gilfrom's end of the table. Why do you persist in denying the time and expense the corporate alliance has spent in developing resources that would otherwise have forever lain uselessly beneath the soil of your world? Gilfrom bristled. Now, see here, Master Kbeoth Dash. No, you see, Kbeoth cut in, looking again at Arjant. Both of you see. I have listened to your arguments and your positions and your selfish pettiness. It ends here. Deliberately, he closed his outstretched hand. With a raucous crackling of stressed metal, the body of the missile crumpled in on itself. The people of Barlock demand a fair and just decision, he said, more quietly now as he gestured Obi-Wan forward. I will tell you what that decision is going to be. The room was silent as Obi-Wan stepped to the mutilated weapon stretching out his hand to take its weight from Kbeoth. Holding it in a force grip in front of him, he turned and headed back toward the archway. Lorana looked a question at Kbeoth, got a microscopic nod in return, and turned to go with Obi-Wan. It was only then that she noticed Anakin standing beneath the archway, his eyes filled with admiration as he gazed across the room at Kbeoth. That's telling them, he murmured as she and Obi-Wan reached him. Come on, Obi-Wan said, his forehead wrinkling slightly as he looked at the boy. Let's get this thing to the police disposal team. Report, the gravelly voice of Darth Sidious ordered, his hooded face hovering above the hollow projector. The Balak operation has been a complete success, my lord, Doriana told him. Both sides of the negotiations were so shaken by the attack that Kbeoth was able to force them into an agreement. And is of course taking full credit for it. Knowing Kbeoth, there was never any doubt on that score, Doriana said. Fortunately, the whole planet seems quite happy to let him have it. Another day or two, and he'll be the hero of the entire sector. Give him a week and he'll probably be organizing his own victory parade through mid-level Coruscant. You have done well, Sidious said. And what of the unanticipated interference from Kenobi and Skywalker? Negligible, Doriana said, wondering again at the speed and breadth of the Sith Lord's knowledge. He hadn't even mentioned Kenobi's unwelcome arrival on Barlock, yet Sidious apparently knew all about it. Clearly, he had excellent sources of information. All I had to do was add a shroud liquid sprayer to the missile to make sure they wouldn't be able to stop it until it reached the conference chamber where Kbeoth could make his dramatic grandstand play. And neither he nor Kenobi suspect your manipulation of the events? Not at all, my lord, Doriana said. My sources tell me the police analysts could tell the sprayer was a last-minute add-on but they've concluded that it was added in response to Kbeoth's appearance on the scene, not Kenobi's. I don't want Kenobi taking any of the credit, Sidious warned. He cannot be permitted to blunt Kbeoth's triumph and prestige. He won't, Doriana assured him. Kenobi isn't the type to seek public recognition. Kbeoth certainly isn't the type to offer him a share. Then all continues to go according to my plan, Sidious concluded with satisfaction.
Opposition in the Senate and the Jedi Council to Kbeath's pet project will melt away now before the fire of his newly enhanced stature. And if not, I have other contingency plans for raising it even higher, Doriana said. The right word in Palpatine's ear is all it will take. Yes, Sidious said. Speaking of Palpatine, you'd best leave Barlock and return to your official business. I also want you to find a way to make yourself the Supreme Chancellor's personal liaison to outbound flight's final preparations. Easily done, my lord, Doriana assured him. Palpatine is so tied up with other matters that he'll welcome the chance to pass this one onto my shoulders. Excellent, Sidious said. You have done well, my friend. Contact me when you return to Coruscant, and we'll discuss the final details. The image vanished, and Doriana keyed off the connection. A simpler man, he reflected, even a master of the dark side like Lord Tyrannus, might have tried to eliminate Kbeoth directly through a genuine assassination, utilizing a more potent attack from more competent conspirators. But as Sidious himself had pointed out, Doriana was more subtle than that. After all, why simply dispose of a powerful troublemaker like Joris Kbeoth when you could dispose of him? and as many other Jedi as he could talk into accompanying him on outbound flight? Smiling to himself, Doriana began to disassemble his hollow projector. Jorisk Bayath, Jedi master and potential threat to Darth Sidious's plan for the Republic, was dead. He just didn't know it yet. It had been a long, frustrating day at the preparation center, one more of an endless series of them stretching back to the beginning of time, and as Chaz Yulier keyed open his apartment door he wondered yet again if all of this was ever going to be worth it. He'd been fresh out of school when he'd been approached by outbound flights recruiters, and in the excitement and optimism of youth had instantly signed up to go along. But now, after two years of ever-slowing preparations and ever-lengthening delays, the shine had begun to fade. The latest rumor was that the Senate Appropriations Committee had decided to scratch all the families off the voyage, which would essentially turn outbound flight into little more than an extended military reconnaissance mission. Which would, of course, take away the one thing which had made this whole project unique. But then, what did the corrupt bureaucrats of Coruscant care about anything as trivial as history or glory or even a vision for the Republic's future? The glow plates in the common room were off, but as he switched them on he spotted a sliver of light coming from beneath the doors of both sleeping rooms. At least two of his three roommates were home, then. The planners had deliberately packed the recruits tightly together this way to simulate the close quarters that would exist aboard the six dreadnoughts once outbound flight set off on its mission. Some people, mostly those from the more sparsely settled mid-rim worlds, hadn't been able to handle the lack of privacy and had dropped out, but Yulier himself hadn't had any problems. Though if all the families were tossed out like the Senate wanted, he thought sourly, he would probably get a suite this size all to himself. He was looking through the pantry, trying to decide what to have for dinner, when one of the doors opened behind him. Hey, Chaz, Brace Tarkosa called from behind him. You hear the news? Yulia shook his head. I've been on D5 all day trying to run down a fuel line problem, he said, turning around. Let me guess, the Senate's decided to close us down completely? You've got it backward, Tarkosa said, grinning. He was a strongly built man, two years older than Yulia, and allegedly one of the first hundred people to have signed up with the project. Not only are they not closing us down, they've restored full funding and authorized the final assembly of the dreadnoughts, and reversed themselves on dropping the families. Yulier stared at him. You're kidding, he said. Did someone on Karuskin have spoiled shellfish for lunch and start hearing voices? Tarkosa shook his head. Rumor has it that it's all Jedi Master Kbeath is doing. 
He came roaring back from some negotiation session two days ago with enough momentum to crush roll this whole thing straight through committee. He lifted a finger. And it looks like we're going to get some more Jedi, too. How many? Don't know, Tarkosa said. As many as Kbayath wants, apparently. Wouldn't that be nice? Yulia murmured, a faint wisp of hope tugging at him. Rumors around here were as cheap as hardware problems, and he certainly wasn't ready to take any of this at face value. But if the Jedi had genuinely signed on to the project, maybe things would finally start to turn around. After all, a solar wind drove all wisp sails, and everyone knew that Jedi always got the best of everything. So when is this all supposed to happen? Any day now, Tarkosa assured him. He grinned lopsidedly. Hey, have a little faith. Come on, let's go get Keeley and hit the tap calf for dinner. You go ahead, Yulia told him, turning back to the pantry and pulling out a packaged ship's ration. I'll save my celebrating until the Jedi are actually here. Six of them? Obi-Wan repeated disbelievingly. Including Kbeoth himself, yes, Windu confirmed, his back rigid as he stared out the council chamber window at the evening Coruscant skyline. And eleven Jedi Knights have signed on to go along, as well. Obi-Wan grimaced. Six Jedi Masters, plus eleven Jedi Knights, was not an insignificant number in these increasingly dark days. I thought you and Master Yoda told him he could have no more than two other Jedi. That was before Barlock, Windus said ruefully, turning to face him. After Barlock. Well, let's just say that not even the Council is completely immune to pressure. Yes, I heard some of it, Obi-Wan said, nodding. He was pushing his arguments to anyone who would listen. And he can be highly persuasive when he wants to be, Winda said. I just wasn't expecting so many to get caught up in his excitement. Obi-Wan felt a frown crease his forehead. Jedi Master Mace Windu, as closely attuned with the Force as any Jedi in the Republic. And yet he hadn't foreseen something this dramatic? Couldn't you refuse them permission? Of course we could, Windu said. But I'm afraid that at the moment that would just cause more dissension. We can't afford that, not in these times of turmoil. And to be honest, there are good arguments to have a strong Jedi presence aboard outbound flight. He paused, studying Obi-Wan's face. Tell me, did the investigators on Barlock ever locate or identify the human whom the Brolf conspirators claimed had helped with their missile attack? Not as of when Anakin and I left, Obi-Wan said. I haven't heard anything since then, either. Why? It just bothers me somehow, Windus said. We have a human help to launch a missile, which is then stopped in the nick of time by another human. Coincidence? Obi-Wan felt his eyebrows creeping up his forehead. Are you suggesting Kbeoth might have set the whole thing up himself? No, of course not, Windus said. But he didn't sound entirely certain. Only a Jedi who turned to the dark side would be capable of such cold-blooded manipulation. I can't believe he'd do that, not even for something he believes in this strongly. On the other hand, we suspect there may be a Sith out there somewhere. Obi-Wan pointed out. Maybe. No. No, I can't believe it either. Still, we can't afford to take chances, Windus said. That's why I asked you here tonight. I want you and Anakin to find Kbeoth and ask to go along with him. Not all the way to the next galaxy. He hastened to add as Obi-Wan felt his jaw drop. Just through the unknown regions part of the exploration. That could take months, Obi-Wan protested. 
I have work to do on Silurine. Sometimes a Jedi's most important duty is to stand and wait, Windy countered mildly. I presume you've mentioned that to Anakin on occasion? Obi-Wan grimaced. Not more than twice a day, he conceded. Did you have any suggestions on how to convince Kbayoth to turn around when we reach the edge of the galaxy and take us back? That would be an interesting conversation to sit in on. Winda said drilly. But no, my thought was to put a Delta-12 Sky Sprite aboard one of the Dreadnoughts for you. It's a bigger, two-seat version of the Delta-7 Ether Sprite you've been training on, only with the weapons packs stripped off. Quad Systems is hoping to put them on the civilian market sometime in the next few months. No internal hyperdrive, I take it? Winda shook his head. It uses the same transgalmig hyperdrive ring as the other sprite. I don't know, Obi-Wan said doubtfully, running the numbers in his head. We're talking an awful lot of distance for something that size. Especially with two people aboard. It would be tight but doable, Winder assured him. Especially since both you and Anakin can use Jedi hibernation to stretch out the supplies of air and food. Obi-Wan spread his hands. If that's what the council wishes, Anakin and I stand ready to obey. If Kbayoth will have us, that is. Just find a way aboard, Winda said, his eyes darkening. However you have to do it. 10. What is your profession? Thrawn asked in Shun. I am a merchant trader. Cardas said carefully in the same language, forcing the odd sounds through unwilling tongue and lips. Thrawn lifted his eyebrows politely. You are a fishing boat? He asked, switching to basic. Cardas looked at Maris. That's what you said, she confirmed, an amused smile on her face. He lifted his hand slightly, let it fall back into his lap. I am a merchant trader, he said, giving up and switching over to the Manisiat trade language. Ah, Thrawn said in the same language. You're a merchant trader? Yes, Kardas shook his head. I really said I was a fishing boat? Poskapforian, Poskapforian, Thrawn pronounced. Can you hear the difference? Kardas nodded. He could hear the difference between the aspirated and unaspirated P sounds in the second syllable, all right. He just couldn't make the difference with his own mouth. And I practiced that all evening too, he grumbled. I warned you Chun would most likely be beyond your physical capabilities, Thrawn reminded him. Still, your increase in comprehension level has been quite amazing especially after only five weeks. And your progress with Menisiat over the same period has been nothing less than remarkable. I'm impressed. His glowing eyes shifted to Maris. With both of you, he added. Thank you, Commander, Kardas said. To have impressed you is high praise indeed. Now you flatter me, Thrawn warned with a smile. Is that the correct word? Flatter? The word is correct, Kardas confirmed. Whatever progress he and Maris might have made with their studies, Thrawn's own work on BASIC had far surpassed them, a feat rendered all the more remarkable given how much less time he'd had to devote to language studies. But I would argue with the usage, he added. Flattery implies exaggeration or even falsehood. My statement was the truth. Thrawn inclined his head. Then I accept the tribute as given. He turned to Maris. And now, Pharisai, I'm ready with your special request. Kardas frowned. Special request? Pharisai asked me to create a description of one of the artworks aboard the Vigari pirate vessel. Thrawn told him. 
Cardas looked at her. Oh? I wanted some extra practice with abstract terms and adjectives, she said, meeting his eyes coolly. Okay, sure, Cardas said hastily. I was just wondering. She held his gaze a fraction of a second longer, then turned back to Thrawn. May I ask which piece you've chosen? Certainly not, he admonished her with a smile. You'll have to deduce that from my description. Oh, she said, sounding momentarily nonplussed. She glanced at Cardas, then set her jaw firmly. All right. I'm ready. Thrawn's eyes seemed to defocus as he gazed across the room. The changing of colors is like a rainbow's edge melding into a sunlit waterfall. Cardas listened to the melodious flow of Chun words, struggling to keep up as he studied Maris out of the corner of his eye. She was struggling a little, too, he could see, her lips occasionally moving as she worked through some of the more complex terms. But behind the concentration he thought he could S.E.C. something else in her eyes as she looked at Thrawn. Only it wasn't the kind of look a language student should be giving her teacher. It most certainly wasn't the look a captive should be giving her captor. An unpleasant sensation began to drift into his gut. She couldn't actually be falling for Thrawn, could she? Surely she wouldn't let herself be drawn in by his intelligence and courtesy and sophistication. Because she wasn't just Kento's partner and co-pilot, after all. And while Cardas had never seen Kento in a fit of jealousy, he was pretty sure he didn't want to. With a deep sense of disconnection and strife between the artist and his people. Beautiful, Maris murmured, her eyes shining even more as she gazed at Thrawn. That was the flat with the carved edging, wasn't it? The landscape with the darkness growing upward from the lower corner? Correct, Thrawn confirmed. He looked at Cardas. Were you also able to identify it? I know, Cardas admitted. I was mostly concentrating on understanding the words. One can concentrate so closely on the words of a sentence that one thereby misses the meaning, Thrawn pointed out. As can happen in any area of life. You must never lose focus on the larger landscape. He looked over at a series of lights on the wall above the door and stood up. Today's lesson is over. I must see to my guest. Guest? Maris asked as she and Cardas also stood up. An admiral of the Chis defense fleet is on her way to take possession of the Vigari vessel, Thrawn said as they all headed to the door. Nothing you need concern yourselves with. May we observe the welcoming ceremony with you? Cardas asked. This time we should be able to understand what's being said. I believe that will be permissible, Thrawn said. Admiral Aarlani will certainly have heard of your presence from Aristocra Chafor and Bentrano, and will want to see you for herself. Are they both from the same family? Maris asked. Thrawn shook his head. Senior officers of the defense fleet belong to no family, he said. They're stripped of family name and privilege and made part of the defense hierarchy in order that they may serve all chis without deference or prejudice. So military command is merit-based, and not something that comes from family connections? Maris asked. Exactly, Thrawn confirmed. Officers are taken into the hierarchy once they've proven themselves, just as the ruling families themselves select merit adoptives. What are merit adoptives? Cardas asked. Chis broaden from outside a family's bloodlines to enrich or diversify or invigorate, Thrawn told him. All warriors are made merit adoptives when they're accepted into either the defense fleet or the expansionary fleet. He tapped the burgundy patch on his shoulder. That's why every warrior wears the color of one of the families. Which one is yours? 
Maris asked. The eighth, Thrawn said. My position is actually different from that of most warriors, as I've been named a trial born of the family. Most warriors' positions automatically cease when they leave the military, but mine carries the possibility that I will be deemed worthy and matched permanently to the family. I may even be granted the position of ranking distant, which will tie my descendants and bloodline into that of the family. Sounds complicated, Cardas commented. Sounds smart, Maris countered. The Republic could use a lot more of that, instead of always going with straight bloodlines, or the highest bidder. Hmm, Cardas said noncommittally. This was not the time to get into a discussion about Republic politics. And you said there are nine of these ruling families? There are nine at present, Thrawn said. The number fluctuates with events and political fortunes. At various times over the centuries there have been as many as twelve and as few as three. They reached the welcoming chamber to find it had already been configured for the new arrival. The wall and ceiling hangings were totally different from those featured for Aristocra Chafor and Bentrano's arrival, and to Cardassa's eye the arrangement seemed less elaborate. Perhaps even a senior military officer didn't rank as highly as a distant relative of one of the ruling families. The ceremony will be considerably shorter and less formal than the last one you witnessed, Throne said as he gestured them into positions flanking him but two paces back. You should be able to follow. He seemed to consider, then favored them with a small smile. The admiral's appearance may surprise you a bit, as well, he added. I'll look forward to hearing your thoughts later. He turned toward the door and nodded to one of the warriors. With a melodious chiming that reminded Cardas of a water carillon, the door slid open and four black-clad chis warriors came through, taking up flanking positions on either side. Wondering what Thrawn had meant by their guest's appearance. Cardas straightened into his best approximation of military attention as a tall female chis stepped into view. Only instead of the normal black uniform, she was dressed from collar to boots in dazzling white. Cardas blinked in surprise as she strode past her escort into the welcoming chamber. Every chis warrior he'd seen up to now had invariably worn black, except for the clearly family-based guards who had accompanied Chafor and Bintrano. Was it because she was connected to the defense fleet instead of the expansionary fleet? The admiral stepped to the center of the room and stopped. In the name of all who serve the Chiss, I greet you, Admiral Arlani. Thrawn intoned, taking a step toward her. I accept your greeting, and greet you in return, Commander Mithran Urodo, the admiral responded. Her words were to Thrawn but Cardas could tell that her eyes were on the two humans standing behind him. Do you guarantee my safety and the safety of my crew? I guarantee your safety with my life and the lives of those of my command, Thrawn said, bowing his head low. Enter in peace and with trust. Aralani bowed in return. Who are these who stand behind you? She asked, her tone subtly changed. And with that, apparently, the ceremony was over. Visitors from a distant world, Thrawn told her, half turning to gesture them forward. Cardas and Ferrisai, may I present Admiral Arlani? We are honored, Admiral, Cardas said in Chun, trying to duplicate the bow he'd just seen Thrawn make. Arlani seemed to draw back. Aristaka Chafor Rambintrano didn't tell me they spoke Chun she said, an unpleasant edge to her tone. Aristocra Chafor Embintrano didn't know, Thrawn countered politely. He spent little time here, and showed no interest in learning about my guests. Eorolani's eyes flicked to him, came back to Cardas. The report said there were three of them. The third is otherwise occupied, Thrawn said. I can summon him if you wish. Aralani lifted her eyebrows. 
He is allowed to roam freely through an installation of the Chiss expansionary fleet? Thrawn shook his head. All three are under constant surveillance. You are studying them, then? Of course, Thrawn said, as if that was obvious. Cardas suppressed a grimace. He'd known from the start that this was one of Thrawn's reasons for keeping him and the others around. But it was nevertheless a little discomforting to hear it stated aloud. And what have you learned? Aarilani asked. A great deal, Thrawn assured her. But this is neither the time nor the place to discuss it. Aarilani's eyes flicked to Thrawn's warriors, still standing at attention against the welcoming chamber walls. Agreed, she said. I presume you'll wish to tour the captured vessel before you take it in tow, Thrawn went on. I have a shuttle waiting. Good, Aarilani said, reaching to her belt and touching the smoothly curved shape of a Chiss comm link fastened there. Let me summon my passenger and we'll go. Thrawn's eaves narrowed, and for the first time Cardas sensed a flicker of surprise in his face. No passengers were mentioned. His presence is not officially sanctioned by the defense fleet, Aarilani said. I brought him here as a favor to the Eighth Ruling Family. Behind her, a young Chiss male stepped into view, his short robe and tall boots composed of a patchwork pattern of gray and burgundy, a slight smile on his face. Thrawn stiffened. Thras! He breathed. He stepped toward the other as he entered the chamber, meeting him halfway. Reaching out his right hand, he grasped the other's right arm at the elbow as the other gripped his in return. Welcome, he said, smiling. This is a surprise indeed. An achievement I have rarely achieved, the other said, inclining his head. He was still smiling but Cardas could see hints of tension lines around his eyes as his gaze shifted over Thrawn's shoulder. Thrawn obviously noticed the shift. My guess, he said, releasing the other's arm and gesturing at the humans. Cardas and Ferrisai, Krellin traitors from the Galactic Republic. Aristaka Chafor and Bintrano's description didn't do them justice. Thras commented, looking them up and down. Particularly the clothing. Their regular shipments of style design from Scylla must have been delayed, Thrawn said drilly. Cardas and Ferrisai, this is Syndic Ivlith Ras Safis of the Eighth Ruling Family. He smiled a little wider. My brother. Your brother? Maris breathed. And they speak Chun? Mithras Safi said, his tone darkening a little. After a fashion, Thrawn said. Admiral Aarlani and I were on our way to visit the captured pirate vessel. Would you care to accompany us? That's the main reason I'm here, Mithras Safi said. The main reason? Thrawn asked. The other's lip twitched. There are others. I see, Thrawn said. But we'll speak of them later. If you'll come this way, Admiral. For the most part, the trip around the side of the asteroid was made in silence. Thrawn occasionally mentioned something technical in the pirate ship's design as they approached but neither the Admiral nor Mithras Safi seemed interested enough to respond with anything more than grunted monosyllabic comments or an occasional question. The Admiral's escort, as befit proper warriors, said nothing at all. Once or twice along the way Cardas noticed Mithras Safi's frowning at him and Maris, as if wondering why Thrawn had brought Nanchis along for the ride. But he never asked for an explanation and Thrawn never offered one. The alien bodies had long since been removed from the ship. But there were many other details and deductions that Thrawn was able to point out as the group passed down the corridors. 
Everything from the probable physical characteristics of no fewer than three different species of Vagari slaves all the way to the equipment their masters had probably permitted them to use. Cardas hadn't heard any of this analysis and listened in fascination to the commander's monologue. Again, Arlani and Mithras Safis absorbed the information in silence. Until, that is, they reached the treasure room. Ah, there you are. Kento's deep voice boomed from one of the back corners, waving with one hand as he clutched what looked like an ancient decorated battle shield with the other. What's this alien doing here? A.R. Alani demanded. He's helping catalog the items for me, Thrawn replied. Some of the systems plundered by the Vigari are in Republic territory, and he has some knowledge of their origin and value. What did he say? Kento called, looking at Maris. She looked questioningly at Thrawn. Inside Bisti, if you please, the commander said, switching to that language. We don't want to leave the Admiral and Syndic out of the conversation. Yes, commander. She turned back to Kento and translated Thrawn's last comment. Oh, I'm helping catalog, all right. Kento said, eyeing the newcomers suspiciously. I'm also picking out the items I'll be taking home with me. What items are these? Aralani asked in Chun, her glowing eyes narrowing. Commander? Inside Bisti, if you please, Admiral, Thrawn reminded her. This is not an interspecies conversation circle. Aralani countered tartly, ignoring the request. What exactly have you promised these aliens? They're merchants and traders, Thrawn reminded her, his own voice going a little stiff. I've offered them some of the items as compensation for their weeks of service. What service? Aarlani demanded, shifting her glare to Cardas and Maris and then to Kento. You've provided them with food and living quarters. Taught them Chun and for this they deserve compensation? We're also teaching the commander our language, Maris offered. You will not speak to an admiral of the Chiss unless first spoken to, Aralani told her brusquely. Maris reddened. My apologies. There's plenty here for both our visitors and the Ascendancy, Thrawn said. If you'll come this way, there are some details of the engine room I'd like to show you. He took a step toward the door. A moment, Aralani said, her eaves back on Kento and the shield he was still defiantly gripping. Who will decide which items your humans will be permitted to take? My intent was to leave that decision largely to Captain Kento, Thrawn said. He's been working on this inventory for some weeks now and has an extensive knowledge of the contents. I can provide you with a copy of the complete listing before you leave. A listing of what's in here now? Aralani asked. Or a listing of what was here before he removed his chosen items? Both lists will be available, Thrawn assured her, taking another step toward the door and my spot checks have shown the lists and descriptions are accurate enough. At any rate, you'll have time on the voyage home to examine both the lists and the treasures themselves. Or I could examine them right now, Aralani said, gesturing to one of her two warriors. You get the listing. I think, Commander, that I'd prefer to take my own inventory. As you wish, Admiral, Thrawn said. Unfortunately, I'll be unable to assist you in that task. There are administrative matters that require my attention. I can make do without your assistance, Aralani said. From the tone of her voice, Cardas had the feeling that she would just as soon not have him looking over her shoulder. Make sure I have a shuttle with which to return to my ship when I'm finished. Her eyes flicked to Thrawn's brother. And I think it would be wise if Syndic Mithras Safis remained with me. 
with the syndic's permission, of course. I have no objections, Mithras Safis assured her. To Kardasa's eye, his face looked a bit troubled. Then I'll look forward to conversing again with you at your convenience, Thrawn said. Catching Kardasa's eye, he nodded toward the door. They were twenty meters down the corridor before Kardas dared to speak. You don't really have any administrative work to deal with, do you? He asked Thrawn, keeping his voice low. You just wanted to get away from the Anmaro for a while. A harsh accusation, Thrawn said mildly. You'll tarnish Pharisai's high opinion of me. Pharisai's dash? Kardas looked behind him, to discover that Maris had indeed followed them out of the treasure room. Oh. Hi, he said lamely. I think you missed the point, George, she said. Commander Thrawn didn't duck out on the Admiral. He maneuvered her into deciding on her own to stay behind. What leads you to that conclusion? Thrawn asked. The fact that this is the first I've heard about Rack spending weeks taking inventory of the treasure, she said. He would certainly have mentioned something like that to me. Yet he didn't deny it, Thrawn pointed out. Because that part of the conversation was in tune, Kardas said, finally catching on. Which he doesn't understand. Excellent, Thrawn said, nodding. Both of you. So what exactly is going on? Maris asked. They rounded a corner, and Thrawn abruptly picked up his pace. I've had a report of another Vigari attack, this one's still in progress, he said. I'm going to take a look. How far away is it? Kardas asked. I mean, the treasure room's not going to hold their attention that long. It's approximately six standard hours away, Thrawn said. And I fully expect Admiral Aarlani to deliver a severe reprimand when I return, assuming she delays her departure until then. For now, though, all I need is for her to be distracted long enough for us to slip away. Cardassa's stomach tightened. You're not just going there to observe, are you? The purpose of the trip is to evaluate the situation, Thrawn said evenly. But if I judge there's a reasonable chance of eliminating this threat to the Chiss ascendancy. He left the sentence unfinished, but there was no doubt as to his intentions. He was going to attack. And from the way he pulled Kardas out of the treasure room, it was clear he expected his language tutor to come along for the ride. Kardas took a deep breath. He'd already been through more space battles than he liked, and going up against a fully armed Vigari raiding party was not something he really wanted to do. But maybe there was still a chance of gracefully backing out. I'm sure you'll do whatever is right, he said diplomatically. Good luck, and Dash. May I go with you? Maris interrupted him. Cardas threw her a startled look. Her eyes flicked to his, a hard-edged warning in her expression. It might be good to have a witness along. She continued. Especially someone who has no connection to any of the ruling families. I agree, Thrawn said. That's why I'm taking Cardas. Cardas winced. So much for a graceful exit. Commander, I appreciate the offer dash. Two witnesses would be better, Maris said. Actually, Kento would be a better choice than either Maris or me. Cardas tried again. He's the one dash. In theory, yes, Thrawn agreed, his eyes on Maris. But no matter how carefully planned or executed, a battle always entails risks. He's the one who really likes this kind of excitement dash. So does flying with Rack, Maris countered. I'm willing to take my chances. 
I could go get him out of the treasure room dash. I'm not sure I am, Thrawn countered in the same tone. Should you be injured or killed, I wouldn't want to be the one to bring that news to your captain. If we're on the bridge together you won't have to, Maris pointed out. If I die, you probably will, too, and someone else would get stuck with that job. She jerked a thumb at Cardas. It sounds like George would rather stay behind anyway. He can do it. Forget it, Cardas said firmly, his mind suddenly made up for him. He'd seen Thrawn's combat abilities, and he'd seen Kento's temper, and he knew which one sounded safer. If Maris goes, we both go. I'm honored by your trust, Thrawn said as they reached the shuttle bay. Come then. May warrior's fortune smile on our efforts. 11. One minute to break out. The helmsman called. Acknowledged, Thrawn replied. Warriors stand ready. Standing behind the commander's chair, Cardas stole a look at Maris. Her face looked a little pale above the wide collar of her vac suit, but her eyes were clear and her jaw firmly set. Probably looking forward to Thrawn being all noble and honorable, he thought sourly. Waiting for him to bolster her already stratospheric opinion of him. Women. So what in blazes was he doing here? If the reports are accurate, we'll arrive in a safe area a short way beyond the outer edge of the battle zone, Thrawn said, his eyes dropping to the helmets gripped in their hands. Still, it would be wise for you to have your helmets already in place. We can get them on fast enough if we need to, Maris assured him. Thrawn hesitated, then nodded. Very well. Then stand ready. He swiveled back to face forward. Cardas watched the countdown timer, his mouth feeling uncomfortably dry, and as it hit zero the starlings appeared out of the hyperspace sky and collapsed into stars. And through the canopy he found himself staring at the most horrific sight he'd ever witnessed. It wasn't the simple pirate attack he'd expected, with three or four Vigari marauders preying on a freighter or starliner. Stretched out before them, writhing against the backdrop of a cloud-flecked blue-green world, were at least two hundred ships of various sizes locked in battle, linked together in twos or threes or groups by savage exchanges of laser and missile fire. In the distance, on the far side of the planet, he could see the glittering points of a hundred more ships, silently waiting their turn. And through the swirling combat drifted the debris and bodies and dead hulks of perhaps twenty more ships. This wasn't a pirate attack. This was a war. Interesting, Thrawn murmured. I seem to have miscalculated. No kidding, Cardas said, the words coming out like an amphibian's croak. He wanted to tear his eyes away from the carnage, but found himself unable to do so. Let's get out of here before someone sees us. No, you misunderstand, Thrawn said. I knew the battle would be of this scale. What I hadn't realized was the Vigari's true nature. He pointed through the canopy at the distant cluster of ships. You see those other vessels? The ones waiting their turn to fight? They're not here to fight, Thrawn corrected him. Those are the civilians. Civilians? Cardas peered out at the distant points of light. How can you tell? By the way they're grouped in defensive posture, with true war vessels set in screening positions around them, Thrawn said. The error I spoke of was that the Vigari aren't simply a strong, well-organized pirate force. They're a completely nomadic species. Is that a problem? Maris asked. She was gazing calmly at the panorama. Cardos noted with a touch of resentment, almost as calmly as she'd faced the piles of bodies aboard the Vigari treasure ship. Very much so, Thrawn told her, his voice grim. Because it implies in turn that all their construction, support, 
and maintenance facilities are completely mobile. So? Cardas asked. So it will do us no good to capture one of the attackers and use its navigational system to locate their homeworld, Thrawn said patiently. There is no homeworld, he gestured out at the battle. Unless we can destroy all of their war vessels at once, they will simply melt away into the vastness of interstellar space and regroup. Cardas looked at Maris, feeling a fresh wave of tension ripple through him. A bare handful of ships at his disposal, and he was talking about destroying an entire alien war machine? Ah, uh, Commander. Calm yourself, Cardas, Thrawn said soothingly. I don't propose to destroy them here and now. Interesting. He pointed out into the melee. Those two damaged defenders, the ones trying to escape. You see them? No. Cardas said, looking around. As far as he could tell, no part of the battle area looked any different from any other part. Over there, Maris said. Pulling him close to her, she stretched out her arm for him to sight along. Those two ships heading to starboard with a triangle of fighters behind them. Okay, right, Cardas said as he finally spotted them. What about them? Why haven't they jumped to hyperspace? Thrawn asked. Their engines and hyperdrives appear intact. Maybe they feel it would be dishonorable to abandon their world, Maris suggested. Then why run at all? Cardas said, frowning at the scenario. The fighters were rapidly closing and the escapers were already far enough outside the planet's gravitational field to make the jump to light speed. There was no reason he could see how further delay would gain them anything. Cardas is correct, Thrawn said. I wonder. Th Abruptly, with a flicker of pseudo-motion, the lead ship had made the jump to safety. A moment later, the second also flickered and vanished. I don't get it, Cardas said, frowning as the pursuing fighters broke off and curved back toward the main part of the battle. What were they waiting for? Clearance? In a sense, yes, Thrawn said. Clearance from the laws of physics but they were already clear of the planet's gravity field. From the planet's field, yes, Thrawn said. But not from the Vigaris. He looked up at them again, a glitter in his glowing eyes. It appears the Vigari have learned how to create a pseudograph field. Cardas felt his jaw drop. I didn't even know that was possible. The theory's been around for years. Maris said, her voice suddenly thoughtful. We used to talk about it at school. But it's always required too much energy and too big a generator configuration to be practical. It would seem the Vigari have solved both problems, Thrawn said. Cardas gave him a sideways look. There was something in the commander's voice and expression that he didn't care for at all. And this means what to us? He asked cautiously. Thrawn gestured at the canopy. The Vigari are obviously using it to keep their prey from escaping until they can be obliterated. I think perhaps I could find more interesting uses for such a device. Cardas felt his stomach tighten. No. Oh no. You wouldn't. Why not? Thrawn countered his eaves sweeping methodically across the battle scene. Their main attention is clearly elsewhere, and whatever defenses they have around their gravity projectors will be arrayed against a possible sortie from their victims. You assume. I saw how they defended their treasure ship, Thrawn reminded him. I believe I have a good sense for their tactics. 
which translated meant that Cardas had zero chance of talking him out of this lunatic scheme. Maris? Don't look at me, she said. Besides, he's right. If we want to grab a projector, this is the time to do it. Something cold settled into the pit of Cardas's stomach. We? Was Maris starting to actually identify herself with these aliens? There, Thrawn said abruptly, pointing. That large spherical grid work. I see it, Cardas said with a sigh of resignation. The sphere was near the chiss edge of the battle, where they could get to it without hanging to charge halfway through the fighting. There were three large warships hovering protectively between it and the main combat area, but only a handful of Vigari fighters actually within combat range of it. A tempting, practically undefended target. Of course Thrawn was going to go for it. I'd just like to remind everyone that all we have is the Springhawk and six heavy fighters, he pointed out. And Commander Mithran Urodo, Maris murmured. Thrawn inclined his head to her, then swiveled around toward the port side of the bridge. Tactical analysis? We've located five more of the projectors, Commander, the Chiss at the sensor station reported. All are at the edges of the battle area, all more or less equally well defended. Analysis of the projector layout and the jump pattern of the escaped vessels indicates the gravity shadow is roughly cone-shaped. Another added. Are the three defending war vessels within the cone? Thrawn asked. Yes, sir. The Chiss touched a key and an overlay appeared on the canopy, showing a wide, pale blue cone stretching outward from the gridwork sphere into the battle zone. As you see, the three main defenders are inside the cone, which limits their options. Thrawn pointed out to Cardas and Maris and all three vessels are positioned with their main drives pointing toward the projector. Years of success with this technique has apparently made them overconfident. Though those clothes and fighters are dipping in and out of the cone, Cardas pointed out. They won't be a problem, Thrawn said. Does the projector itself appear collapsible? Unable to obtain design details at this distance without using active sensors, the Chiss at the sensor station reported. Then we'll need a closer look, Thrawn concluded. Signal the fighters to prepare for combat. Hyperspace course setting of 004 by 057. Hyperspace setting? Cardas echoed, frowning. Back at their first tangle with the Vigari, Thrawn had successfully pulled off a fractional minute micro jump but their target sphere was way too close for that trick to work now. And then, beside him, he heard Maris's sudden chuckle. Brilliant, she murmured. What's brilliant? Cardas demanded. The course setting, she said, pointing. He's sending them to the edge of the gravity cone, the edge right by the projector. Ah, Cardas said, grimacing. Of course there was no need for an impossibly short micro-jump here. The fighters could head into hyperspace as if they intended to make it their permanent home, relying on the field itself to snap them out again at precisely the spot where Thrawn wanted them. Once in place, they're to clear out the enemy fighters and create a defensive perimeter between the projector and the war vessels, Thrawn continued. The Springhawk will follow an attempt to retrieve the sphere. Cardas squeezed his hands into fists. Very straightforward. Unless they missed the edge of the cone they were aiming for and got pulled out somewhere in the middle of the battle instead. Or unless such a short jump fried all their hyperdrives, which would lead to the same result. Assault teams 1 and 2 are to prepare for outhaul operation, Thrawn said. There will most likely be an operational crew aboard the projector, there to locate and neutralize with minimal damage to the projector itself. They'll be joined by Chief Engineer Yalavikema and three of his crew, 
who will either find a way to collapse the projector to a size we can take aboard or else attach it as is to our hull for transport. All groups are to signal when ready. The minutes crept by. Cardas watched the battle, wincing at each defender that flared and died under the merciless assault, and wondering how long Thrawn's own luck would hold out. Certainly the Chiss ships had proved their exceptional stealth capabilities back when they'd sneaked up on both the Bargain Hunter and Praga's ship. But even so, sooner or later someone on the Vigari side was bound to notice them sitting quietly out here. Fortunately, Thrawn's crew also recognized the need for haste. Three minutes later, the fighters and assault teams had all signaled their readiness. Stand by, fighters! Thrawn said, his eyes on the battle. Fighters attack. Now. In the distance there was a flicker of pseudo-motion, and the six Chiss fighters appeared in a loose line just off the projector's starboard side. Helm prepared to follow. Thrawn had called the enemy's defense setup overconfident, but there was nothing sloppy about their response to this unexpected threat. Even as the Chiss fighters swung into their attack the Vigari ships began to spread out, trying to deprive the intruders of clustered targets as they returned fire with lasers and missiles. Unfortunately for them, their attacker's commander had already seen Vigari fighter tactics in action. The enemy ships got off perhaps two shots each before the Chiss settled into their own counterattack and the Vigari fighters began exploding. Less than a minute after their sudden arrival, the Chiss held the field alone. Alone, but not unnoticed. In the near distance, the three larger warships were beginning to respond, their aft batteries opening fire as they began ponderously turning around. Fighters, take defensive positions, Thrawn ordered. Helm, go. Cardas set his teeth. The stars began their usual stretch into Starlene's. Then with a horrible-sounding thud from somewhere aft, the stars were back. Assault 1 to projector's starboard side, Thrawn called. Assault 2 to port. Chief Yalavikima, you have five minutes. Question is, do we have five minutes? Cardas muttered, eyeing the shots starting to sizzle past the Springhawk's canopy. I think so, Thrawn said. They'll need to be much closer before they can attack in earnest. Otherwise, they risk overshooting us and destroying their own projector. So? Cardas countered. Isn't that what they probably think we're trying to do to it? Actually, I suspect they're rather confused about our intentions at the moment, Thrawn said. An attacker whose sole purpose was destruction would hardly have had to move in this close. He gestured toward the battle. But whatever they perceive our plan to be, they still must allow the projector to remain functional as long as possible. Once the gravity shadow vanishes, the defenders inside its cone will be free to escape and possibly regroup. They thus cannot risk overshooting us and must come in closer. Cardas grimaced. Certainly the logic made sense. But that was no guarantee the Vigari wouldn't do something stupid or panicky instead. The enemy warships had made it halfway around now, allowing them to bring their flank laser batteries into play. Still, so far they did seem to be concentrating most of their fire on the Chiss fighters arrayed against them. And then as the light of the distant sun played across the warships. Sides, Cardas spotted something he hadn't noticed before. Hey, look! He said, pointing. They have the same bubbles all over their hulls that we saw on the treasure ship. Get me a close-up, Thrawn ordered, his eyes narrowing. On the main monitor display the running series of tactical data vanished and was replaced by a hazy telescopic view of the bubble pattern. Cardas felt his throat suddenly tighten as, beside him, he heard Maris's sharp intake of breath. Oh no, she whispered. 
The bubbles weren't observation ports, as Kento had once speculated. Nor were they navigational sensors. They were prisons. Each one contained a living alien being, all of them of the same species as the mangled bodies Cardas could see floating among the battle debris. Some of the hostages were cowering against the walls of their cells, while others had curled up with their backs to the plastic, while still others gazed out at the battle with the dull resignation of those who have already given up hope. Even as they watched, a stray missile exploded a glancing blow at the edge of the telescope display's view. When the flash and debris cleared away, Cardas saw that three of the bubbles had been shattered, their inhabitants blown into space or turned into unrecognizable shreds of torn flesh. The metal behind the broken bubbles, clearly the main hull, was dented in places but appeared to be intact. Living shields? Thrawn murmured, his voice as cold and as deadly as Cardas had ever heard it. Can your fighters use their Connor nets? Cardas asked urgently. You know those things you used on us? They're still too far away, Thrawn said. At any rate, shock nets would be of little use against the electronic compartmentalization of war vessels that size. Can't they shoot between the bubbles? Maris asked, her voice starting to shake. There's room there. Can't they blast the hull without hitting the prisoners? Again, not at their distance, Thrawn said. I'm sorry. Then you have to call them back, Maris insisted. If they keep firing, they'll be killing innocent people. Those people are already dead, Thrawn replied, his voice suddenly harsh. Maris flinched back from his unexpected anger. But Dash, please... Thrawn said, holding up a hand. His voice was calm again, but there was still an undercurrent of anger simmering beneath it. Understand the reality of the situation. The Vigari have killed them, all of them, if not in this battle then in battles to come. There's nothing we can do to help them. All we can do is focus our resources toward the Vigari's ultimate destruction so that others may live. Cardas took a deep breath. He's right, Maris, he told her, taking her arm. Angrily, she shook it off and turned away. Cardas looked at Thrawn, but the other's attention was already back on the approaching warships and the six Chiss fighters standing in their path. Assault 1 reports Vigari crew has been eliminated one of the crewers called. Chief Yawavikima reports that they've located the projector's collapse points and are folding it for transport. Assault 2 is assisting. Order Assault 1 to assist, as well, Thrawn said. I thought there would be some sort of quick set arrangement, he added to Cardas. The Vigari wouldn't want to hold position for hours as they assembled their gravity projectors in full view of their intended victims. He looked back at the Vigari warships, their turns now nearly completed, and his mouth briefly tightened. Stand ready to fire on the war vessels. Cardas looked at Maris, but her back was to him, her shoulders hunched rigidly beneath her vac suit. Weapons ready. Fire full missile bursts on my command, Thrawn said. His eyes flicked to Maris Dash, and instruct the fighters to fire shock nets at the war vessel's bridge in command sections at the moment of minimum visibility. Acknowledged. Fire missiles, Thrawn ordered. Chief Yalavikima, you now have two minutes. Chief Irolavikima acknowledges and estimates the projector will be collapsed on schedule. Across by the distant warships, there were multiple flashes of light as the Chiss missiles struck. Helmets! Someone barked. Cardas reacted instantly, 
snatching up his helmet and throwing it over his head, peripherally aware that everyone on the bridge was doing the same. He had locked the helmet onto its collar and was looking for the source of the threat when there was a sudden burst of light and fire and the port side section of the canopy disintegrated. Through the deck he felt the thud of airtight doors slamming shut, and for a fraction of a second he heard the wail of warning alarms before the sudden decompression robbed them of any conducting medium. Blinking against the dark purple afterimage of the flash, he peered through the still swirling debris at the impact point. It was as bad as he'd feared. The three Chiss who'd been closest to the blast were lying twisted and crumpled on the deck. Other Chiss had also been thrown from their chairs, though most of them appeared to still be alive. Here and there he could see crewers struggling with torn suits or cracked helmets as they or fellow crewers fastened emergency patches in place. The control boards in the area of the blast had been turned into mangled, sharp-edged twistings of metal and tangled wiring, while elsewhere the rest of the panels appeared dead. He was still assessing the damage when Maris suddenly shoved past him, nearly knocking him off his feet, and dropped to her knees beside the command chair. It was only then that he saw that Thrawn, too, was lying on the deck, his glowing eyes closed, a violently fluttering tear in the chest of his vac suit leaking away his air. Commander! He snapped, dropping to the deck beside Maris and fumbling in his suit pocket for a sealant patch. Medic! I've got one, Maris said, a patch already in hand. Ripping off the protective backing, she slapped it against the torn fabric. For a moment it bulged with the remaining air pressure from inside the suit, and then, to Cardassa's horror, one edge began to come loose. It won't bond to this material. Maris bit out, glancing around her. Help me find something to hold it. Frantically, Cardas looked around. But there was nothing. He looked up at the walls, knowing the Chiss must surely have medbacks scattered around their warships. But he couldn't focus enough of his mind on the Chun lettering to read the markings. Never mind, Maris gritted. She pushed down the edges of the patch again, and then, with just a second of hesitation, she leaned over to lie chest to chest across his torso, pressing her stomach against the wound. Go get help, she ordered, wrapping her arms tightly around Thrawn's back to hold herself in place. Come on, this can't be doing his injuries any good. Breaking free of his paralysis, Cardas turned toward the door. And once again was nearly bowled over as two chis pushed past him dropping to their knees on either side of their unconscious commander and the human lying across him. Prepare to move, one of them snapped, a large patch gripped between his hands. Move. Maris rolled away. Almost before she had cleared the wound area the Chiss had his patch in place, completely covering the one Maris had tried to use. She pushed herself completely away, and Cardas saw thin tendrils of smoke drift up from the edges of the new patch. Seal good, the Chiss confirmed. The second crew was ready, jabbing the hose of a hand-sized air tank into a valve built into the helmet collar. Pressure stabilizing, he reported, peering at a row of indicator lights beside the valve. Can we help? Maris asked. You've already done so, the first just said. We'll handle it from here. They had lifted Thrawn between them and were heading for the airtight door when the stars outside the canopy abruptly flashed into Starlene's. For the first two hours the medics worked behind sealed doors, with no news coming out and only fresh supplies and more injured going in. Cardas hung around the medbay area, trying to stay out of the way occasionally being pressed into service to run errands for the staff. He didn't know at first what had happened to Maris, but from bits of overheard conversation he eventually learned she was helping clear debris from the bridge. They were still four hours from home when the two of them were finally summoned into Medbay. 
They found Thrawn half-lying, half-sitting on a narrow bed inside a set of biosensor rings that wrapped around him from neck to knees like the ribs of a giant snake. Cardas, Ferrisai, he greeted them. His face was drawn, but his voice was clear and calm. I'm told I owe you my life. Thank you? It was mostly Maris, actually, Cardas said, not wanting to accept credit he didn't deserve. She's faster in emergency situations than I am. Comes of spending time with Rack on the Bargain Hunter, Maris said, trying a smile that didn't reach all the way to her eyes. How are you feeling? Not well, but apparently out of danger, Thrawn said, studying her face. I'm also told you've been assisting with the task of clearing the bridge. She shrugged self-consciously. I wanted to help. Even after I launched missiles against the Vigari's living shields? She lowered her eyes. I'm sorry I, well, that I complained about that, she said. I realize you didn't have any choice. Which doesn't necessarily make it easier to accept. Thrawn said. It is, unfortunately, the sort of decision all warriors must make. Did we get the gravity projector, by the way? Cardas asked. I never heard one way or the other. Thrawn nodded. It was collapsed and spark welded to the outside of the hull just before we made our jump. All six of the fighters escaped, as well. Cardas shook his head. We were lucky. We had a good leader, Maris corrected. The Vigari are going to be very unhappy about this. Good, Thrawn said evenly. Perhaps they'll be angry enough to make an overt move against the Chiss ascendancy. Cardas frowned. Are you saving you were trying to goad them into an attack? I was trying to obtain a gravity projector. Thrawn said. Other consequences will be dealt with if and when they occur. Cardas looked sideways at the medics and assistants working on the other casualties. Of course, he murmured. Meanwhile, our focus must be to return to Krusty with all possible speed, Thrawn continued. We need more complete medical assistance for our wounded and to begin repairs to our vessels. And in the meantime, you probably need some more rest, Maris added, touching Cardas's arm and nodding toward the door. We'll see you later, Commander. Yes, Thrawn said, his eyes turning to glowing red slits behind sagging eyelids. And I'm sure you were right, Cardas. I imagine Kento will be sorry he missed all the excitement. They arrived at the base to discover that Kento had far more pressing matters on his mind than missed adventures. I'll kill her, the big man promised blackly as he glared at Maris and Cardas through the slotted plastic door of his cell. I ever get her alone, I swear I'll kill her. Just calm down, Maris soothed, her tone a mixture of patience and understanding. It was a combination she seemed to use a lot with Kento. Tell us what happened. She tried to rob me, that's what happened. Kento bit out. You were both there. Thrawn specifically told us we could pick some of the loot from the pirate ship in payment for language lessons. Right. More or less, Maris agreed cautiously. Unfortunately, Admiral Aralani outranks him. I don't care if she's the local deity. Kento shot back. That stuff I picked out was ours. She had no business trying to take it away. And of course, you told her so, Cardas murmured. I'd watch my mouth if I were you, kid, Kento warned, glaring at him. You may be teacher's pet here, but it's a long way back to civilization. So what happened to your collection? Maris asked. She was going to take all of it with her, Kento said, letting his glare linger on Cardas a couple of seconds longer before turning back to Maris. 
Luckily for me, that other chiss that syndic myth whatever dash. Thrawn's brother, Maris interjected. Kento's eyes widened. No kidding? Anyway, he decided he needed to hear Thrawn's version first, so he made her leave it behind. But then she insisted it be put under prescribed seal, whatever the fizz that means. So bottom line is, Cardas asked. Bottom line is that it's locked away somewhere, Kento growled. And according to Syndic myth whatever, even Thrawn can't get it out. We'll check with him, Maris promised. Incidentally, it's not Syndic myth whatever. It's Syndic myth Thrasophus. Yeah, sure, Kento said. So go talk to Thrawn already. While you're at it, see if you can get me out of here. Sure, Maris said. Come on, George. Let's see if the commander's accepting company. At first the guard outside Thrawn's quarters was reluctant to even inquire as to whether the commander would see them. But Maris eventually persuaded him to ask, and a minute later they were standing at his bedside. Yes, I saw Thras's report he said when Maris had outlined the situation. He still looked weak, but definitely stronger than he had back aboard the Springhawk. Captain Kento needs to learn how to control his temper. Captain Kento needs to learn how to control more that that, Maris said ruefully. But being locked up has never done him any good before, and it's not likely to do anything now. Can you get him released? Yes, if you'll warn him about disrespecting Chiss command officers, Thrawn said. Perhaps we should simply lock him up whenever one is on the base. Wouldn't be a bad idea, Maris agreed. Thank you. What about the items your brother had sealed away? Cardas asked. Kento will be impossible to live with until he gets them back. Then it's time he began developing patience, Thrawn said. A syndic of the Eighth Ruling Family has declared it sealed against a command officer's claim of possession. It cannot be unsealed until Admiral Aarlani returns to present her arguments. When will that be? Cardas asked. Whenever she so chooses but probably not until the Vagari treasure ship has been examined and its systems and equipment analyzed. She'll want to be present for that. But that could take months, Cardas protested. We can't stay here that long. And we can't go back without the extra goods to placate our clients, Maris added. I understand, Thrawn said. But it truly is out of my hands. Behind Cardas, the door slid open. He turned, expecting to see one of the medics. So warrior's fortune has finally failed you, Syndic Mithras Safi said as he strode into the room. Welcome, Thrawn said, beckoning him in. Please come in. We need to speak, Thrawn, Mithras Safi said eyeing Cardas and Maris as he stepped to the other side of his brother's bed. Alone. You need not fear their presence, Thrawn assured him. Nothing said will be repeated outside this room. That's not the point, Mithras Safi said. We have Chis business to discuss, which is none of their concern. Perhaps not now, Thrawn said. But in the future, who knows? Mithras Safi's eyes narrowed. Meaning? Thrawn shook his head. You're gifted in many ways, my brother, he said. But you have yet to develop the farsightedness you will need to survive the intrigues and conflicts of political life, he gestured toward Cardas and Maris. We have been granted a rare opportunity the chance to meet and interact with members of a vast but hitherto unknown political entity, people with insights and thoughts different from our own. 
Is that why you insist on bringing them along even when giving an admiral an official tour? Mithras Safis asked, eyeing Kardas doubtfully. You think their thoughts will be of value? All thoughts are worth listening to, whether later judged to be of value or not, Thrawn said. But equally important are the social and intellectual bonds we are building between us. Someday, our ascendancy and their republic will make contact, and the friends and potential allies we create now may well define what direction that contact will take. He looked at Cardas and Maris in turn. I imagine both of them have already come to that same conclusion, though of course from their own point of view. Cardas looked at Maris. Her slightly twisted lip was all the answer he needed. Yes, actually, we have, he admitted. You see? Thrawn said. Already we understand each other, at least to a small extent. Maybe, Mithras Safi said doubtfully. But you came here with specific business to discuss, Thrawn reminded him. May my guests call you Thras, by the way? Absolutely not, Mithras Safi said stiffly. He looked at Maris, and his expression softened a little. Though I understand you saved my brother's life, he added reluctantly. I was glad I could help, Syndic Mithrasophis, Maris said in Chun. Mithras Safi snorted and looked at Thrawn, and the hint of a wry smile finally touched his lips. They really aren't very good at it, are they? You could try Minisiat, Thrawn offered. They speak that better than they do Chun. Or you could use Sai Bisti, which I believe you also know. Yes, Mithras Safi said, switching to an oddly accented Sai Bisti. If that would be easier. Actually, we prefer you stick with Chun if you don't mind, Kardas said in that language. We could use the practice. That you could, Mithras Safi said. He hesitated, then inclined his head. And since you were both instrumental in saving my brother's life, I suppose it would be all right for you to call me Thras. Maris bowed her head. Thank you. We're honored by your acceptance. I just don't want to keep hearing my name mispronounced. Thras turned back to Thrawn. No, he said, his tone hardening again. What exactly do you think you're doing? The job for which I was commissioned, Thrawn replied. I'm protecting the ascendancy from its enemies. Its enemies, Thras said, leaning on the word. Not potential enemies. Do you hear the difference? Yes, Thrawn said. And no. Thras lifted a hand. Let it slap against his thigh. Let me be honest, Thrawn, he said. The Eighth Ruling Family is not happy with you. They sent you all the way here to tell me that? This isn't a joking matter, Thras spit out. That pirate treasure ship was bad enough. But this last escapade was far and away over all the lines and right under an admiral's nose, too. The Vigari aren't pirates, Thras, Thrawn said, his voice low in earnest. They're a completely nomadic species, hundreds of thousands of them, perhaps millions. And sooner or later, they will reach the Ascendancy's borders. Fine, Thras said. When they do, we'll destroy them. But why wait until then? Thrawn pressed. Why leave our backs turned while millions of other beings are forced to suffer? The philosophical answer is that we don't force anyone to suffer. Thras countered. The practical answer is that we can't defend the entire galaxy. I'm not asking to defend the entire galaxy. Really? And where would you have us stop? Thras gestured toward the wall. Ten light years beyond our borders? 
A hundred? A thousand? I agree we can't protect the entire galaxy, Thrawn said. But it's foolhardy to always permit our enemies to choose the time and place of battle. Thras sighed. Thrawn, you can't continue to push the lines this way. He said. Peaceful watchfulness is the Chiss way, and the nine ruling families won't stand by forever while you ignore basic military doctrine. More to the point, the Eighth Family has made it clear that they'll release you before they permit your actions to damage their standing. We were both born as commoners, Thrawn reminded him. I can live that way again if I have to. His lips tightened briefly. But I'll do what I can to assure that the Eighth Family doesn't release or rematch you on my account. I'm not worried about my own position, Thras said stiffly. I'm trying to keep my brother from throwing away a fine and honorable career for nothing. Thrawn's eyes took on a distant look. If I do throw it away, he said quietly, I guarantee that it won't be for nothing. For a long moment the two brothers gazed at each other in silence. Then Thras sighed. I don't understand you, Thrawn, he said. I'm not sure I ever have. Then just trust me, Thrawn suggested. Thras shook his head. I can trust you only as far as the nine ruling families do, he said. And that trust is strained to the breaking point. This latest incident. He shook his head again. Do you have to tell them? Maris spoke up. With four warriors dead? Thras countered, turning his glowing eyes on her. How do I keep that a secret? It was a reconnaissance mission that got out of hand, Maris said. Commander Thrawn didn't go there with any intention of fighting. Any mission to that region would have been pushing the lines, Thras told her heavily. Still, I can try to frame it in those terms. He looked back at Thrawn. But it may be that nothing I say will make any difference. Action was taken, and deaths ensued. That may be all the ruling families will care about. I know you'll do what you can, Thrawn said. But is what I can do the same as what I should do? Thras asked. It would seem that protecting you from the consequences of self-destructive decisions merely gives you freedom to make more of them. Is that really the best way to serve my brother and my family? I know what my answer would be, Thrawn said. But you must find the answer for yourself. Perhaps someday, Thras said. In the meantime, I have a report to prepare. He gave Thrawn a resigned look. And a brother to protect. You must do what you feel right, Thrawn said. But you don't know these Vigari. I do. And I will defeat them, no matter what the cost. Thras shook his head and went back to the door. There he stopped his hand over the control. Has it ever occurred to you, he said, not turning around, that attacks like yours might actually provoke beings like the Vigari to move against us? That if we simply left them alone, they might never become any threat to the Ascendancy at all? No, I've never had any such thoughts, Thrawn replied evenly. Thras sighed. I didn't think so. Good night, Thrawn. Tapping the control to open the door, he left the room. Twelve. There, Kbea said, pointing through the viewport as their transport came around the curve of Yaga Minor. You see it? Yes, Lorana said as she gazed at the massive object hanging in low orbit over the planet. Six of the brand new dreadnought warships, arranged in a hexagon pattern around a central storage core the whole thing tied together by a series of massive turbolift pylons. It's quite impressive. It's more than just impressive, Kbeoth said gravely. 
Therein lies the future of the galaxy. Lorana stole a furtive glance at him. For the past three weeks, ever since her official elevation from Padawan to full Jedi Knight, Kbeoth had been showing a marked change in attitude. He spoke with her more often and at greater length, asking her opinion on politics and other matters, opening up to her as if to a full equal. It was gratifying, even flattering. But at the same time, it stirred some uncomfortable feelings. Just as he'd expected so much of her as his Padawan, it seemed that he now expected her to suddenly have all the wisdom, experience, and power of a seasoned, experienced Jedi. This trip to Yaga Minor was just one more example. Out of the clear and cloudless sky he'd invited her to come along with him to observe the final stages of preparation. It would have been more fitting, in her opinion, for him to invite Master Yoda or one of the other council members to see him off on his historic journey. But instead he'd chosen her. The crew and families are already aboard, stowing their gear and making final preparations, Kbeoth continued. So are most of the Jedi who'll be accompanying us, though two or three are still on their way. You'll want to meet them all before we leave, of course. Of course. Lorana said automatically, feeling her muscles tense as a horrible thought suddenly occurred to her. When you say we, Master Kbeath, who exactly I mean dash? Don't flounder, Jedi Jinsler, Kbeath reproved her mildly. A Jedi's words, like a Jedi's thoughts, must always be clear and confident. If you have a question, ask it. Yes, Master Kbeath. Lorana braced herself. When you say we? Are you expecting me to come with you on outbound flight? Of course, he said, frowning at her. Why else do you think I recommended your elevation to Jedi knighthood so soon? A familiar tightness wrapped itself around Lorana's chest. I thought it was because I was ready. Obviously you were, Kbeoth said but you still have much to learn. Here, aboard outbound flight, I'll have the necessary time to teach you. But I can't go, Lorana protested, her brain skittering around desperately for something to say. She didn't want to leave the Republic and the galaxy. Certainly not with so much work here to be done. I haven't made any preparations, I haven't asked permission from the Jedi Council Dash. The council has granted me whatever I need, Kbeoth cut in tartly. As for preparations, what sort of preparations does a Jedi need? Lorana clamped her teeth firmly together. How could he have made such a decision without even consulting her? Master Kbeoth, I appreciate your offer. But I'm not sure, Dash. It's not an offer, Jedi Jinsler. Kbeoth interrupted. You're a Jedi now. You go wherever the Council chooses to send you. Anywhere in the Republic, yes, Lorana said. But this is different. Only different in your mind, Kbeoth said firmly. But you're young. You'll grow. He pointed at the approaching collection of ships. Once you see what we've done and meet the other Jedi, you'll be more enthusiastic about the destiny that awaits us. What about this one? Tarkosa asked, tapping his fingers on a rack of negative couplings. Chaz? Just a second, just a second. Yulier growled, scanning the racks already in place as he silently cursed the crowd of tech assistants the Supreme Chancellor's office had sent from Karuskin to help with the loading. For the most part, they'd proven themselves completely useless, dropping delicate components, sorting others into the wrong storage areas, and more often than not doubling up on one rack of spares while the proper set was left buried somewhere in the bowels of the storage core far beneath them. It goes there, he told Tarkosa, pointing to a spot next to a rack of cooling pump parts. What in the worlds? A deep voice said from behind him, 
Yulia turned to see a balding middle-aged man in a plain tan robe standing in the doorway. Who are you? He demanded. Jedi Master Justin Manning, the other said, his forehead creasing as he surveyed the chaos in the room. This equipment should have been stowed two days ago. It was, Yulia said. Very badly. We're trying to fix it. Ah, Manning said, a wryly knowing look on his face. Apparently, he met the Karuskan tech assistants too. Better speed it up. Master Kbayath is arriving today, and he won't be happy if he sees things this way. With a nod, he turned and headed off down the corridor. Like Jedi happiness is our problem. Yulia muttered under his breath at the empty doorway. He turned back to the storage racks, and as he did so, a repeater diagnostic display suddenly flickered on. That got it? A voice called, and a young man popped his head into view through an open floor access panel. Hang on. Yulia stepped to the display and ran through its options list. Looks perfect, he confirmed. Karuskin's tech assistance might be worthless, but the few actual techs who'd come with them were another story completely. Thanks. No problem, the other said, setting his toolbox on the floor beside the panel and pulling himself out. You still having trouble with the repeater in the aft reactor bay? Unless what you just did fixed that one too, Tarkosa said. Probably not, the young man said as he maneuvered the access panel back into place. These things are hooked parallel, but I doubt the circuit extends that far. I'll try to get to it when I get back from D1. Why not do it now? Yulier suggested. D1's all the way over on the far side of the hexagon. Why go all the way there and then have to come all the way back? Because D1's also the command ship, the tech reminded him. Mon gals might look like pushovers, but when Captain Pac Millis says he wants something fixed, he means now. Tarkosa snorted. What's he going to do, bust all of us to civilian? Don't know what he'd do to you, the tech said drilly, but I'd still like to have a job once you fly off into the wild black. It won't take long, I promise. We'll hold you to that, Yolier said. You sure we can't persuade you to come along? You're light years ahead of most of our regular techs. A muscle twitched in the other's cheek. I doubt that, but thanks anyway, he said. I'm not ready to leave civilization just yet. You'd better hope civilization doesn't leave you, Tarkosa warned. The way things are going on Karuskant, I wouldn't bet on it. Maybe, the tech said, picking up his toolbox. See you later. Okay, Yolier said. Thanks again. The other smiled and left the room. Good man, Tarkosa commented. You ever get his name? Yulia shook his head. Dean something, I think. Doesn't matter, it's not like we'll ever see him again after tomorrow. Okay, that rack of shock capacitors goes next to the negative couplings. The entire system can be run from here, Captain Pacmilla said, waving a flippered hand around the vast combined operations center. That means that if there's an emergency or disaster on any of the ships, Countermeasures can be instituted immediately without the need to physically send people to those sites. Impressive, Obi-Wan said, looking around. Situated just aft of the cross corridor behind the bridge-slash-monitor room complex, the comm ops center stretched probably 30 meters aft and filled the entire space between the dreadnought's two main bow corridors. It was currently a hive of activity, with dozens of humans and aliens bustling around and half the access panels and consoles open for last-minute checks or adjustment. What's that thing? 
Anakin asked, pointing to a low console two rows over from where they were standing. It looks like a pod racer control and monitor system. You have sharp eyes, young one, Pac Miller said, his own large eyes rolling toward the boy. Yes, it is. We use it to control our fleet of speeders and swoops. You're joking, Obi-Wan said, frowning at the console. You run swoops through these corridors? Outbound flight is a huge place, Master Kenobi, Pac Miller reminded him. While each dreadnought is linked by the pylon turbolifts to its neighbors in the core, there's still a great deal of travel involved where the turbolifts do not go. Speeders are vital for moving crewers back and forth in both emergency and non-emergency situations. Yes, but swoops? Obi-Wan persisted. Wouldn't a more extensive turbolift system have been safer and more efficient? Certainly, Pac Miller rumbled. Unfortunately, it would also have been more expensive. The original dreadnoughts did not include such a system, and the Senate did not wish to pay the costs of retrofitting. These control systems really are pretty good, though, Anakin assured him. Some of the pod racers on Tatooine use them when they're trying out a new course. There aren't 50,000 people wandering in and out of a pod racing course where they could be run over, Obi-Wan pointed out. But there are plenty of animals on the courses, Anakin countered a little too tartly. You know, like Dubax and Banthas? Anakin Dash, Obi-Wan began warningly. We have already tried the system, Master Kenobi, Pac Miller put in quickly. As Padawan Skywalker said, it works quite well. I'll take your word for it, Obi-Wan said, eyeing Anakin darkly. The boy had developed a bad habit of disrespect lately, especially in public where he perhaps thought that his master would be reluctant to reprimand him. It was partly his age, Obi-Wan knew but even so it was unacceptable. But Anakin also knew just how far he could push it. In response to Obi-Wan's reproving look, he dropped his gaze, his expression indicating at least outward contrition. And with that, this particular incident was apparently over. Making a mental note to have yet another talk with the boy the next time they were alone, Obi-Wan turned back to Pak Milu. I understand you'll be making a short tour through Republic space before you enter the unknown regions. A sort of shakedown cruise, yes, Pac Miller said. We must confirm that our equipment is functioning properly before we go beyond reach of repair facilities. He stepped to a nearby navigational console and touched a key, and a hollow of the galaxy appeared overhead. From here we go to Lana and Droma sector he said, pointing. After that, we'll cut through the edge of Glide Sector to Argai and Haldine Sector. Then we'll travel through Kokash and Mandra Sectors, with a final stop possible in Albanine Sector if it seems necessary. That's a lot of stops, Obi-Wan said. Most will just be flybys, Pak Milu assured him. We won't actually stop unless there are problems. What happens then? Anakin asked. If all goes well, three weeks from now we'll formally enter unknown space, Pac Miller said. At a point approximately 230 light years from the edge of wild space, we'll stop for a final navigational calibration. His mouth tendrils wiggled as he shut down the hollow dash. And we'll then begin our journey in earnest through the unknown regions and to the next galaxy. Anakin whistled softly. How long before you'll get back? Several years at least, Pac Miller told him. But the storage core has supplies enough for ten years, and we expect to be able to supplement its stores of foodstuffs and water along the way. In addition, our numbers may well diminish if we find hospitable worlds to colonize. You're not just going to leave people behind in the unknown regions, are you? Anakin asked, frowning. If we do, it will be with enough food and equipment to get settled. Pac Milo assured him. 
We would also leave one of the dreadnoughts behind for defense and transport. As you can see from outbound flight's design, it will be relatively easy to detach a single ship from the rest of the complex. Anakin shook his head. Still sounds dangerous. We are well prepared, Pak Miller reminded him. And of course, we have 18 Jedi aboard. It will be safe. Or at least as safe as one can be anywhere in these times, Obi-Wan murmured. And it will be a glorious adventure as well, Pak Miller continued, eyeing Anakin. A pity you will not be joining us. There are still a lot of things I want to do here, Anakin said, an unexpected flicker of emotion coloring his voice and sense. He looked sideways at Obi-Wan, and the emotion vanished beneath a more proper Jedi composure. Besides, I can't leave my master until my training is complete. With six Jedi masters aboard you would have several choices of a teacher, Pak Mila pointed out. That's not really how it works, Obi-Wan told him. It amazed him sometimes how people who had no idea whatsoever of the inner workings of Jedi methodology nevertheless had equally few qualms about expressing that ignorance. You said Master Kbeoth will be arriving soon? He is in fact here. Kbeoth's voice boomed from across the room. Obi-Wan turned. There, just entering the room, were Kbeoth and Lorana Jinsler. This is a surprise, Master Kenobi, Kbeoth continued as he strode casually through the bustle of activity. No one actually had to move to let him pass, Obi-Wan noticed but there were quite a few near misses. Fortunately, most of the techs were too preoccupied to even notice his passage. Lorana picked her way through the crowd more carefully, looking distinctly uncomfortable. I thought you'd be on your way back to Silurine by now. I was relieved of that assignment, Obi-Wan said. There's something I need to discuss with you, Master Kbeoth. Kbeoth nodded. Certainly. Go ahead. Obi-Wan braced himself. Between Kbeoth and Anakin, this was likely to be unpleasant. Anakin and I would like to join the expedition. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Anakin turn to him in astonishment. We would? The boy asked. We would, Obi-Wan said firmly at least to the edge of the galaxy. Kbeoth's lip quirked. So Master Yoda finally concedes that I might indeed find Vergir? Who's Vergir? Lorana asked. A missing Jedi, Kbeoth said, his eyes still on Obi-Wan's face. Master Kenobi tried once to find her and failed. There was nothing in the voyage mandate about a search and rescue mission. Pak Miller said, his voice suddenly wary. That's because it's Jedi business, Captain, and none of your concern. Kbeoth told him. Don't worry, it won't interfere with our schedule. He lifted. His eyebrows toward Obi-Wan. I hope you didn't ask to come along in the hope of assuaging any feelings of guilt. I didn't ask to come at all, Obi-Wan said. I simply do as the council directs me. As do we all, Kbeoth said, an edge of irony in his voice as he shifted his eyes to Anakin. What about you, young Skywalker? You seem unhappy with this change in your plans. Obi-Wan held his breath. There were several reasons he hadn't told Anakin in advance about Winda's mandate not the least of them being the fact that the boy still obviously held Kbeoth in high esteem. If he'd told Anakin they were coming to Yaga Minor to keep an eye on the man, he would have pressed for further explanation. It wouldn't have done to disillusion him with Winda's concerns about Kbeoth's possible involvement with the Barlock incident. Fortunately, it was quickly evident that the decision to keep the boy in the dark had been the right one. I'm not unhappy at all, Master Kbeoth, Anakin said with a clear voice and sense of complete honesty. I was just surprised. 
Master Obi-Wan hadn't told me about it. But you do want to come see the unknown regions with me? Anakin hesitated. I don't want to leave the Republic forever, he said. But I was impressed by how you handled things on Balak, ending the deadlock and all. I think I'd learn a lot just by watching you in your daily activities. Kbeya smiled wryly at Obi-Wan. One thing at least you've given the lad, Master Kenobi, a smooth tongue. I would hope I've given him more than that, Obi-Wan said evenly. Still, he's right about how much he could learn from you. He nodded to Lorana. As I'm sure Padawan Jinsler would agree. Indeed, Kbeoth said. And it's Jedi Jinsler now. She was elevated to Jedi knighthood three weeks ago. Really, Obi-Wan said, carefully hiding his surprise. From the way she'd been talking on Barlock, he would have guessed that event to be years in the future. My apologies, Jedi Jinsler, and my congratulations. Do I take it you'll also be traveling aboard outbound flight with Master Kbeath? Of course she will, Kbeath said before Lorana could answer. She's one of the chosen, one of the few among even the Jedi whom I trust completely. You don't trust even Jedi? Anakin asked, sounding surprised. I said I trust her completely, Kbeath told him gravely. Certainly there are others I trust. But only to a degree. Oh, Anakin said, clearly taken aback. Fortunately, you and your instructor are among that somewhat larger group, Kbeath said, a small smile touching his lips. Very well, Master Kenobi. You and your Padawan may accompany me to the edge of the galaxy, provided you make your own arrangements for returning to the Republic. Thank you, Obi-Wan said. The Delta-12 Sky Sprite we'll be using for our return is on the surface, ready to be brought up and loaded aboard. Good, Kbeoth said. You'll stay here aboard Dreadnought 1. Captain, you'll arrange quarters for them. Yes, Master Kbeath, Pak Miller rumbled. I'll have the quartermaster dash. You will arrange quarters for them, Kbeath repeated, a subtle but unmistakable emphasis on the first word. These are Jedi. They will be treated accordingly. Pak Miller's mouth tendrils twitched. Yes, Master Kbeath. He stepped to one of the consoles and tapped at the keys with his flippered hands. And Jedi Jinsler? I've already reserved her quarters near my own, Kbeath told him. Deck 3, Suite A4. Very well, Pak Miller said, peering at the display. Master Kenobi, you and Master Skywalker will have Suite 8 on Deck 5. I trust that will be acceptable. It will. Kbeath said before Obi-Wan could answer. You may now assign someone to escort them to their quarters. From behind them came a sudden crinkling sound of tearing metal. Obi-Wan spun around to see that a large sheet of secondary conductive grid had come loose from the wall and was hanging precariously over a bank of control consoles. He stretched out with the force Seabouth got there first catching the sheet in a force grip even as it came the rest of the way loose. Jedi Jinsler, assist them, he ordered. Yes, Master Kbeath, Lorana said, hurrying off. Captain Pak Milu, you were going to find an escort for our new passengers? Kbeath continued in a conversational tone, even as he continued to hold the grid floating in midair. That won't be necessary. Obi-Wan said. I studied Dreadnought deck plans on the trip here. We can find our own way. Kbeath frowned slightly, and for a second Obi-Wan thought he was going to insist on an escort anyway, as befit proper Jedi treatment. But then the wrinkles smoothed and he nodded. Very well, he said. 
Captain Pak Milu is hosting a first night dinner in the senior officer's wardroom at 7. My fellow Jedi Masters will be there. You'll attend, as well. We'll be honored, Obi-Wan said. And you'll need to stop by the Dreadnought One Med Center, Pak Milla added. The Supreme Chancellor's representative has instructed that all personnel be given a complete examination, including the taking of analysis-grade blood and tissue samples for shipment to Coruscant. Apparently, there's some concern about high viruses or potential epidemics. We'll get ourselves checked out, Obi-Wan promised. Until tonight, then. He nudged Anakin, and together they made their way across the room. Master Kbeoth certainly seems to know what he wants, doesn't he? He commented. Nothing wrong with that, Anakin said firmly. If Master Yoda or Master Windu talked that way to the Chancellor and sent it once in a while, maybe more things would get done. Yes, Obi-Wan murmured. Maybe. The grid was heavy and flexible enough to be difficult to get a grip on. Fortunately, that wasn't a problem for a Jedi. Stretching out with the Force, Lorana lifted it back into position, holding it in place while the text hurriedly worked at its fastenings. Thanks. The Overseer puffed when it was finally secured. Those things are real mean, they're a real pain when they get loose like that. No problem, Lorana assured him. I was glad I could help. Me too, he grunted. Did I hear someone say your name was Jinsler? Yes, she confirmed. Why? Cause we've got a Jinsler on our work team, he said, fumbling out a comm link and punching in a code. Guy named Dean. Relative of yours? I don't know, Lorana said. I was only ten months old when I entered the Jedi Temple. I don't know anything about my family. What, they never came to see you? Families aren't allowed to visit, Lorana told him. Oh, the other said, sounding surprised. A tone sounded, and he lifted the calm link to his lips. Jinsler? Brooks. Where are you? Okay, find a stopping place and hop on over to the mess room. Cause I want to see you, that's why. He keyed off and returned the comm link to his belt. This way, Jedi Jinsler, he said, gesturing toward one of the comm ops center's starboard doors. But I already said I don't know him, Lorana protested as she followed. Yeah, but maybe he'll know you, Brooks said. They stepped through the door into the corridor, and he turned toward the nearest turbo lift. Worth checking out anyway, isn't it? Lorana felt her throat tighten. I suppose. They took the turbo lift three levels down from the command deck and along a narrow corridor to a large table-filled room with a full-length serving counter stretching across one end. A dozen humans and aliens were scattered in twos and threes around the various tables conversing in low tones over multicolored liquids, while three serving droids busied themselves behind the counter. There he is, Brooks said, pointing at a table along the back wall. A lone, dark-haired man sat there, his back to the rest of the room, cradling a steaming mug between his hands. Come on, I'll introduce you. He set off across the room exchanging nods and greetings with some of the others as he passed. Lorana followed, her quiet misgivings growing steadily stronger. And as they got within three meters of the man he half-turned, and she got her first look at his profile. It was the man she'd seen so many times back on Coruscant. She stopped short, her whole body going taut. Brooks didn't notice but continued the rest of the way to the table. Hey, Jinsler, he said, gesturing toward her. Want to introduce you to someone. The young man turned the rest of the way around in his chair. No need, 
he said, his voice steady but edged with an unpleasant mixture of tension and bitterness. Jedi Lorana Jinsler, I presume. With an effort, Lorana found her voice. Yes, she said. The word came out calmer than she had expected it to. Dean Jinsler, I presume. You two know each other? Brooks asked, frowning back and forth between them. Hardly, Jinsler said. She's only my sister. Your dash? Brooks stared at him, then at Lorana. But I thought dash. Thank you, Lorana said, catching his eye and nodding microscopically toward the door. Uh. Yeah. Still staring at them in confusion, Brooks backed away between the tables, his hands groping behind him for obstacles. He reached the door and escaped from the room. I suppose you're going to want to sit down, Jinsler said, an edge of challenge in his voice. Lorana turned her attention back to him. He was gazing up at her with the same bitterness she noted at their other near encounters. His eyes, contrary to her expectations, weren't dark but were instead the same odd shade of gray as hers. Yes, she said, circling to a chair at the far side of the table. Gathering her robes around her, she eased down into it. I suppose I should congratulate you on passing the trials, Jinsler said. You're a real Jedi now. Thank you, Lorana said, searching his face. There was a family resemblance there, she could see. Strange that she'd never noticed it before. You keep up on such things? My parents do. His mouth tightened. Our parents do, he corrected himself. Yes, she murmured. I'm afraid I don't know anything about them. Or about you. No, of course not, he said. But I know everything about you. Everything, from your youngling training, to your apprenticeship to Jorisk Bayath, to your first lightsaber, to your elevation to Jedi knighthood. I'm impressed, Lorana said, trying a hesitant smile. Don't be, he said, not returning the smile. I only know because my parents had a friend who still worked inside the temple. They rammed your every accomplishment down my throat. They loved you, you know. He snorted gently. No. Of course you don't. You never bothered to find out. He dropped his eyes from her face and took a sip from his mug. Lorana gazed at him wincing at the anger and bitterness flowing toward her like the steam from his drink. What had she done to make him so angry? We weren't allowed as Padawans to know anything about our families, she said into the silence. Even now that I'm a Jedi, it's still frowned on. Yeah, he said. Sure. And there are good reasons for it, she continued doggedly. There are many worlds in the Republic where family connections and position are the most important parts of their culture. A Jedi who knew which family she'd come from might find it impossible to deal impartially in any of her people's disputes. Doesn't stop the family from finding you, though, does it? He shot back. Because mine sure did. Even after your precious Jedi got them fired, they still managed to keep tabs on you, Dash. Wait a minute, Lorana interrupted him. What do you mean, they got them fired? Who got them fired? You Jedi have hearing problems? He demanded. I already told you, one of your high and mighty Jedi. Mom and Dad were civilian workers at the temple, handling electronics maintenance and repair in the public areas. They were good at it too. Only after you were taken, they got fired. Your Jedi didn't want them even in the same building with you, I guess. Lorana felt her stomach tighten. She wasn't familiar with this particular incident, though there had been others she'd heard of. 
But it was clear that it would do no good to give her brother the rationale behind the temple's strict isolation policy. Were they able to find other jobs? No, we all starved to death, he retorted. Of course they found other jobs. Lower-paying jobs, of course. Jobs where they had to scramble to get us packed and moved because no one had even bothered to tell them they couldn't stay on at the temple once you were there. But that's not the point. Then what is the point? For a long minute he just stared at her, his turmoil surging like the ocean's edge in a winter storm. You Jedi think you're perfect, he said at last. You think you know what's right for everyone and everything. Well, you're not, and you don't. Lorana felt her throat tighten. What happened to you, Dean? She asked gently. Oh, so now it's Dean, is it? He said scornfully. Now you want to pretend you're my loving big sister? You think you can wave your hand or your precious lightsaber and make it all up to me? Make what up to you? Lorana persisted. Please. I want to know. I thought you Jedi knew everything. Lorana sighed. No, of course not. Well, you never know that by listening to our parents, he bit out. You were the perfect one, the one all the rest of us were measured against. Lorana would have done this. Lorana would have done that. Lorana would have said this. Lorana would never have said that. It was like living with a minor deity. And so completely absurd they couldn't possibly have the slightest idea what you might actually do or say in some situation. You could barely even walk when they sent you away. His eyes hardened even further. But of course, you were away, weren't you? That's what made the whole thing work. You were never around to make mistakes or lose your temper or drop dinner all over the floor. They could set up their little shrine to you without ever having to see anything that might burst the bubble of perfection they built around you. He scooped up his mug, but set it down again without drinking. But I know, he growled, staring into it. I've been watching you. You're not perfect. You're not even close to perfect. Lorana thought back across the wearying years of her training, and Kbaeth's constant criticism. No, she murmured. I'm not. You're not very observant either, he gestured at her. Let me see that fancy weapon of yours. My lightsaber? Frowning, she slid it out of her belt and set it on the table. Yeah, that's the one, he said, making no move to touch it. That's an amethyst, right? Yes she said, focusing on the activation stud. It was a gift from some people Master Kbeath and I helped in one of Karuskin's mid-levels. Jinsler shook his head. No, it was a gift from your parents. They knew the people, and asked them to give it to you. His mouth twisted. And you couldn't even figure that out, could you? No, of course not, Lorena said her frustration with this man and his anger threatening to bubble over into anger of her own. How could I? Because you're a Jedi, he shot back. You're supposed to know everything. I'll bet your master Kbeath knew where it came from. Lorana took a careful breath. What do you want from me, Dean? Hey, you're the one who came looking for me just now, not the other way around he countered. What do you want? For a moment she gazed into his eyes. What did she want from him? I want you to accept what is, she told him. The past is gone. Neither of us can change it. You want me to not change the past? He said scornfully. Yeah, okay, I think I can handle that. I want you to accept that, whatever your feelings about your about our parents, your value isn't defined by their opinions or judgments. She continued, 
ignoring the sarcasm. He snorted. Sorry, but you already said not to change the past, he said. Anything else? She looked him straight in the eye. I want you to stop hating, she said quietly. To stop hating yourself. And to stop hating me. She saw the muscles work briefly in his neck. I don't hate, he said, his voice steady. Hate is an emotion, and Jedi don't have emotions. Right. You're not a Jedi. And that's the real problem, isn't it? He said bitterly. That's what mom and dad wanted, Jedi. And I'm not one, am I? But don't worry, I can still play the game. There is no emotion, there is peace. Jedi serve others rather than ruling over them, for the good of the galaxy. Jedi respect all life, in any form. See? Abruptly, Lorana had had enough. I'm sorry, Dean, she said standing up. I'm sorry for your pain, which I can't heal. I'm sorry for your perceived loss, which I can't give back to you. She forced herself to lock gazes with him. And I'm sorry you're on your way to wasting your life, a decision that only you can change. Nice, he said. The one thing no one can top Jedi at is making speeches. Especially farewell speeches. He raised his eyebrows. That was a farewell speech, wasn't it? Lorana glanced around the room, belatedly remembering where she was. Outbound flight. I haven't made up my mind. He lifted his eyebrows. You actually have a mind? He said. I thought the Jedi Council made all your decisions for you. I hope you'll find your way, Dean, Lorana said, picking up her lightsaber and sliding it back into her belt. I hope you'll find your healing. Well, you can spend the next few years worrying about it, he said. Hurry back. We have so much more to talk about. Sister. Picking up his mug, he shifted around in his seat to put his back to her. Lorana stared at the back of his head, the acid taste of defeat in her mouth. I'll talk to you later, she said. My. Brother. He didn't reply. Blinking back tears, Lorana fled from the room. For a long time, she wandered the maze of corridors, maneuvering mechanically around the texts and droids as she tried to work through the pain darkening her eyes and mind. It was therefore with a certain sense of distant shock that her eyes cleared to show she was back in the Dreadnought's Come Ops Center. Kbeath and Pak Milla were still there holding a discussion over one of the navigation consoles. Ajedai Jinsler, Kbeath said, gesturing her over. I trust your quarters are satisfactory? But you will be joining us, will you not? Pak Milla added in his gravelly voice. I understand there is some confusion on this point. There's no confusion, Kbeath insisted. She is coming with us. Pakmilla's large eyes were steady on her. Jedi Jinsler? He invited. Lorana took a deep breath, her brother's face floating in front of her. The face that from this point on would forever hover at the edges of her life. Master Kbeath is correct, she told the captain. I'll be honored to travel with you aboard outbound flight. And she added bitterly to herself, the sooner they were gone, the better. 13. And the final crew and passenger list. Captain Pakmilla said, handing over the last data card. Thank you, Doriana said, accepting the card and tucking the entire stack away inside his coat. And there's nothing else you need? Nothing that I or 50,000 other people have been able to think of, 
Pac Millis said with typically dry Mon Cal humor. I believe outbound flight is ready to fly. Excellent, Doriana said. Supreme Chancellor Palpatine will be pleased to hear it. We couldn't have done it without his help, Pac Millis said gravely. Please extend our gratitude one final time to him for all his efforts on our behalf. I certainly will, Doriana promised. A final time it would be, too. Then that's that. I'll see you in what? Five years? Ten? However long it takes, Pac Millis said, looking around his dreadnought one. Command Bridge. But we will be back. I'll look forward to your return, Doriana said with all the false sincerity he could conjure up. In the meantime, a safe voyage to you. And don't forget, if you do discover anything else you need, the Supreme Chancellor's office stands ready to assist. You still have three weeks before you leave Republic Space plenty of time for emergency supplies or equipment to be assembled and transported to you. I will remember, Pac Millis said, bowing his head. May I escort you back to your transport? No need, Doriana assured him. I know you must have a hundred matters yet to deal with before you leave Yaga Minor. Fly safely, and may the Force be with you. With nineteen Jedi aboard, I'm sure it will, Pac Millis assured him. Rather, nineteen and a half. Most definitely, Doriana agreed, keeping his smile in place as he frowned behind it. Nineteen Jedi? And a half? Goodbye, Captain. He waited until the pilot had maneuvered the transport out of Dreadnought LS forward hangar bay and had them skimming smoothly across the outer fringes of Yaga Miner's atmosphere before he pulled out Pac Miller's passenger list and plugged it into his data pad. The last Jedi numbers he'd heard had put the total at 17, not 19. Had there been a sudden change in plans? And what in blazes was half a Jedi, anyway? The rumors about how Darth Maul had died flashed unpleasantly to mind. He pulled up the Jedi list and ran his eye down it. The names were very familiar most of them potential troublemakers whom he himself had subtly nudged Kbeath into inviting aboard his grand expedition. The first addition to the list, Lorena Ginsler, wasn't really a surprise. Doriana had always thought it likely that Kbeath's former Padawan would decide to stay with him a while longer. The other two were Obi-Wan Kenobi and his Padawan, Anakin Skywalker. Doriana smiled to himself. So Skywalker was Pac Miller's half Jedi. Cute, and an unexpected bonus for all his hard work, as well. Ever since Kenobi and the boy had nearly scuttled the Barlock operation, he'd had an uncomfortable feeling about the pair. Their deaths aboard outbound flight would be nicely convenient. Outbound flight had disentangled itself from the last of its docking and support equipment now and was making its ponderous way out of Yaga Miner's gravity well toward deep space. A minute later, as Doriana continued to watch through the transport's canopy, it flickered and vanished into hyperspace. He looked back down at his data pad. Still, bonus or not, he'd better check with Sidious and let him know that Kenobi and Skywalker were aboard, just to make sure that fit in with the Sith Lord's plans and he'd better check before outbound flight meandered its way out of the Republic. Forever. The shuttle took him to the Yavatiri spaceport, a few kilometers from the preparation center where all the preliminary work on outbound flight had taken place. Palpatine and the Senate had tried to keep a low profile on the project, perhaps fearing a backlash about all the money they were spending, and for the most part they'd succeeded. In his various official and unofficial travels over the past six weeks, Doriana had found virtually no one who had even heard of it. Still, here at the very center of the project, it could hardly have been ignored. 
But to his mild surprise, he didn't hear a single word about outbound flight's departure as he walked through the spaceport's corridors. True, the work had for the most part moved up to the dreadnoughts themselves four weeks ago, taking the project out of the public's day-to-day -day view. But he still would have expected someone to have raised his head out of the mud long enough to take note of such a historic event. Perhaps in these days of growing political and social turmoil, he mused, even historic events were soon forgotten. In this particular case, it was just as well. He'd left his own ship berth on the far side of the spaceport, in the restricted zone reserved for diplomats and high governmental officials. Passing through security, he headed through the maze of corridors to his docking bay. He keyed open the hatch and went inside, locking it again behind him, then made his way to the cockpit. Seating himself in the pilot's seat, he punched for the tower. This is Kinman Doriana of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine's office. He identified himself when the controller answered. Requesting a lift slot in 30 minutes. Acknowledged, Doriana, the other said. 30-minute lift slot confirmed. Thank you. Shutting off the corm, Doriana keyed for full ship startup, watching the displays closely as the systems began coming online. You are late, Commander Stratus. Doriana gave the displays one more leisurely look. Then, just as leisurely, he turned around. The Nymoidian was wedged half-hidden in the hollow alcove off the cockpit's aft bulkhead, glowering at him from beneath his short, five-cornered hat. Vice Lord S.I.V. Cav, Doriana greeted him. May I say how very uncomfortable you look? Very amusing, Cav growled. Working his shoulders back and forth, he managed to extricate himself and his elaborately layered robes from the alcove. You should have been here an hour ago. Why? Doriana countered calmly. Isn't your fleet ready? Of course it is. An outbound flight only just now left, Doriana said. Plenty of time to set up our ambush. He cocked his head slightly. Or are you simply annoyed that I made you hide there in your little hole longer than you expected? I was not hiding, the Nymoidian insisted stiffly. I simply did not wish to be seen if someone from the spaceport authority came in unexpectedly. You could have accomplished that by waiting in the guest cabin as I'd instructed, Doriana pointed out. But of course, in there you wouldn't have been able to eavesdrop on my clearance request to the tower. Tell me, was the knowledge of my true name and position worth the wait? Cav's large eyes studied his face. We were betrayed once by your master, he said, his voice darkening. Darth Sidious promised that Naboo would be ours, that we would have the foothold we needed there. But the battle turned, and he abandoned us. The reversal of battle was not his fault, Doriana countered. You want to blame someone, blame a Midala. And you have hardly been abandoned. Is Naboo ours then? Cav said sarcastically. I must have missed that fact. Naboo is nothing, Doriana said. The continued existence and functioning of your trade federation is infinitely more valuable. Or did you also miss the fact that it has yet to be punished for its successes? The lack of punishment is not Sidious's doing, Cav insisted. That is the doing of the judiciary at the cost of far too many expensive legal representatives. Doriana smiled thinly. Do you really think the judiciary wouldn't have bowed to Senate pressure by now without someone operating behind the scenes on your behalf? A hint of uncertainty crossed Cav's face. You, he suggested. Doriana shrugged. Lord Sidious has many servants. Yet this particular servant resides in the Supreme Chancellor's office. 
Kev said, gesturing toward him. That must be very useful for him. Doriana let his face harden. Yes, it is, he said softly. And from this point on you will forget you've ever heard that name and that position. Forever. Is that clear? Kev started to sniff in contempt, took another look at Doriana's face. It is clear, Master Stratus, he said instead. Good. Doriana gestured toward the cockpit door. Then if you return to your cabin, I have a ship to fly. You have the fleet's coordinates for me? Yes. Cav's long fingers dipped into a recess of his robe and emerged with a data card. It will take no more than two days to reach them. Good, Doriana said. That should give us time to finalize our attack strategy. I am the one trained in battle tactics, the other said stiffly. The attack strategy will be mine. Of course, Doriana said, suppressing a sigh. I meant only that I'd be available to assist you. Now if you'll return to your cabin, we'll be on our way. The Nymoidian drew himself up and, with his pride at least momentarily appeased, strode from the room. Shaking his head, Doriana crossed to the hollow alcove. Nymoidians if they didn't control one of the best collections of military hardware in the Republic, he would have recommended dumping the whole species down the refresher long ago. He just hoped Sidious was working on finding someone more competent to replace them. Positioning himself in the alcove, he keyed for a hollow net relay. The lights winked on, and he signaled for his master. The wait was longer than usual and more than once he considered taking a quick trip forward to check again on the status boards. But each time he resisted the temptation. If Sidious came on and had to wait, he would not be happy. At last a familiar hooded figure appeared. Report. Outbound flight is on its way, Lord Sidious, Doriana said. I have Vice Lord Cav aboard and we'll be heading for the rendezvous within the hour. Excellent, Sidious said. And you know precisely where in the unknown region's outbound flight will be stopping? Yes, my lord, Doriana said. Captain Pack Miller has two separate navigational checks planned for the first 800 light years beyond Republic space. I have the coordinates of both. Be sure you take the first one. Sidious warned. It may be that Kbeoth in his impatience will order the second to be cancelled. That is indeed my plan, my lord, Doriana confirmed. One final matter. I have Pac Miller's final passenger listing, and three more Jedi have been added. One of them being Lorana Jinsler, no doubt, Sidious said. Bayoth had earlier informed the Senate she would be accompanying him. The drooping corners of his mouth turned briefly upward in a sardonic smile. Though I don't believe he had mentioned it to the woman herself. Yes, she's one of them, Doriana confirmed. The others are Obi-Wan Kenobi and his Padawan, Anakin Skywalker. Sidious's smile vanished. Skywalker? He hissed. Who authorized this? I don't know, my lord, Doriana said, feeling his heart starting to thud in his chest. The last time he'd seen Sidious like this, someone had died. Violently. It must have been Kbeoth Dash. He cannot go on that ship, Sidious cut in sharply. He must remain here. You will see to it. Understood, my lord, Doriana said quickly. Don't worry, I'll get him off. He reached for the cutoff switch, his mind whirling as he tried to sort through the options. Outbound flight's first scheduled stop was at Lano System. If he headed there immediately. But he couldn't, not with Vice Lord Cav aboard. 
Too much risk that someone would see the Nymoidian and make a connection they couldn't afford. He would first have to drop Cav with the attack force, then go after outbound flight. That meant the Lano connection wouldn't work, which meant he would have to try for their next stop, our guy, all the way over in Haldine's sector. If he missed them there. Wait. Doriana paused, his hand hovering over the control. Sidious's lips had tightened, and Doriana had the sense that the Sith Lord was running through the same logic chain he himself had just been working out. And apparently had come to the same conclusion. No, you continue with the plan, he said, his voice calm again. I will remove Skywalker from outbound flight. Yes, my lord, Doriana said, wilting a little with relief. He didn't have the foggiest idea how Sidious was going to pull that one off, especially with Kbeath and five other Jedi Masters on hand to oppose him. But that was the Sith Lord's problem. Doriana was off the hook, and that was the important thing. I'll contact you again when the mission has been accomplished. Do that, Doriana, Sidious said. His eyes, as always, were hidden by his hood. Just the same, Doriana could almost see them burning a hole through the long light years separating the two men before the image flickered and vanished. For a few seconds Doriana remained where he was, taking deep breaths as he worked out the tension still quivering through his body. Once again, the game had nearly proved fatal. Once again, he had made it through unscathed. One of these times, perhaps, he wouldn't. But that future was a long way away. Right now he had a fleet to find, and an ambush to prepare. An eighteen Jedi to kill. Shutting down the hollow projector, he went back to the pilot's chair and plugged Cav's data card into the reader slot. Time to find out exactly where they were going. Fourteen. The pylon turbolift car door opened into yet another spacious lobby area. Okay, Anakin said, leaning out for a look. And this one is... He threw a not-quite-surreptitious look at the marking on the side dash. Dreadnought 4? Correct, Kbea said, putting a hand on the boy's shoulder and pressing him forward out of the car. We're now at the farthest side of outbound flight from the command ship, Dreadnought 1. Rather like Tatooine in that respect, Obi-Wan added drilly. Right, Anakin said. Only cooler and less sandy. Tatooine? Kbeath asked. A small planet where Anakin grew up, Obi-Wan explained. The locals like to say that it's the farthest point from the center of the universe, like Dreadnought 4 is the farthest from Dreadnought 1's command areas. Bayath nodded. Ah. Dreadnought 4's architecture and equipment, Obi-Wan noted, were identical to those of the other ships they'd visited on Kbeath Esther. Not really surprising, considering how the expedition had been put together. Also as in the other Dreadnoughts, the people passing through the corridors around them all seemed to be moving with a brisk, business-like step, their expressions cheerful, confident, and determined. Small wonder. Against steep odds their grand adventure had finally begun, and the warm glow of that accomplishment was still with them. Jedi Master Justin Monning is in charge of this particular dreadnought, Kbeath said as they headed aft. I believe you spoke with him at the first night dinner. Yes, we chatted for a few minutes, Obi-Wan said. I thought Commander Omano was in charge of Dreadnought 4. I meant that Master Monning oversees Jedi operations and activities, Kbeath said. He should be back in Conference Room 5 with his two Jedi Knights and a select group of families. Let's go see how they're doing. What were these families selected for? Obi-Wan asked. The highest honor possible, Kbeath said. Over the next few days, one of each family's children will be starting Jedi training. Obi-Wan stared at him. 
Jedi training? Indeed, Kbayath confirmed. You see, along with their basic technical skills, prospective colonists were also screened for the presence of Force-sensitive children. Those families with the most promise were given preferential status, though of course we kept that a secret up until now. We have 11 candidates in all, including the three here in Dreadnought 4. How old are these children? Obi-Wan asked. They range in age from 4 to 10, Kbayoth said. He cocked an eyebrow at Anakin. Which is, I believe, the same age Master Skywalker was when you took him as your Padawan. It is, Obi-Wan confirmed, feeling his lip twist. For centuries standard temple policy had been to accept only infants into Jedi training, and Kbayoth knew it. Unfortunately, Anakin was a glaring exception to that rule, an exception Kbayath clearly intended to use as his justification for this. What about their parents? What about them? They've all given their permission for this training? They will, Kbayath assured him. As I said, giving a child to the Jedi is the highest honor possible. So you haven't actually asked them yet? Of course not. Kbayath said, an edge of puzzlement creeping into his tone. What parent wouldn't be proud to have a Jedi son or daughter? Obi-Wan braced himself. But if for some reason they don't see it that way, dash. Later, Kbayath interrupted, gesturing to a door to their right. We're here. The conference room was one of many mid-size meeting areas scattered around a typical dreadnought. At the far end, standing beside a podium, was Jedi Master Monning, listening intently to a question from a woman in the front row. Flanking him, dressed in Jedi robes, were a pair of duros. And seated in the rows of chairs in front of them, nearly packing the available space, were perhaps forty men, women, and children. Far more than the three families Kbayoth had implied would be here. Kbayoth was clearly surprised, too. What in the... He rumbled under his breath, his eyes flashing as he looked around. Maybe they brought their friends. Anakin suggested hesitantly. Friends were not invited, Kbayoth growled. He started to move forward, then seemed to think better of it. Instead, he gave an impatient gesture to his right. Turning that direction, Obi-Wan saw Lorana Jinsler detach herself from the back wall where she'd been standing and walk over to them. She nodded in greeting as she reached them. Master Kbayath, she said quietly. Master Monning said you might drop in on us. And it's fortunate that I did, Kbayath said. His voice was low but Obi-Wan could see a few of the people in the back row starting to look around to see what was going on. What are all these people doing here? Master Monning invited all the secondaries and their families, as well. Lorana told him. Secondaries? Obi-Wan asked. Those with a small amount of latent force sensitivity, too small for them to ever become Jedi. Bayath said, glowering across the room at Manning. What about you, Jedi Jinsler? Why aren't you attending to your duties on Dreadnought One? Master Manning asked me to come, she said, her voice a little strained. Bayath rumbled deep in his throat. I see, he said darkly. They waited in silence as Monning answered the question he'd been asked something about ration redistribution for those whose children would be undergoing the training and called for more questions. There were none, and with a final word of thanks he called the meeting to a close. And as the audience began to gather themselves together, Kbea strode down the aisle toward the front. Obi-Wan followed, Anakin and Lorana at his sides. As near as Obi-Wan could tell from the snatches of conversation he could hear, 
most of the people did indeed seem pleased or even excited by the fact that they had future Jedi in their families. Most of them. But not all. Manning nodded in greeting as the group approached. Master Kbeath, he said. Master Kenobi, young Sky Dash. What do you mean by bringing the secondaries to this meeting? Kbeath demanded. I thought it would be useful to let everyone know at once why they'd been selected to fly on outbound flight, Manning said. His voice was calm, but Obi-Wan could see tension lines at the corners of his eyes. Since the secondaries are the ones most likely to produce Jedi offspring in the future, I thought they should know what to expect. That could have been dealt with if and when it happened. Kbeath growled. This is not how it should have been. None of it is as it should be, Mon encountered. Children this age and taking them from their families by force dash. By force. Obi-Wan put in. I don't expect force to be necessary, Kbeath insisted, glaring at Obi-Wan and Manning in turn. The few parents who have doubts will undoubtedly come around. Certainly the children themselves will be thrilled to begin their training. The question remains why we're even doing this, Manning said. We're doing this because we're setting off on a long and dangerous trip, Kbeath told him. We'll need all the Jedi we can get, far more than Master Yoda would permit me to invite. Very well, so we will raise them up by ourselves. And please don't quote me that learned nonsense about how young a Jedi candidate has to be, because that's all it is, nonsense. Master Yoda would disagree with you, Manning said. Then Master Yoda would be wrong, Kbeath said flatly. We don't train children or adults because we choose not to. That's the only reason. He gestured at Anakin. Padawan Skywalker is proof that older children are trainable. Manning's lip twitched. Perhaps, he conceded. But there are other reasons for accepting only infants. What other reasons? Kbeath asked. Tradition? Politics? There's certainly nothing in the code itself that specifically speaks to the issue. Actually, that's not true, Obi-Wan put in. The writings of Master Simicardi are very clear on the subject. Master Simicardi's writings are his interpretations of the code, not part of the code itself, Kbeath said. More tradition, under a different name. You do not approve of tradition? One of the Duros asked. I don't approve of simply and blindly accepting it as truth, Kbeath told him. Nor can we afford to do so. The lists of Jedi are shrinking all across the Republic. If we're to continue our role as the guardians of peace and justice, we must find ways to increase our numbers. By forcibly taking trainees from their parents? Manning asked. Especially considering the fact that none of these parents had wanted their children to become Jedi in the first place? What makes you think that? Kbeath asked. The fact that if they had, they'd have taken them for testing when they were infants, Manning said. Perhaps there were other reasons, Kbeath rumbled. But all right, yes, the parents have always made the decision whether or not their children would be trained. More tradition. But what about the child's wishes? Wouldn't it be more ethical to allow him or her to make that decision? But as Master Manning says, there are good reasons for accepting only infants, Obi-Wan said. Most of which don't apply here, Kbeath said firmly. There are no deep-rooted family hierarchies aboard outbound flight to deal with. Nor will the children be going hundreds or thousands of light years away to the temple on Coruscant where their families will never see them again. Beside Kbeath, Lorana stirred but remained silent. No, here there'll be merely a turbolift right away in the storage core, 
Bayath continued. After some initial training, we might even consider allowing them occasional evenings with their families. You're putting them in the storage core? Manning asked, frowning. I want the training center as far away from noise and mental confusion as possible, Bayath told him. There's plenty of room down there. Manning shook his head. I still don't like this, Master Kbeath. New ideas are always discomforting, as are new ways of doing things. Kbeath said, looking at each of the others in turn. In many ways all of outbound flight is a grand experiment. And remember that if we're successful, we may return to the Republic with the key to a complete reinvigoration of the entire Jedi Order. And if we don't succeed? Obi-Wan asked. Then we fail, Kbeath said stiffly. But we won't. Obi-Wan looked at Manning. The other still didn't look happy, but it was clear he didn't have any fresh arguments to offer. Besides, Kbeath was right. Something new had to be tried if the Jedi Order was going to survive. And once upon a time, According to the histories, the Jedi had been willing to take risks. All right, Manning said at last. We'll try this grand experiment of yours. But move carefully, Master Kbeath. Move very carefully. Of course, Kbeath said, as if there were no doubt. Then all that remains is to prepare the training center. He turned to Lorana. Since you're here, Jedi Jinsler, you will see to that. Lorana bowed her head. Yes, Master Kbeath. And in the future, Kbeath added, looking back at Manning, you'll check with me before you take any of my Jedi from their assigned duties. Manning's lip twisted slightly, but he, too, bowed his head. As you wish, Master Kbeath. Kbeath held his eaves a moment longer, then turned to Obi-Wan and Anakin. And now we'll continue our tour, he said, gesturing toward the door. He strode down the aisle toward the rear, ignoring the small clusters of crewers still conversing quietly among themselves, and out into the corridor. You mentioned Jedi duties, Obi-Wan said as they turned aft. What exactly will you be wanting us to do? At the moment, the sorts of things you've always done, Kbeath said. Patrolling outbound flight and assisting where you're needed. Later, I'll want you to assist with the training of our prospective Jedi. And, of course, we'll be needed to maintain order aboard the ships. I hadn't noticed a great deal of disorder, Obi-Wan pointed out. There will be, Kbeath said grimly. This many people can't live this closely together without friction. Even before we leave the unknown regions, I fully expect we'll be regularly called upon to resolve disputes among passengers, as well as organizing proper rules of conduct. Rules of conduct? Wouldn't that sort of thing be Captain Pack Miller's responsibility? Obi-Wan asked carefully. Captain Pack Miller will have his hands full with the physical requirements of running outbound flight, Kbeath said. Besides, we're the best qualified for such tasks. As long as we remember that our role is to advise and mediate, Obi-Wan cautioned. Jedi serve others rather than ruling over them, for the good of the galaxy. I said nothing about ruling over anyone. But if we take over Captain Pack Miller's job of keeping order, isn't that essentially what we're doing? Obi-Wan asked. Mediation offered with the underlying threat of compulsion hardly qualifies as mediation. As I threatened the two sides on Balak? Kbeath asked pointedly. Obi-Wan hesitated. He remembered feeling uncomfortable with the tone Kbeath had used to the two sides in the aftermath of the abortive missile attack. Had he in fact overstepped his bounds by forcing them to accept his terms? 
or had the compulsion merely come from the attack itself, coupled with their sudden and sobering recognition that the negotiations were no longer purely matters of charts and abstract numbers? And what was Kbeatha's connection, if any, to that attack? That was a question he was still no closer to answering. They did need someone to tell them what to do, Anakin offered into his thoughts. And we're supposed to have wisdom and insight that non-Jedi don't have. Sometimes wisdom requires us to stand by and do nothing, Obi-Wan said, Windu's words back at the temple echoing through his mind. Still, if the council had reprimanded Kbeoth for his actions, Windu hadn't mentioned it. Otherwise people might never learn how to handle problems by themselves. And such wisdom comes only through a close understanding of the Force. Kbea said, his tone indicating the discussion was over. As you will learn, young Skywalker, he gestured ahead. Now, down here we have the central weapons and shield cluster. Kbeath and the others disappeared through the conference room door. Lorana watched them go, sighing with tiredness and frustration. Why had Manning asked her here anyway? Because she presumably knew Kbeath better than anyone else aboard. If so, she certainly hadn't been of much use during the discussion. Was she supposed to have joined the others in objecting to his Jedi training plan then? Well, she'd failed on that account too. Is he always this overbearing? Lorana turned back around. The two Duros had wandered away and were talking quietly together, but Manning was still standing there, eyeing her thoughtfully. He didn't seem particularly overbearing to me, she said, automatically rising to her master's defense. Perhaps it's just his personality, Manning said. But there was a knowing look on his face. Maybe he'd seen other Jedi come to Kbeath's defense before for the same reasons Lorana had. Whatever those reasons were. Tell me, what do you think of this scheme of his? You mean the training of older children? She shrugged helplessly. I don't know. It's all new to me. He hasn't talked about this before? No, she said. At least, not to me. Hmm. Manning said, pursing his lips. It's an interesting concept, certainly. And he's right. There have been exceptions in the past, most of whom have worked out fine. Like Anakin? Perhaps, Manning said cautiously. Though until a Padawan actually achieves Jedi knighthood, there's always the danger he or she might fall away. I'm not expecting that of Skywalker, of course. No, Lorana agreed. If you'll excuse me, Master Manning, I need to find some crewers to help me start organizing the new training center. Certainly, Manning said, nodding. I'll speak with you later. He stepped over to the two Duros, joining in their conversation. Three Jedi, holding a private discussion among themselves with Lorana on the outside, as if she were still just a Padawan. Still, she had said she was leaving. Maybe that was all it was. Taking a deep breath, putting such thoughts from her mind, she headed down the aisle toward the door. She was nearly there when a man stepped partway into her path. Your pardon, Jedi, he said tentatively. A word, if I may? Certainly, Lorana said, focusing on him for the first time. He was a typical crewer, young and bright-eyed, with short dark hair and a hint of greasy dirt on the collar of his jumpsuit. Summoned directly from his shift to Manning's meeting, probably. Behind him stood a young woman with a sleeping infant in one arm and a boy of five or six standing close beside her. Her free hand was resting on the boy's shoulder. How can I help you? My name's Dillian Presser, the man said, gesturing back to the others. 
My son, Jorid, has a question. All right, Lorena said, stepping over to the boy, noting that as she approached the woman seemed to tighten her grip on her son's shoulder. Hello, Jorid, she said cheerfully, dropping to one knee in front of him. He gazed at her, his expression a mix of uncertainty and awe. Are you really a Jedi? He asked. Yes, indeed, she assured him. I'm Jedi Jinsler. Can you say that? He pursed his lips uncertainly. Jedi Jisser? Jinsler, his father said. Jinsler. Jedi Jisler, the boy tried again. Or we could just make it Jedi Lorana, Lorana suggested. You have a question for me? The boy threw an uncertain look up at his mother's face. Then, stealing himself, he looked back at Lorena. Master Monning said only the people he called were going to be Jedi, he said. I wanted to know if I could be one, too. Lorena glanced up at the woman, noting the tight lines in her face. I'm afraid it's not something any of us has a say in, she said. If you aren't born with force sensitivity, we can't train you to be a Jedi. I'm sorry. Well, what if I got better? Jorid persisted. He said the rest of us were close, and it's been a long time since they tested us. Maybe I got better. Maybe you did, Lorana said. In theory, of course, he couldn't. Force sensitivity could be nurtured, but not created. On the other hand, Kbeoth had said these were the families who had low but non-negligible sensitivity. It was at least theoretically possible that the boy's testing had been inaccurate. I tell you what, she said. I'll talk to Master Monning about having you tested again, all right? If you've gotten better, we'll see if we can get you into the program. Jorid's eyes lit up. Okay, he said. When can I do it? I'll talk to Master Manning, she repeated, wondering if she'd already promised more than she could deliver. He'll set it up with your father. Jorid? The boy's mother prompted. Thank you, Jorid said dutifully. You're welcome. Lorana said, standing up and looking at the baby in her mother's arm. Is this your sister? Yes, that's Katerin, Jorid said. She mostly just cries a lot. That's what babies do best, Lorana agreed, looking at the mother and then Dillian. Thank you all for coming. No problem, Dillian said, taking his son's hand and stepping to the door. It opened, and he ushered the boy out into the corridor. Thank you again, Jedi Jinsler. Jedi Lorana, Jorid corrected him. Almost unwillingly, Dillian smiled. Jedi Lorana, he amended. Holding out a hand to his wife, he led her out behind Jorid Dash. There you are, an irritated voice called down the corridor. Lorana stepped out into the corridor behind the others. Striding toward them was a young man with dirt water colored hair, his mouth set in a thin line as he glared at Dillian. What the bricks are you doing here, Presser? It was a special meeting, Dillian said, gesturing toward Lorana. This is Jedi Lorana Jinsler Dash. Since when do you skip out in the middle of a duty shift for a meeting? The man cut in. In case you've forgotten, it's a little difficult to do a hyperdrive reactor communication deep check without the hyperdrive man actually being there. I know, Presser said, giving Jorid's hand to his mother. Sorry I thought we'd be done sooner than this. Well, you weren't. The man shifted his glare to Lorana. Is this going to be a regular occurrence around here, Jedi Jinsler? What do you mean, ah? Chaz Yulier, the man said shortly. 
I mean you Jedi coming in and messing with our work schedules. I'm not sure what you mean, Lorana said. Two days ago Master Monning pulled everyone off systems control for a coolant leak drill, Yolier said. Never mind that we've already done five of them in the past month. Now you're calling special bounce of the moment meetings that pull people off important duty stations. What's online for tomorrow? Escape pod practice? Is there a problem, Yulier? Monning's voice came from behind them. Lorana turned as Monning stepped out into the corridor. I just want to get my day's work done in peace so that I can sleep the sleep of the virtuous, Yulier said with a hint of sarcasm. Or do I need to make a formal requisition for that? Not at all, Manning assured him. Presser, you're free to return to your station. Thank you, Presser said. And in the future we'll try to be more considerate of the various work schedules, Manning added to Yulier. Fine, Yulier said, a little less truculently. Come on, Presser. Let's try to get this done before the next shift comes on. He headed back down the corridor at a fast walk. See you later, Presser said, touching his wife's arm and then hurrying after him. Goodbye, Jedi Lorana, Jorid said gravely, looking up at her. I hope we'll see you again. I'm sure you will, Jorit, Lorana said, smiling at the boy. You take good care of your little sister, okay? I will. Holding his mother's hand tightly, he headed the other direction down the corridor. Sounds like an irritable sort, Lorana commented to Manning. Who, Yulier? The master shrugged. A bit. Still, He's got a point about us changing things around with no notice. You might want to speak to Master Kbayath about that. I thought he said you'd called for the coolant leak drill. Under Master Kbayath's orders, Manning smiled wryly. And he's right we do have an escape pod drill scheduled for later this week. Lorana nodded. I'll talk to him, she promised. There were six standard days out of Yaga Minor and had stopped for a routine navigational check in Lana system when the trouble started. A crowd had already gathered in the Dreadnought 2 aft passenger section when Obi-Wan arrived. Let me through, please, he said, starting to ease his way through the mass of people. Look, there's another one, a Radian voice muttered. Another one what? Obi-Wan asked turning in that direction. Another Jedi, the Radian said, looking him square in the face. Easy, Feven, a man nearby cautioned. Don't start pointing blame. Can you tell me what happened? Obi-Wan asked. What happened is thieves in the night, the Radian bit out. Thieves with robes and lightsabers. Feven, shut up the man said. He looked at Obi-Wan, lowered his eyes. They came for someone's kid, that's all. In the middle of the night, Feven insisted. What night? The man scoffed. This is space. It's always night here. The family was sleeping, Feven countered. That makes it night. Thank you. Obi-Wan said, easing away from them and continuing on through the crowd. Middle of ship's night or not, perhaps he ought to give Kbayath a call. There was no need. He reached the open area in the center of the crowd to find that Kbayath was already there. Master Kbayath, he said, taking in the rest of the scene with a glance. Standing in the doorway to one of the rooms was a hulking figure of a man his hands gripping the sides of the doorway as if daring anyone to pass. Behind him in the room was a frantic-eyed woman kneeling on the floor clutching a young boy tightly to her. The child himself looked frightened but also oddly intent. Kbeyev half turned to frown at him. What are you doing here? 
he demanded. You should be sleeping. I heard there was some commotion, Obi-Wan said, crossing to the doorway. Hello, he said to the man. You're not taking him, the other said flatly. I don't care how many of you there are, you're not taking him. You have no choice, Kbeoth said flatly. As Jedi Master Evrios explained to you nearly a week ago, your son is a potential Jedi, and he's agreed to enter training. That means he comes with us. Says who? The man retorted. Ship's Law says decisions about children are made by their parents. I looked it up. Ship's Law wasn't written to cover this situation, Kbeoth said. It therefore doesn't apply. So now you just throw out the law when it doesn't suit you. Of course we don't throw it out, Kbeoth said. We merely rewrite it. Who does? The man demanded. You Jedi? Captain Pak Milu is the final legal authority aboard outbound flight. Obi-Wan put in. We'll call him an ass dash. He may be the final legal authority, Kbeya said, cutting him off with a warning glare. That remains to be seen. Obi-Wan felt an uncomfortable tingling across his skin. What do you mean? Outbound flight is first and foremost a Jedi project, Kbeoth reminded him. Jedi requirements therefore supersede all other authority. Obi-Wan took a careful breath, suddenly aware of the people silently pressing around them. May I see you for a moment, Master Kbeoth? In private? Later, Kbeoth said, craning his neck over the crowd. Captain Pak Miller has arrived. Obi-Wan turned to see the crowd opening up to let Pak Miller through. Even dragged out of bed as he must have been, the Mon Cal's uniform was still immaculate. Master Kbeath, he said, his voice even more gravelly than usual. Master Kenobi, what is the problem? They want to take my son away from me, the man in the door bit out. The boy is to enter Jedi training, Kbeath said calmly. His father seeks to deny him that right. What right? The man snapped. His right? Our right? Your right? The Jedi are the guardians of peace, Kbeath reminded him. As such dash. Maybe in the Republic you are, the man cut in. But that's why we're leaving the Republic, isn't it? To get away from arbitrary rules and capricious justice and dash. Perhaps we should wait until morning to discuss this, Obi-Wan interrupted. I think we'll all be calmer and clearer of mind then. There's no need for that, Kbeoth insisted. Master Kenobi speaks wisdom, Pak Miller said. We'll meet tomorrow after morning meal in Dreadnought 2's forward command conference room. His eyes rolled to first the man and then Kbeath. There you'll both have an opportunity to present your arguments, as well as relevant articles of Republic law. Kbeath exhaled loudly. Very well, Captain, he said. Until tomorrow. With a final look at the man and boy he strode off the crowd opening up even faster for him than it had for Pak Milu. Obi-Wan followed, making it through the gap before it closed again. For the first hundred meters they walked in silence. Obi-Wan was starting to wonder if Kbeoth even knew he had tagged along when the other finally spoke. You shouldn't have done that, Master Kenobi, Kbeoth rumbled. Jedi should never argue in public. I was unaware that trying to clarify a situation qualified as arguing. Obi-Wan said, stretching to the force for patience. Though if it comes to that, a Jedi should never deliberately antagonize the people he's supposed to be serving, either. 
Taking a child into Jedi training is not antagonism. Doing so in the middle of the night is, Obi-Wan countered. There's no reason that couldn't have waited until morning. He paused. Unless, of course, you were deliberately trying to force the issue of control. He'd hoped the other would instantly and hotly deny it. But Kbeoth merely looked sideways at him. And why would I do that? I don't know, Obi-Wan said. Particularly since the code specifically forbids Jedi to rule over others. Does it? Does it really? Obi-Wan felt a tingling at the back of his neck. We've already had this discussion, he reminded the other. And my position remains the same as it was then, Kbeoth said. The Jedi Order has accumulated many rules over the centuries that are clearly erroneous. Why should this not be one of them? Because Jedi aren't equipped to rule, Obi-Wan said. Because seeking power is the dark side. How do you know? Kbeoth demanded. When was the last time we were ever given the opportunity to try? I know because the code says so, Obi-Wan said flatly. We're here to guide, not become dictators. And what is the purpose of rules and regulations if not to guide people into the behavior that will best serve them and their society? Kbeoth countered. Now you're playing with semantics. No, I'm speaking of intent, Kbeoth corrected. Rule is of the dark side because it seeks personal gain and the satisfaction of one's own desires over the rights and desires of others. Guidance, in any form, seeks the other person's best interests. Is that truly what you're seeking here? That's what all of us seek, Kbeoth said. Come now, Master Kenobi. Can you truly say that Master Yoda and Master Windu couldn't run the Republic with more wisdom and efficiency than Palpatine and the government bureaucrats? If they could resist the pull of the dark side, yes, Obi-Wan said. But that pull would always be there. As it is in whatever we do, Kbeoth said. That's why we seek the guidance of the Force for ourselves as well as for those we serve. Obi-Wan shook his head. It's a dangerous course, Master Kbeoth, he warned. You risk bringing chaos and confusion. The confusion will be minimal, and it will end, Kbeoth promised. Whatever authority we're granted, rest assured that it will be with the support of the people. He lifted a finger. But never forget why most of them are here in the first place. You heard that man. They joined outbound flight to escape the corruption of the worlds we're leaving behind. Why shouldn't we offer something better? Because this is skirting perilously close to the edge, Obi-Wan said. I can't believe that the code could be as wrong as you seem to believe. Not wrong, but merely misinterpreted, Kbeoth said. Perhaps you should focus your meditation on this question. As of course I will myself, he added. Together, I'm sure we'll obtain the insight to find the proper path. Perhaps, Obi-Wan said. I'd like to come to the meeting tomorrow morning. No need, Kbeoth said. Jedi Master Evrios and I will handle things. Besides, I believe you're scheduled to help with the shielding of Dreadnar One's new auxiliary navigation room at that time. I'm sure that could wait. And now you'll want to return to your rest, Kbeoth said as they reached the pylon turbolift lobby. You have a busy day tomorrow. As do we all. Obi-Wan said with a sigh. And you? Kbeoth gazed thoughtfully down the corridor. I believe I'll wait for Captain Pak Milu, he said. Sleep well, Master Kenobi. I'll see you tomorrow. At the meeting the next morning, after all the various arguments had been presented and the discussion had wound down, Captain Pak Milu sided with Kbeoth. 
They took the boy away three hours later, Yulier said, scowling across the table at his friends. What do you expect? Tarkosa asked reasonably from across the table. Jedi are as rare as dewback feathers. I can understand why they wouldn't want anyone with the talent to slip through their fingers. But before it was always just infants, Job Keeley reminded him, his face puckered with uncertainty. Kids who don't even know they're alive yet, much less knowing who mom and dad are. These kids have all been much older. But they've all been willing to go, haven't they? Tarkosa countered. Even the boy this morning. He was scared, sure, but he was also pretty excited. Face it, Job, most kids think it would be really cool to be a Jedi. My question is what they're going to do with all of them, Yulia put in. They going to throw everyone off one of the dreadnoughts and build their own little Jedi temple there? I'm sure Kbeoth has some ideas, Tarkosa said firmly. Seems to me he's pretty much on top of things. Yeah, Yulia grunted. Right. For a few minutes none of them spoke. Yulia let his eyes drift around the number three mess room, as sterile and military looking as everything else aboard outbound flight. The people eating their dinners look sterile and military, too, in their jumpsuits and other operational garb. What the place needed was some character, he decided. Maybe he should get some people together and see if Commander Omano would let them redecorate the mess rooms with different themes. Maybe a nice upscale Coruscant dinner club for one, a mid-rim tap calf for another, something really sleazy looking for a third, with people encouraged to dress the parts when they went to cat or drink. What do you know? Keeley said into his thoughts, nodding behind Yulier. There's one now. Yulier turned. Sure enough, there was that Jinza woman who dragged Dillian Presser to a meeting when the man was supposed to be working. She was standing just inside the messroom doorway, her head moving slowly as she scanned the occupants. A couple of the diners looked up at her, but most didn't even seem to notice she was there. Trolling for more Jedi? He suggested. Don't seem to be many kids here, Keeley pointed out looking around. You suppose they're going to go after the adults next? Maybe Kbeath has given them a quota to fill, Yolier said. You know, like CORCC and traffic tickets. CORCC patrollers don't have quotas, Tarkosa said scornfully. That's a myth. Well, if she's got one, she's not going to fill it tonight. Keeley commented as Jinsler turned and left the room. Kbeoth's not going to be happy with her. If you asked me, I don't think Kbeoth's ever happy with anything, Yulier said, picking up his mug. I've never met anyone so full of himself. I had an instructor at the Institute just like him, Tarkosa said. One night some of the students sneaked into his office, disassembled his desk and reassembled it in the refresher station down the hall. I thought he was going to pop every blood vessel in his face when he saw it. But I'll bet it didn't solve anything, Keeley commented. People like that never learn, he turned to Yulier. Speaking of solving things, Chaz, did you ever figure out that line fluctuation problem you were having yesterday? We had to shut down the whole port side turbo laser system. Oh yeah, we got it sorted it out, Yulia told him, dragging his mind away from Jedi and dull dining rooms. This'll kill you. You know Bikrevnis, that big terminally cheerful foe Phehean who's supposed to be in charge of fluid flow maintenance. It seems he managed to mislabel one of his own gauges. It took until the fourth D4 mess room she visited, but Lorana finally found the Presser family. Hello, she said, smiling as she walked up to their table. How are you all doing tonight? We're fine, Presser said, 
his eyes suddenly wary as he looked up at her. Is anything wrong? That depends on how you look at it, Lorana said, kneeling down between Jorid and his mother. I wanted to tell you, Jorid, that your retest again came up negative. I'm sorry. The boy made a face. That's okay, he said, clearly disappointed. Mom and Dad said it probably wouldn't change. Moms and Dads are smart that way, Lorana said. I hope you're not too disappointed. I'm sure he'll get over it, the boy's mother said, a note of relief in her voice. There are lots of other things he can do with his life. Yes, Lorana murmured, her brother's face flickering across her memory. We all have to accept our strengths and talents, and go on from there. Though sometimes with a little push, Presser said grimly. I hear you Jedi had some sort of standoff over on D2 yesterday. I heard something about that, Lorana confirmed. I wasn't there, so I can't say whether it was a standoff or not. I understand it was resolved peaceably, though. I heard the boy was hustled off to Jedi school, Presser countered. Yet if that's his birthright, how can anyone deny it to him? Lorana asked. The life of a Jedi can be hard and, yes, it requires sacrifice from the parents as well as from the child. But anything that's worthwhile does. I suppose, Presser said, clearly not convinced. Well, I'll let you get back to your meal now, Lorana said, getting to her feet again. Thank you for your time. Thank you for stopping by, Presser said. Goodbye, Jedi Lorana, Jord added. For a moment his eyes seemed to linger on her lightsaber before he returned to his meal. Lorana made her way back through the mess room, trying to get a sense of the people around her. Most of those along her path looked up casually as she passed, then turned back to their food and conversations without any detectable change in their mood. Most of the ones seated farther away didn't even notice her. Everyone seemed more or less content, aside from the inevitable few working through annoyances from their shift work. If there was any growing resentment toward the Jedi, she couldn't detect it. So perhaps her fears were for nothing. After all, they would all be aboard outbound flight for a long time yet and even those who were upset at the way the children had been taken would eventually realize that more Jedi translated into a smoother and safer voyage. But for now, it was time to get back to work. Some of the last-minute equipment that had been packed into the storage core needed to be shifted around to other areas. The crewers had enough hands and lifters for the job, but there was always the chance that one of the stacks of crates would shift unexpectedly and it would be safer if a Jedi was present to keep that from happening. There would undoubtedly be injuries and deaths along the way, but Lorana had no intention of letting such incidents begin this soon. Not if she could help it. Stepping out into the corridor, she headed toward the aft pylon turbo lift. One of these days, she promised herself she would see about getting a hold of one of those swoops Captain Pac Milla had said were aboard. 15. And this is the engine compartment, Thrawn said, stepping aside to let Thras look through the access hatchway into the bargain hunter's engine room. You'll notice it has a radically differently layout from those of Chiss vessels this size. Yes, Thras said. He peered inside a moment, then turned to Cardas. What's the vessel's sublight range? I'm not sure. Cardas said, looking over at Kento. The other was standing off to one side with Maris, who was whispering a running translation to him. Rack? He invited in basic. Why? Kento growled. Is he looking to take it for a test run or something? Come on, Rack, Cardas cajoled, carefully avoiding Thrawn's eyes. Kento hadn't been happy about letting Thrawn give his brother this private tour of his ship, 
and he'd been wearing that annoyance on his sleeve ever since they'd arrived. The problem was that either he didn't remember that Thrawn could now understand basic, or else he just didn't care. So far the commander hadn't responded to Kento's snide comments, but that restraint was bound to have a limit. If he got tired enough of this and tossed Kento back in the brig, even Maris might not be able to sweet-talk him out again. Kento rolled his eyes. We can do 600 hours of sublight before refueling, he said grudgingly. 650 if we're careful with our acceleration. Thank you. Switching back to Menisiat, Cardas translated for Thras. Impressive, the syndic said, taking another look at the engine compartment. Their fuel efficiency must be slightly better than ours. Yes, but their hyperdrives appear to be more fragile, Thrawn said. Our shock net attacks disabled both theirs and their attackers without difficulty. Weaponry? Simple but adequate. Thrawn told him. The equipment is difficult to get to, but my experts have studied it at length. Their energy weapons and missiles are less sophisticated than ours, and they don't carry any shock nets or other disabling equipment. On the other hand, bear in mind that this is merely a small private freighter. True. Thras looked at Cardas. Your people do have war vessels, I presume? The Republic has no army of its own, Cardas said, choosing his words carefully. Peaceful watchfulness might be the Chiss way, but he still didn't want to make these people nervous. Of course, most of our member systems have their own defense forces. Which can also be used for attack? That does happen sometimes, Cardas conceded. But the Supreme Chancellor can call on member systems to help stop an aggressor, and that usually ends things pretty quickly. Mediation by the Jedi can sometimes stop trouble before it gets that far. Jedi? A class of beings unknown to us, Thrawn told him. Ferrisai has been trying to explain them to me. Cardas looked at Maris in surprise. He hadn't realized she'd been having private chats with the commander. Her eyes met his, ducked guiltily away, and for the first time since the session began her running translation faltered. Kento didn't miss any of it. His eyes narrowed, flicking to Maris, then Cardas, then back to Maris, and finally to the two Chiss. They appear able to access some unknown energy field. Thrawn continued to his brother. If he'd caught the interplay, he didn't show it. It can be used for sensory enhancement, insight into others' motivations and thoughts, or as a direct weapon. But only for defense, Maris put in. Jedi never attack first. You talking about Jedi? Kento put in. Cardas? Did she say Jedi? She's trying to describe the Jedi for him, Cardas said. The Chiss apparently don't have anything like them. Good, Kento grunted. At least we top them in something. So what's she saying? They were just talking about Jedi powers, Cardas said, looking at the two Chiss. Thrawn's face was expressionless while Thras was clearly annoyed with this side conversation in a language he didn't understand. But we can talk about this later, he added. Yeah, Kento said. Sure. They finished the rest of the tour and returned to the base. Cardas still couldn't tell what Thras thought of it all, but he found himself wilting with relief as he and the others were released to go back to their quarters. He'd half expected the syndic to order them all into the brig. The relief was premature. Even as he started to pass Kento and Maris's quarters and head toward his own, Kento took his arm and hauled him bodily through the door. What dash? Shut up, Kento said, pulling him the rest of the way through and letting the door close behind him. Giving him a shove toward Maris, he put his back to the door 
and folded his arms defiantly across his chest. Okay, he said. Let's hear it. Let's hear what? Cardas asked, his heartbeat starting to pound again. The story about you and Maris and Thrawn, Kento said coldly. Specifically, these private chats he and Maris have been having. Cardas caught his breath and instantly cursed himself for his reaction. If Kento had requested a guilty reaction in writing, he could hardly have delivered him a better one. What do you mean? He asked, stalling for time. Don't you mean, how do I know? Kento snorted. What, you think that just because I don't come to your little language school I've just been sitting around staring at the walls? He nodded at the computer across the room. Maris was kind enough to let me watch her set up the pathway to the vocabulary lists. Cardas felt his stomach tighten. So you understand, Chun? I understand enough of it. Kento looked at Maris. I also know how to read women. You don't understand, Maris said, her voice low and soothing. Fine, he said. Explain it to me. She took a deep breath. I admire Commander Thrawn, she said. Her voice was still soothing, but Cardas could hear cracks starting to form in it. She knew Kento's temper even better than he did. He's intelligent and noble, with an artistic sensitivity I haven't seen since I left school. Kento snorted. You mean since you left those shallow needle-headed idiots you used to hang out with? Yes, most of them were idiots, she agreed without embarrassment. Comes of being young, I suppose. But Thrawn is different. Thrawn is a grown-up version, she said. His artistic sense is coupled with maturity and wisdom. I enjoy spending time talking with him. Her eyes flashed. Just talking with him, if that matters. Not really. Kento growled. But as Cardas watched some of the tension go out of him, he could tell that it did. So if these meetings are so innocent, why have you been hiding them? A muscle in Maris's cheek twitched. Because I knew you'd react exactly like this. And this secrecy was all your idea, huh? She hesitated. Actually, I believe Thrawn suggested it. Kento grunted. Thought so. And what's that supposed to mean? Maris asked, her eyes narrowing ominously. It means he's playing you for a fool, Kento said bluntly. I may not be cultured or artistic, but I've been around a little. I know his type, and he's not what he seems. They never are. Maybe he's the exception. You can believe that if you want, Kento said. I'm just telling you that somewhere along the line this little pyramid of cards you've built around him is going to fall apart. Bet on it. I will, she said, her eyes blazing openly now. You be sure to point it out when it happens. Turning her back on him, she stalked over to the computer and dropped into the chair. Kento watched her go, then turned to Cardas. You have anything to say? He challenged. No, Cardas said quickly. Nothing. Then get out, Kento said, moving away from the door. And remember what I said. Don't you trust him either? Sure. Sidling carefully past him, Cardas escaped out into the corridor and back to his quarters. Through the row of viewports on the bridge of the Trade Federation battleship Darkvenge the Starlings faded once again into stars. We have arrived, Vice Lord Cav announced from his throne-like command chair. Hmm, Doriana murmured noncommittally from his seat on the observers. Couch curving out beside the other. In general, the Nymoidians had excellent navigational systems. But systems were only as good as their operators 
and in the dark vents case that was open to question. Sidious had insisted the crews of all the task force's ships be kept to a bare minimum, retaining only those who could be trusted to keep their mouths closed and bringing in droids to take up the slack. More than once, Doriana had wondered whether Sidious's ultimate plan was to kill any survivors of the mission to make doubly sure that none of this ever leaked out. If so, the low crew numbers would certainly make that easier. Your concerns are needless, Kev said haughtily, completely missing the direction Doriana's thoughts had taken. We are double-checking the location now. Thank you, Doriana said, inclining his head politely. The skeleton crew would not, of course, affect their attack capabilities to any great degree. That would be handled by droid starfighters, and that system was largely automated. He looked around the bridge at the Nymoidians and droids working busily in the various sunken control pits, then turned his attention to the tactical board. The task force was arranging itself into a typical Nymoidian defense structure. The two huge trade federations split ring battleships in the center where they would be best protected, the six-armed techno-union hard cell class transports forming a pyramid point defensive shell around them, and the seven trade federation escort cruisers arrayed in a patrol cloud beyond that. It was an awesome collection of firepower, possibly the largest assembled in one place since the fiasco at Naboo. Against even the weaponry of six brand new dreadnoughts, they should have no trouble carrying the day. Assuming, of course, that Cav's navigators had indeed brought them to the right part of the right system. If they missed outbound flight here, they would have to hurry another 600 light years ahead in order to catch it at its second navigational stop. Our position is confirmed, Cav said with satisfaction. His nictitating membranes blinked at Doriana. If the coordinates you have brought us are correct. They are, Doriana said. If outbound flight is on schedule, they'll arrive in a little over 11 days. Until then, we'll run training exercises to make sure your people and equipment will be ready. They are more than ready, Kev insisted stiffly. The combat programs for the droid starfighters are the very best and between our two battleships we have nearly 3,000 of them. No matter how strong outbound flight's defenses, no matter how skilled their gunners, we will destroy them with ease. That's what you said at Naboo. With an effort, Doriana kept the comment to himself. I'm sure you're right, he said instead. We'll still spend the next few days running my drills. Cav made a noise deep in his chest. As you wish, he said with strained patience. But the extra expenditure of fuel and energy will be upon your responsibility. When do you wish to begin? There's no, t There's no time like the present, he said. We launch starfighters in ten minutes. And this, Kbea said as he led the way into the unusually low ceiling room, is the control room for weapons blister number one. You'll notice the ceiling is low to make extra room for the turbo laser charging equipment above us. Lucky we don't have any gungans aboard, Obi-Wan commented, ducking his head a little as he stepped in. The room was equipped with a large wraparound control board in the center, with auxiliary and support consoles along the walls. From the number of chairs arranged at the various stations, it looked like the normal complement would be 15 people, including the three actual gunners. Gungans wouldn't have been allowed anywhere near these stations even if there were any aboard, Kbeoth said flatly. Weapons specialists need far more sophistication and intelligence than that. In my experience, those two don't necessarily go together, Obi-Wan commented. And there are four of these blisters on each dreadnought? Correct, Kbeoth said, crossing to the main firing console and resting his hand on the headrest of one of the chairs. 
Come and sit down, Master Skywalker. Anakin glanced at Obi-Wan, then walked over and lowered himself gingerly into the seat. Looks complicated, he commented. Not really, Kbea said, pointing over his shoulder at the various sections of the board. Here are the actual firing controls. Note that you can aim and fire both the forward and aft turbolasers from here as well as your own starboard side weaponry. Over here is the sensor lock monitor. This is the secondary fire control. This is the weapon status board. This is the comm. This is the tactical display system. All quite straightforward. Still pretty complicated, Anakin said. I'll bet I could design a better layout. I'm sure you could, Kbea said, throwing Obi-Wan an amused smile. Unfortunately, Radili Star Drive didn't think to consult any Jedi during production. Still, you'll learn it quickly enough. We'll start with an overall tutorial, and then a simple simulation. You access both over here. Wait a minute, Obi-Wan said, frowning as he stepped to Anakin's other side. What are you doing? I'm teaching Master Skywalker how to handle Dreadnought One's weaponry, of course, Kbeoth said. Doesn't Captain Pakmilu already have experienced crewers for that job? Experience is not always the most important aspect of combat, Kbeoth pointed out. Timing and coordination are also key, and no amount of experience can give ordinary gunners the edge that we already possess. Tell me, Master Skywalker, has Master Kenobi ever spoken to you of the Jedi meld? I don't think so, Anakin said. What does it do? It permits a group of Jedi to connect their minds so closely as to act as a single person, Kbeoth told him. It can also be very dangerous, Obi-Wan warned. It takes a Jedi Master of great power and depth in the Force to create such a state without killing or destroying the minds of everyone involved. A Jedi Master such as myself, Kbeoth said calmly. I've successfully performed such a meld on four separate occasions. Obi-Wan stared at him. Four? Three were training exercises, of course, Kbeoth conceded. But the fourth was under serious field conditions, with five other Jedi in the melt. As you can see, we came through it successfully. That was with six of you, Obi-Wan pointed out. There are nineteen of us aboard outbound flight. Twenty, including Master Skywalker, Kbeoth corrected, laying a hand on Anakin's shoulder. Certainly we'll need to proceed with caution. I'll be discussing the procedure with each of my Jedi, and we'll be carrying out a number of practice sessions before we leave Republic space. Still, once we're all comfortable with the technique, we'll become an awesome fighting force indeed. With Jedi working as one at the weapons systems of all six dreadnoughts, outbound flight will be virtually unbeatable. Obi-Wan looked down at Anakin. The boy was taking in all of this eagerly, with apparently no qualms whatsoever. I don't know, Master Kbeath. Weapons control, large-scale combat, that's not the Jedi way. It will be, Kbeath said grimly, his eyes taking on a faraway look. The time is coming when all Jedi will be forced to take up arms against a great threat to the Republic. I have foreseen it. Obi-Wan felt a shiver tingle his spine. Kbeoth always seemed so proud and confident, often to the point of arrogance. But there was something dark and uncertain in the other sense now, something almost fearful. Have you told Master Yoda about this? He asked. Kbeoth's eyes came back to focus and he snorted. Master Yoda keeps his own counsel and listens to no other he said with a touch of scorn. But why do you think I worked so hard to bring out bound flight to fruition? Why do you think I was so insistent that as many Jedi as possible should accompany us? 
he shook his head. Dark days are coming, Master Kenobi. It may be that we of outbound flight will be all who will be left to breathe life back into the ashes of the universe we once knew. Perhaps, Obi-Wan said. But the future is never certain, and each of us has the power to affect what is to be. He looked at Anakin again. Sometimes without even knowing what it is we do. I agree, Kbeoth said. Outbound flight is my way of affecting the future. And now, young Skywalker Dash. He broke off as the calm link at his belt gave an insistent twitter. One moment, he said, pulling it free and clicking it on. Jedi Master Kbeoth. The voice on the other end was too faint for Obi-Wan to make out the words, but he could hear the urgency in the tone. He could also see the exasperation settling into Kbeoth's face. Keep them both there he ordered. I'm on my way. Shutting off the comm link, he reached over and tapped a pair of switches on the board. Here's the tutorial, he told Anakin. Start learning where everything is and how it works. He threw Obi-Wan a hard look. Stay here, Master Kenobi. I'll be back shortly. With his robes billowing behind him, he left the room. Master? Anakin asked tentatively. Yes, go ahead, Obi-Wan confirmed. Setting his jaw, he headed after Kbeath. The other had already made good progress down the corridor, striding along with his usual indifference toward those who had to scramble to get out of his way. Obi-Wan followed at a discreet distance, trying not to run over anyone himself. A few minutes later, they arrived at a knot of people gathered in the middle of the corridor. Move aside, Kbeoth ordered. The crowd opened, and Obi-Wan saw a man half-lying, half-sitting against the corridor wall, his face twisted with silent pain as he gripped his right shoulder. A few paces away a second man stood beside one of Dreadnought One's single-seat speeders, his hands working nervously at his sides. What happened? Kbeoth demanded, kneeling beside the injured man. He ran right into me, the man said, his face twisting even more with the effort of talking. Rammed right into my shoulder. He jumped in front of me, the man by the speeder protested. I couldn't stop in time. If you hadn't been riding so fast, Ash. Enough. Kbeoth ran his hands gently across the other's injured shoulder. It's merely a dislocation. His hand twitched as he stretched out to the force dash. Ah! The man gasped, his whole body surging violently before sagging back against the wall. Ah! He breathed more quietly. Kbeoth straightened up and picked two people out of the crowd with his eyes. You and you, accompany him to the Midline Med Center. Yes, Master Kbeath, one of them said. Crouching beside the injured man, they helped him to his feet. As for you, Kbeath continued, turning toward the speeder's driver as the others made their way out of the crowd. You were clearly driving recklessly. But I wasn't, the other protested. It's not my fault. These things are set at way too high a speed. Really? Kbeoth said coolly. Then how do you explain that in twelve days, among nearly two hundred speeders and swoops aboard six dreadnoughts, this is the first accident that's happened? I've ridden them four times myself without any problems. You're a Jedi, the man said sourly. You never have problems like that. That is as it may be, Kbeoth said. Nevertheless, for your role in this accident, you are hereby docked one day's pay. The man's eyes widened. I'm what? But that's Dash. You are also forbidden to use outbound flight speeder system for one week, Kbeoth interrupted. Now, wait a frizzing minute, 
the man said, consternation starting to edge into his shock. You can't do that. I just did, Beath said calmly. He looked around the crowd, as if daring anyone to argue the point, then brought his eyes to rest on a Radian in a maintenance jumpsuit. You, take this speeder back to its parking area. The rest of you, return to your jobs. Reluctantly, Obi-Wan thought, the crowd began to disperse. Pbeoth waited long enough to see the Radian ride away with the speeder, then turned and headed back the way he'd come, his mouth twitching as he spotted Obi-Wan. I told you to remain with Padawan Skywalker, he said as he approached. I know. Obi-Wan gestured toward the dissipating crowd. What exactly was that? It was justice, Kbeoth said, passing Obi-Wan without breaking stride. Without a hearing? Obi-Wan asked hurrying to catch up with him. Without even an investigation? Of course there was an investigation, Kbeoth said. You were there, you heard it. A couple of questions to the participants hardly qualifies as an investigation, Obi-Wan said stiffly. What about a call for witnesses, or an examination of the speeder itself? What about the force? Kbeoth countered. Don't we as Jedi have an insight that permits us to make these decisions more quickly than others? In theory, perhaps, Obi-Wan said. But that doesn't mean we should ignore the other resources available to us. And what would you do with these resources? Kbeoth asked. Impanel a committee and spend hours in interviews and examinations? Do you think expending all that time and effort would lead to a different outcome? Probably not, Obi-Wan had to admit. But you pass judgment without even consulting the captain or ship's law. Bah, Kbeya snorted, waving a hand in dismissal. A pittance of money in punishment, plus a temporary and perfectly reasonable restriction on his movements. Would you really have me waste Captain Pacmilla's time in my own with something so trivial? The captain still needs to be informed. He will be, Kbeath promised, eyeing him thoughtfully. Your attitude surprises me, Master Kenobi. Isn't this sort of mediation and conflict resolution precisely the sort of thing Jedi throughout the Republic do every day? Obi-Wan glared at the corridor ahead. Usually one party or the other specifically asks for Jedi assistance. Here, either of them did. Yet is not a Jedi who sees such a problem honor-bound to lend his aid. Kbeoth pointed out. But now to more important things. Your Padawan should have finished with the tutorial by now. Let us see how quickly he takes to this form of combat. 16. Kardas started awake to find a pair of glowing red eyes hovering above him in the darkness. Who is it? He asked anxiously. Thrawn, the commander's voice came back. Get dressed. What's happened? Kardas asked as he pushed off the blanket and swung his legs over the edge of the bed. One of my scouts has reported a group of unidentified vessels in the area, Thrawn said. Quickly, now we leave in thirty minutes. Forty-five minutes later, the Springhawk cleared the asteroid tunnel and made the jump to light speed. And not just the Springhawk. Before they made the jump, Cardas counted no fewer than eleven other ships forming up around and behind them, including two more Springhawk-sized cruisers. Is this more Vigari? He asked as the Starlines melted into the hyperspace sky. It doesn't appear to be, Thrawn said. The ship designs are entirely different. I wanted you aboard to see if you can identify them. You might have done better to bring Kento instead, 
Cardas warned. He's a lot more knowledgeable about those things than I am. I thought it best to leave both him and Ferrisai behind, Thrawn said. I've sensed certain problems there. Cardas winced. You're right, he had to admit. So where exactly are these invaders? Why do you call them invaders? Well, I dash, Cardas floundered. I just assumed they were in Chiss space, after that talk you had with your brother. He frowned. They are in Chiss space, aren't they? The charter of the Expansionary Defense Fleet is to observe and explore the region around the Chiss Ascendancy, Thrawn said. That's all we intend to do today. Which was pretty much exactly what he'd said about the Vigari attack. Terrific. How long until we get there? Approximately four hours, Thrawn said. In the meantime, I've had a combat suit prepared for you. One with more armoring and self-sealant capabilities than your suit from the bargain hunter go below and put it on. The armorer will assist you. It took Cardas and the armorer most of the first three hours to get the suit fitted correctly, with the fourth hour spent in checking him out on its features. Once that was finished, though, he found the suit quite comfortable to wear, though noticeably heavier than the simple vac suits he was used to. He returned to the bridge to find that in his absence Thrawn and the rest of the bridge crew had also donned their combat suits. Welcome back, the commander greeted him, running an eye over his suit. We're nearly there. Cardas nodded and moved to his usual place beside the other's command chair. Listening to the clipped comments of the bridge crew, he let his eyes roam the displays and status boards and waited. The time count went to zero, and they were once again back among the stars. Where are they? He asked, peering through the viewports at the stars and a very distant sun. There, Thrawn said, pointing a few degrees off the starboard bow. Sensors magnify. The main display rippled and steadied. Cardas caught his breath, his chest suddenly squeezing tightly against his heart. In the center of the display was a horrible, terrifying, impossible sight, a pair of Trade Federation battleships. You recognize them? For a moment Thrawn's question didn't register. Cardas continued to stare at the image, his eyes tracing along the curved split-ring configuration of the ships and up the antenna towers that distinguished Trade Federation battleships from simple freighters. Then his brain seemed to catch and he tore his eyes away from the sight. To find the commander gazing up at him, a hard and knowing expression on his face.